Chapter 6 I felt it my duty to be the one to inform the Pethericks of the results of the post-mortem. Emerson did not object. In fact, he said he would go with me. I knew why, of course. His detectival instincts were temporarily in the ascendance, and having been proved wrong by me on several essential points, he was hoping to win a few points of his own. I didn't mind, since I always play fair in our little competitions in crime. But I sent Nefret home with Ramses. Coolly professional she might be, but she was also a tender-hearted individual, and she'd been acquainted with her subject. David went with them. As he pointed out, he did not know the Pethericks, and it would be inappropriate for him to meet them under such delicate circumstances. Miss and Mr. Petherick were dining in her room. As soon as we were shown in, Miss Petherick rang for the waiter to remove the table. I observed that one of them had only picked at the food while the other had made a good dinner. It was not difficult to guess which was which. Adrian Petherick seemed to have shrunk in the past hours. His clothing hung loosely on his body and his face was pasty pale. Was it guilt or grief? I broke the news with merciful bluntness. Adrian let out a cry and covered his face with his hands. His sister's expression did not change. We anticipated this. I presume you want to question us. Not tonight, said Sethos soothingly. He had gone to the table and was examining the floral displays. There were several more, including a vase of lovely white roses. Allow sleep to knit up the raveled sleeve of care. And think of the dear lady at rest in the arms of Jesus. Yes, Adrian murmured. Yes, thank you. Emerson choked. He must have swallowed the wrong way. I have a question, said Harriet Petherick. What about the statue? What about it? Emerson inquired gruffly. There can now be no doubt as to its legal ownership. I would think you would wish to get it off your hands. I would not suppose you would want it in your hands, said Emerson. No, no, Miss Petherick, I will not have it on my conscience that I gave such a deadly object to innocence like you and your brother. You would prefer to bring the curse on your own family, she added, with what I could only view as deliberate malice. We were told of your remarkable performance the other night. It wasn't particularly effective, was it? Emerson refused to be provoked. You and I know such... Performances, did you say? Affect only the superstitious. The curse of such objects is the violence they provoke in unprincipled persons. I am capable of protecting my family in more practical ways, and I intend to do the same for you and your brother. The logic of this silenced the lady. I confirmed the arrangements I'd made for the service on the following morning, and she had enough courtesy to thank me. Adrian said nothing. He'd taken one of the white roses from the vase and was removing the petals one by one and arranging them in a pile on the table. Curious glances and whispers followed us as we passed through the lobby, but my parasol and Emerson's scowls kept even the journalists back. Good God, said Emerson to his brother. I've never heard such hypocritical blather in my life. Not even from you. The arms of Jesus, indeed. It made the boy feel better, Sethos said. Nor have I known pity to motivate your actions, grumbled Emerson. Taking advantage of his weak-mindedness is a contemptible method of winning his confidence. Sethos grinned, and I said severely, Speaking of blather, did I hear you nobly promising to protect Harriet and her brother? From what? And in what manner, may I ask? Emerson stopped short in the middle of the street. I shoved him out of the way of a horse-drawn calèche, and Emerson said, Do not impugn my motives, Peabody, if you please. We need to settle this distraction so that I can get on with my work and bring a murderer to justice. That too. Sabir had returned for us after taking Ramses and a fret across. Emerson helped me up the gangplank and went on, frowning. Though at the present moment I haven't the faintest notion who it might be. Don't tell me you do, Peabody, or I will regret my candour. The Petherick's, brother and sister, are certainly the most obvious suspects, I replied, settling myself onto the bench. 
They are the only suspects, Emerson retorted, which is a strong indication of their innocence, my dear. It is true they had a motive. We know that Petherick's collection was left to his wife. Were they aware of that? Did they suppose the valuables would go to them if she died? That isn't a motive. It is a string of conjectures, Emerson exclaimed. Curse it, Peabody. Make up your mind. First you say they are probably innocent, though your reasoning is as feeble as any I've ever heard. And then you invent reasons for believing in their guilt. He had a certain logic on his side, so of course I immediately went on the offensive. It just goes to show that you were foolish to entrust Gargery with the delicate matter of Petherick's will. We need to know the precise terms, whether his wife was to inherit unconditionally or whether his children were secondary legatees. Everything to the wife certainly implies the former, said Sethos. Her husband predeceased her. Did she have a will? And if she did not, who would inherit? Are stepchildren considered next of kin? More damned conjectures, Emerson shouted. You don't know and I don't know, and neither does Peabody, though she will probably claim she does. Not at all, my dear. The investigation is in its early stages. For all we know, there may be a dozen people who wanted Mrs. Petherick dead. The murderer must have been someone she knew and trusted, or she wouldn't have gone alone to meet him in the garden. She would have had no reason to fear either of her stepchildren, they must have some claim to her property, through her husband's will or hers, or they would have had no reason to dispose of her. Confound it, Peabody, you are arguing in circles again, Emerson exclaimed. The boat bumped gently into the bank and Sabir ran out to the gangplank. In a spirit of amity, I accepted the hand Emerson offered. Shall we have one of our little competitions? I asked. What sort of competition is that? Sethos tried to take my other hand, but was foiled by the parasol. We each write down the name of the person we believe to be the villain and seal it in an envelope until after the case is solved, I explained. What a charming idea, said Sethos. Is there a prize for the winner? May I play too? I am not yet ready to commit myself, Emerson said, ignoring this provocative remark. Nor am I, I said. As you pointed out, Emerson, we haven't enough suspects. The silvery moonlight of Egypt lit our path, but with Sethos beside us, making frivolous suggestions, I was not tempted to linger along the way. Emerson was of the same mind. Hurry up, he grumbled. We've missed tea and will probably be late for dinner. Thanks to Ma'aman's new schedule, we were not late for dinner. There was even time for a quick whiskey and soda with Ramses and Nefret, who were anxious to learn how the Petherics had taken the news. Nefret looked grave when I described Adrian's reaction. I wish dear Dr. Willoughby were still with us. He had some skill in treating nervous disorders. His successor is a pompous fool. Adrian Petherick requires something more than the skill of an amateur. Sethos said. However, I believe I was of some assistance in calming his mind. Safe in the arms of Jesus, Emerson growled. Good God! At my insistence, the entire family, excepting the children, of course, attended Mrs. Petherick's funeral next morning. I had assumed there would be a scanty number of mourners, since she knew few people in Luxor but I had underestimated the morbid curiosity of the public and the persistence of the press. A line of constables, impressive in their white jackets and red fezzes, kept the crowd at bay, and as we walked toward the newly dug grave, I couldn't help thinking that Mrs. Petherick would have taken the display as only what was due a famous author. The efforts of the Ladies' Committee for the Beautification of the Resting Place of Our Lost Loved Ones, founded by me, though I must make it clear I am not responsible for the name, had improved the looks of the once desolate cemetery. Flowering shrubs struggled bravely for survival, and the feral dogs had been frustrated by an enclosing fence. Fences are no impediments to cats, however, and several families of felines had taken up residence. Tabby-striped and black, 
grey and orange and calico, they slunk along the fence or guarded huddles of varicoloured kittens. In my opinion, they added a rather pleasant touch, a testimonial to life in the place of the dead. A good number of the ladies did not share this opinion, but even a fence was insufficient to keep the cats out. I had been acquainted with a number of those who were interred there, friends from Luxor, victims of the various criminals I had brought to justice, and one or two of the criminals themselves. In a remote corner of the cemetery, under a stone I had caused to be raised, lay the remains of one of my deadliest adversaries, Bertha, Sethos's former lover and the mother of Mariam. Sethos avoided looking in that direction. He had refused to come at first, fearing I would insist on his paying his respects to the woman who was, after all, the mother of his child. To be sure, she had tried several times to kill him, and me, but the beautiful precepts of our faith tell us to forgive even the worst of sinners. My lecture on this subject had had no discernible effect on my brother-in-law, so I did not persist. Emerson had not wanted to come either. Stamping along at my side, he said loudly, Who are all these overdressed people? I thought you said no one would attend. I'd forgotten Mrs. Petherick's literary reputation, I admitted. Some of the ladies may be devoted readers. Emerson glared at a youngish man who was holding a camera. There's that confounded journalist again. If you point that camera at me, sir, I will knock it out of your hand. We were among the few who were allowed to pass the constables and join the Pethericks and Father Benedict at the graveside. Harriet Petherick thanked us rather perfunctorily for coming and then addressed the priest. We may as well get on with it, Father. I kept a close eye on Adrian as the service proceeded. He appeared to be in one of his stuporous states, standing close to his sister and staring dreamily at the cloudless blue sky overhead. I could have wished that some of the spectators behaved as well. Several of the ladies wept loudly throughout, and when Father Benedict had finished, one of them, the stout, heavily corseted woman who had been the first to ask Mrs. Petherick for her autograph, fainted onto a constable, knocking him flat. The photographer whom Emerson had threatened earlier got an excellent picture of her, and the constable inadvertently entwined. Disgusting, said Emerson loudly. Let's get out of this. I resisted his attempt to pull me away. The spectacle held a certain unholy fascination. I hadn't supposed that dedicated readers were capable of such vulgar behavior. The flowers they flung toward the grave fell short, pelting priest and onlookers. Someone started to sing a hymn, and other wavering voices joined in. It was an inappropriate melody, given Mrs. Petherick's religious affiliation. Most of the singers couldn't carry a tune, and some did not know the words. I caught only a few, something about being deep-dyed in sin. Harriet Petherick's composure finally broke. Tight-lipped and pale, she looked about as if seeking assistance. I was not the only one to observe her distress, and a thrill of maternal pride ran through me when Ramses approached her and offered his arm. She clung tightly to it as he led her past the constables. Nefret and David had taken charge of Adrian, who went with them unresisting and oblivious. I hastened to precede the group with exclamations of shame, shame. I was forced to swap the more importunate readers away with my parasol, and Emerson knocked down two journalists. When we had got the Petherick's into their waiting carriage, Emerson in a much better humour, actually remembered to take off his hat when he addressed Harriet Petherick. Confounded ghouls! Um, that is to say, Miss Petherick, I regret you should have been exposed to this unpleasantness. Thank you. I am grateful to all of you. Would you join us at the hotel for a little refreshment? I believe that is customary after a funeral. I assume the invitation included me though she had looked only at Emerson and Ramses. We will be along shortly, I said. I think we ought to rescue Father Benedict. However, the good father did not want to be rescued. He was a jolly, sociable man who seldom found himself the centre of such interested attention. 
we left him posing for photographs and comforting, afflicted, dedicated readers. I instructed the driver of our hired carriage not to whip up the horses. We do not permit cruelty to animals. Besides, rapid motion raises a cloud of dust, and I was wearing my second-best hat. Emerson leaned back and took out his pipe. I presume, Peabody, that this is not so much a visit of condolence as an inquisition. That is not a nice way of putting it, Emerson. It is an accurate way of putting it, I hope, said Sethos, or I would not attend. I thought you were concerned about Adrian, I said critically. You do me too much credit, dear Amelia. He was silent for a moment. Then he said, The boy held up well today. He is in a state of shock. Nefret's smooth brow furrowed. I'm afraid that the reaction may be sudden and violent. I wish I knew how to help him. Your specialty is surgery, not psychology, I said. Your good heart does you credit, my dear, but you must learn not to take on unnecessary burdens. Like you? Emerson inquired. We had outstripped the reporters and the sensation seekers. The hotel guests who did not fall into the latter category had gone off to see the sights, so the lobby was relatively deserted. When I asked the clerk at the desk to inform the Petherics we'd arrived, he said we were to go straight up. The lady is now in the rooms formerly occupied by Madame Petherick. Adrian answered the door. He had transferred his fickle affection from Sethos to Nefret, with scarcely a glance at the former. He took Nefret's hands and spoke with febrile vivacity. So good, so kind of you to come. Please take a chair. Harriet, the Emersons are here. We were not the only callers. I had observed Sir Malcolm at the cemetery, looking on with a sneer and twirling his silver-headed cane. He must have left before the service was over in order to arrive before us. I was not aware that you were acquainted with Mrs. Petherick, Sir Malcolm, I said, acknowledging his bow. I was well acquainted with her husband, Mrs. Emerson. I felt obliged to pay my respects. Harriet came out of the neighbouring bedchamber with a hat-box in her hand. Tossing it onto the floor, she said, "'Your hypocrisy will not deceive the Emersons any more than it did me, Sir Malcolm. "'They know quite well why you're here.' "'How much did you offer?' Emerson inquired bluntly. "'I hardly think, Professor, that that need concern you.' Five thousand pounds,' said Harriet Petherick. "'Will you take to your coffee, Mrs. Emerson?' She indicated several trays of light refreshments on the table. David let out a stifled exclamation. The lady didn't miss much. Looking at him, she inquired, Too little, you think? How would you know? I beg your pardon, I said. I believe you haven't met Mr. David Todros, our nephew by marriage. He is a well-known sculptor and painter and an authority on Egyptian art. Harriet's critical expression changed to one of interest. I am familiar with your work, Mr. Todros. At what price would you value the statue? The worth of such objects depends on the market, David said cautiously. But that price strikes me offhand as extremely low. It is also irrelevant, Emerson said. Miss Petherick hasn't the right to sell the statuette. Then who does? Sir Malcolm demanded. Mrs. Petherick is no more... She had no children. Her property passes to her husband's children. I am offering... You, sir, are no gentleman, I interrupted. Sir Malcolm's pale face turned pink. I beg your pardon, madam. The poor lady is barely cold in her grave, I went on with mounting indignation. Is your greed so uncontrolled that you couldn't wait a decent interval before intruding on the grief of her kin? And hoping to cheat them, Emerson added. The statuette is worth four or five times that amount, possibly more. Trying to steal a march on Vandergelt and Carnarvon, are you? Sir Malcolm gathered the shreds of his dignity around him and rose. I see no reason to listen to your insults, Professor. Should you change your mind, Miss Petherick? I'm staying here at the Winter Palace. Emerson called after him. Don't hold your breath, Sir Malcolm. The ownership of the statuette has yet to be determined, as you are well aware. 
The door slammed. Emerson chuckled. Then, remembering the solemnity of the occasion, he set his face in sober lines. I beg your pardon, Miss Petherick. Why should you beg my pardon? It was Sir Malcolm whose behaviour was unseemly. We won't stay, I assured her. We only came by to see if we can be of assistance. Miss Petherick glanced at the hat box. I am packing my stepmother's clothing and trinkets. Perhaps you know of a charity here in Luxor that would like to have them. Needless to say, I leaped at the opportunity to be of service. I can hardly say until I've seen them. Pray allow me to assist you in what must be a painful task. Emerson gave me a baleful look. At least the courtesy to chat for a while, Peabody, before you rummage round in other people's belongings. I appreciate Mrs. Emerson's offer and accept it, said Miss Petherick. But please, Mrs. Emerson, finish your coffee first and have a cucumber sandwich. Are you leaving Luxor soon, then? Nefret asked as I bit into the sandwich. Miss Petherick's lips curved in a sardonic smile. I've been informed by Captain Rayburn, the British adviser, that we may not leave Egypt until Mrs. Petherick's murder has been solved. Adrian leaned forward, his hands tightly clasped and his eyes unnaturally bright. We owe it to Magda and our father to remain, Harriet. He loved her. He enjoyed being married to a celebrity, said Miss Petherick. She made him happy, Adrian said heatedly. How could we depart without seeing a killer brought to justice? A very proper attitude, Sathos said. Had she enemies? Literary rivals, perhaps. Miss Petherick's smile bared a number of teeth. Or a devoted reader who disliked her last book. We've already informed the police that we know of no one who had a motive to harm her. Money, revenge, fear, said Emerson. Those are the usual motives for murder. You hadn't known her long. How can you be sure she was not a threat to someone's reputation? Or that she hadn't done someone a deadly injury in the past? I said we know of no one, replied Miss Petherick. She was a worthy adversary, and Emerson's expressive countenance showed a certain admiration. He much prefers women of character to those who fall weeping onto their beds, as he had once put it. She looked almost handsome in her elegant black coat and skirt, her thick black hair coiled into a heavy knot and colour brightening her cheeks. The hand that held her teacup betrayed not a tremor. Come now, Professor, she went on. Postulating unknown enemies is like chasing will-o'-the-wisps when you have a solid, tangible motive staring you in the face. Mrs. Petherick was my father's sole heir. His collection is worth a great deal of money. Who are her heirs? Emerson asked. I don't know that either. If she made a will, it would, I presume, be in the hands of her solicitors. I can assure you of one thing, Professor. She didn't leave her estate to Adrian or me. You told me on the first occasion we met that you were both fond of her, Emerson shot back. I didn't say she was fond of us, Miss Petherick said, cool and unshaken. She and I were on civil terms. If there was little affection between us, there was no animosity, and Adrian's attachment to her was genuine. Have you any more questions, Professor? Not at the present time, Emerson admitted. Mrs. Emerson? If you're asking for my opinion, Miss Petherick, I think we should get your task over and done with. Miss Petherick's doubtful expression indicated that she'd had second thoughts about accepting my offer of assistance, but of course I proceeded as I had planned. The others left, I rolled up my sleeves and went into the bedchamber, followed by Miss Petherick. The room was in a frightful state of confusion. Instead of proceeding methodically, she had emptied the wardrobe, flinging the garments haphazardly across chairs and tables and turned drawers upside down onto the bed. I considered this highly significant, though, to be honest, I wasn't sure what her hasty, untidy methods signified. Had she cared more for her stepmother than she admitted and found the sight of her belongings painful? Had she detested her so thoroughly that she wanted to remove every reminder as soon as was humanly possible? 
I can find my comments to a mild, dear me, this will never do, and began folding sable dresses and silken undergarments into neat piles. Stockings, shoes, handkerchiefs and scarves went into one of the drawers. All of them, even the handkerchiefs, were heavily scented with some musky perfume. Miss Petherick stood watching me, her arms hanging limp at her sides. I know several ladies of limited means who might be glad of the gowns, I said finally. Morning, alas, is always useful. The underclothes are worn and a trifle, uh, youthful. Daring, you mean? Miss Peverick folded her arms. I suppose I do. Ah, well, I suggest we simply bundle everything up, hats, gloves and all. I'll have them brought to me and I will send them on to the proper persons. There is nothing you would like to keep? No. Not even a jewellery? The contents of a jewellery box had also been tossed onto the bed in a glittering, shimmering tangle. The gems were all paste and the gold false. An examination, which I proceeded to make, proved she was right. I was a trifle surprised that a successful authoress, the wife of a man of means, shouldn't have a few important jewels. I wondered whether Miss Petherick had already taken them. It was none of my business if she had, but my expression must have been somewhat critical, for she volunteered a statement. I took a few trinkets that had belonged to my mother. Their only value is sentimental. But if you'd like to see them, I assure you that isn't necessary. I insist I don't want you to have any doubts about my honesty. She pulled open the drawer of the night table. It took only a single glance to survey the contents. Unlike the tangle on the bed... These ornaments had been carefully laid out on the bottom of the drawer, several small brooches set with seed pearls and chips of turquoise, two rings of equally modest value, and a garnet parure consisting of bracelets, hair combs, and a necklace. They were of a style popular fifty years earlier, a mosaic of small gems set in silver. One of the combs had lost two of its teeth. She never wore them, said Miss Petherick. Her tone left no doubt as to which she, she meant. They were too old-fashioned and restrained. I was unexpectedly touched by the little mementos and the careful disposal, nor did I blame Miss Petherick for taking them. By rights, they ought to have gone to her instead of being handed over to her mother's successor. I said as much and saw the young lady's stern face soften. My mother was a gentle, unassuming woman, Mrs. Emerson. She never asked for much, and she got even less. I am somewhat ashamed to admit my true reason for offering to take charge of Mrs. Petherick's clothes. Miss Petherick had thanked me for my kindness, but as my more astute readers no doubt realize, my motive was not so benevolent. I hadn't had the opportunity to examine the garments closely, turning out pockets and cuffs and looking for stains. All is fair in love, war and detection, and one never knows when a clue may turn up. In fact, several new clues had turned up. Most interesting was the young lady's feelings about her stepmother. Civil she may have been, but it was obvious that she harboured a long-standing, deep-seated resentment of the woman who had taken her mother's place not to mention her mother's poor little ornaments. She might not stand to gain monetarily from Mrs. Petherick's death, but as Emerson had cogently pointed out, an equally strong motive is the desire for revenge. Almost as interesting was the fact that the wardrobe I had seen was not as extensive as it ought to have been. Ladies of fashion travel with a wide variety of clothing and accoutrement. There had only been a few changes of underclothing, and they were patched and darned. She had brought at least one flamboyant garment with her, the crimson gown in which she'd been buried, and surely she had owned more jewellery than the contents of that single rosewood casket. Pondering these matters, I made my way along the corridor, exchanging absent-minded compliments with the suffrages and waiters I encountered. I stopped at the desk to give instructions to the clerk about Mrs. Petherick's things, and then said casually... Who is the lady in room 354? If the fellow had said, What lady? My theory would have collapsed on the spot. 
Instead, he replied readily, Mrs. Johnson, madam, she arrived a week ago. Ah, I said. I think I may know her. Is she of middle age and medium height with black hair and eyes? The young man was sorry to disappoint me. The agent's eyes are correct, Mrs. Emerson, but Mrs. Johnson has yellow hair, bright yellow hair, very bright. I was sorely tempted to take the final step that would prove my theory, but the spirit of fair play demanded that I admit Emerson to my confidence first. So I thanked the young man and turned away. My brisk stride and my raised parasol got me through the lobby and out of the hotel without being accosted, though the confounded journalist and his camera made an abortive attempt to stop me. Mrs. Emerson, he called. My friend Kevin O'Connell... He was mistaken if he believed that name would gain him favour. Kevin was a friend, but he was also a journalist, and at times, such as the present, the two were incompatible. I brushed the fellow aside and went on. They were all waiting for me on the veranda, including the Vandergelts and Germana. Catherine had decided they should not attend the obsequies, since they had not been acquainted with Mrs. Petherick, so they were understandably curious about what had gone on. You were wise to stay away, I said, giving Catherine a kiss. It was a disgusting spectacle. So I've been told, was her reply, and I gather that the brother and sister have been ordered not to leave Egypt. I cannot understand that, Amelia. There's no evidence against them, is there? So far there is no evidence against anyone, Emerson grunted. Unless Peabody discovered something while she was examining the lady's belongings. All eyes returned to me. Emerson's sapphire blue orbs were narrowed. My dear, how can you impugn my motives? I inquired with a merry little laugh. Lounging at ease, legs crossed, Sethos shook his head. Don't annoy him, Amelia. He is already in a vile humour. Emerson opened his mouth, closed it, drew a deep breath and spoke in a soft, controlled voice. I asked Cyrus and Bertie, and Germana, to meet with us in order to determine our plans for excavation, not to gossip about matters that do not concern us. So you're not interested in what I learned after you left? Emerson could not admit he was dying to hear. He said grumpily, The sooner you get it out, the sooner we can dismiss the subject. I didn't want to increase his aggravation for fear he would go back on his promise to hire additional staff and give the children more freedom to get on with their own work. So I explained my deductions about Mrs. Petherick's wardrobe and jewellery, ignoring Emerson's muttered comments. Typical female clothes, balderdash. And went on to describe my conversation with the desk clerk. At that point, Emerson gave over muttering in favour of profanity. Hell and damnation! Why didn't I think of that? Ramses came close to figuring it out, I said, with a kindly smile at my son. He suggested she slipped out of her bedchamber while he and Abdul were in the sitting room, but she then had to make her way down a longish corridor before she was out of their sight. The simplest explanation was that she simply went into the room next door. She had taken it under another name, her appearance altered by the simple addition of a wig and a more conspicuous frock. So... She was there the entire time, Ramses murmured. That assumption does answer many of the questions we had. It will be easy to prove, I said. We must have Mr. Salt's permission to enter the room. I thought it best to leave that to you, my dear. I nodded at Emerson. Mm, said Emerson, his rancor assuaged by this concession. Very well, I will attend to it. Now... As to the valley of... One more little thing, Emerson. I offered to dispose of Mrs. Petherick's belongings. One of the hotel servants will bring them here. I didn't have the chance to examine them closely, you see. It would have looked suspicious. Curse it, said Emerson. Well, don't expect me to help. It is a woman's job, my dear. Perhaps Catherine will lend me her advice. She accepted with expressions of pleasure. There were times when Catherine felt left out of our activities, and this was a way of making her feel useful, which, in fact, she would be. 
We were finishing luncheon when the hotel attendant arrived with Mrs. Petherick's possessions. Catherine and I left the others discussing arrangements, except for Nefret, who expressed an interest in assisting us. Jumana did not express interest. She loved listening to Emerson expound on Egyptology, and since Emerson loved to expound, they complimented each other nicely. I had the bundles taken to my study, since I knew Emerson would object to the scent of stale perfume in our bedchamber. Nefred, who was sensitive to odours, wrinkled her nose. The sooner we get these out of the house, the better. I don't like handling garments whose owner will never wear them again. A strange sentiment, some would have said, considering the aplomb with which she had handled the owner herself. However, scents are particularly evocative. Catherine had begun examining the frocks. The pockets produced a typical motley array, several handkerchiefs, a withered sprig of greenery, two hairpins, and a considerable amount of lint. A good lady's maid would have emptied them before hanging the garments in the wardrobe. I understand now why Mrs. Petherick hadn't brought an attendant with her. She had planned her dramatic disappearance before she left England, and privacy was essential for the scheme. I will spare the reader the details of our search, in the event that he is of the masculine gender. Suffice it to say that we found no suspicious stains, no objects sewn into hem or seam, and, in short, nothing suspicious whatsoever. Except for the underclothing, the garments were relatively new and relatively cheap. People do not anticipate wearing mourning for long. In fact, few modern ladies wore unrelieved black unless it happened to become them. It did become the Countess Magda, and she had not been unwilling to make a show of her grief. We left the repackaging of the clothes to Fatima, who had participated in the last stages of the search. She had nothing to add to our conclusions. I could see that she and Catherine were disappointed. They had hoped to discover a vital clue. So I said, consolingly, I didn't really expect we would find anything of interest, but the task was necessary. Fatima, will you have these sent to Miss Buchanan at the school? I'll write her a little note explaining the situation. I'm sure she can find someone who can make use of them. Emerson was on the veranda, listening, a word which is seldom applicable to Emerson, to the conversation between Ramses and Mr. Kachanovsky. It was heavy with complex verb forms in ancient Egyptian. My husband leaped to his feet when we came in and offered to escort Catherine home, Cyrus and the others having gone ahead. That isn't necessary, she assured him. I insist, said Emerson, with heartfelt sincerity. Don't wait tea for me, Peabody. I won't be long. Before you go, Catherine, I said, tell me how Mr. Lidman is getting on. I neglected to ask after him. My excuse must be that I had a number of more compelling duties. He arrived this morning while you were at the funeral, Catherine's brow furrowed. I would appreciate it, Nefret, if you could find time to have a look at him. He could scarcely walk. Two of the suffragies from the hotel had to help him along, and he refused food. That is a bad sign. We will come round later this evening, I promised. Nefret went off to help get the children ready for tea, and I invited Mr. Kachanovsky to go on with what he'd been saying. I would not wish to bore you, the Russian said politely. I fear our discussion became somewhat technical. Verb forms are wasted on me, I said, laughing. But I'm sure you're finding some interesting texts. That depends on what one considers interesting, Ramses said with a smile. Letters, I said promptly. Prayers like the ones you spoke of the other day. Ramses' eyebrows tilted in surprise. You remembered? Certainly. I remember everything you say, my dear. Unlike some persons. Ramses grinned. Well, so far we've been chiefly concerned with preserving the scraps of papyrus we found the other day. It's a tedious process, and I'm afraid I've left most of it to Mikhail. The scraps have to be softened and then flattened and covered with blotting paper and pressed down until they're completely dry. I am familiar with the process, I said. Of course, Mother. So when do you expect you'll be able to start reading them? They'll have to be sorted and arranged in proper order first. That is where Mikhail is so useful, 
Ramses added, with a polite nod at the silent Russian. It's like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle, when half the pieces are missing. One must be familiar with the language and with the varieties of handwriting. Excellent, I said vaguely, my attention having been distracted by merry childish cries. Here they come, said Ramses. Brace yourself, Mikhail. By the way, mother, I take it you didn't find anything of interest in the old clothes. How did you arrive at that conclusion? You wouldn't have been able to keep it to yourself this long. As I had promised Catherine, Nefret and I went to the castle after dinner. Emerson offered to drive us in the motor car, but he had forgotten the confounded thing was still in pieces, so I was able to decline. Cyrus was good enough to send his carriage. The doorman was on the watch for us. The great gates swung open as the carriage approached and closed with a metallic clang after we passed through. Torches made the courtyard bright as day. Catherine's concern about her patient was evident by her failure to offer us coffee. She led us directly to the elegant guest chamber where Lidman reposed. "'I am sorry to hear you're not feeling well, Mr. Lidman,' I said." "'approaching the bed while Nefret unpacked her stethoscope. "'Without wishing to denigrate a fellow practitioner of the medical art, "'I must say that Dr. Weston's methods are not always for the best. "'I would like to examine your injuries, if I may. "'Your lower limbs, is it?' "'I whisked the covers back. "'The leg was heavily bandaged from ankle to knee. "'So were his left arm, his head, and his ribs.' Well, I said, after unwinding yards of bandage, it appears to me that certain of your injuries would be all the better for being left exposed to the air. This abrasion on your left limb, for example. What do you think, Nefret? She had listened to his heart and taken his temperature. I don't find any broken bones, she said, running experienced hands over his arms and legs. You were fortunate, Mr. Lidman, to escape with only bruises. Lidman... "'raised a feeble hand to the bandage on his brow. "'My memory,' he muttered. "'I can't remember. "'Short-term loss of memory often follows a blow on the head,' Lefret said. "'Don't try to force it. It'll probably return in due course. "'I recommend bed rest and a nourishing diet. "'You are in the best possible hands here. "'One of the servants will sit outside your door tonight, "'in case you want anything,' Catherine added. It is very good of you. So kind. I'll leave these with you, Catherine, Nefret said, after we had bade him good night. These for pain, these to help him sleep if he needs them. One cannot trust a patient who is somewhat confused to take them himself. Quite right, I said approvingly. What is your assessment, Nefret? The injuries are genuine, Nefret said, and they are consistent with a hard fall and being swept about by the current. "'Could he have throttled Mrs. Petherick?' I asked. "'Catherine started. "'Amelia, for heaven's sake, why would he? "'I can't think of a motive, Catherine, "'but as we criminal investigators know, "'motive is a secondary consideration. "'I am only endeavouring to ascertain "'whether he was physically capable of doing the job.' "'You know I can't answer that, Mother,' Lefret said indignantly. "'Offhand, I'd say no.' but people are capable of extraordinary effort if the need is strong enough. What makes you suspect the man? I suspect everyone of everything, I said. I was comfortably tucked up in bed, reading, when Emerson entered. An early night, eh? he said pleasantly. Excellent, my dear. You have been a busy little bee of late. Hmm, I said, and turned a page. What are you reading that you find so absorbing? Emerson demanded. He began to undress, tossing his clothes in various directions. Hang your trousers over the chair, Emerson. This is one of Countess Magda's novels, The Vampire's Daughter. I borrowed it from Marjorie Fisher. Why are you wasting your time on that rubbish? Emerson asked. I got the notion he had some other time-wasting activity in mind. I was curious. It really is a dreadful piece of trash. But this is interesting. I held up a piece of paper. It is Magda's biography. Marjorie must have clipped it from a newspaper. Oh? 
Our beloved authoress was born in her ancestral home, Castle Ormenstein, the only child of her adoring parents who, recognizing her genius when she was but a tot, spared neither time nor expense in cultivating it, supplying her with tutors in various subjects and nurturing. Does that sentence ever end? Emerson inquired. Not for another paragraph. It is typical of journalistic adulation, my dear. I cleared my throat and continued. Her idyllic existence came to a cruel end when the Great War brought tragedy and, oh, very well, Emerson, I will synopsize. Her father, Count von Ormond, enlisted in the Austrian army. My thought she was Hungarian, Emerson said, throwing the covers back and getting into bed. Austro-Hungarian. He was an officer of the Emperor, of course, a cavalryman, when he died valiantly at the Battle of Leningrad. That can't be right, said Emerson. Newspapers always get facts wrong. If you continue interrupting me, I will never get through this, Emerson. Hurry it up, then. Her mother died of grief, I continued, alone in the world with the hordes of the bestial Germans advancing. Yes, Emerson, I know that can't be right either. Anyhow, the valiant young girl whose brilliant novels had already won her worldwide acclaim fled with two of her faithful servants, and after horrors that cannot be described for fear of rending the hearts of her readers, she made her way to England with only the clothes on her back. No papers, no servants, no cherished cross that had belonged to her mother, now an angel in heaven, inquired Emerson flat on his back, with his hands under his head. Very good, Emerson, I said, laughing. She had lost everything, including the servants, one of whom perished after saving her from a ravisher. Not both of them. The other died of a fever, after nursing Magda, giving her beloved young mistress all her food and water. Good gad. That's about all there is, I concluded. Her publishers and her public welcomed her with open arms, and she continued to soar in the esteem of critics and readers. Turn out the light, Peabody. Yes, my dear. Emerson agreed to accompany me to the hotel the following morning. He grumbled a bit about taking the time from his work, but I could see he was as curious as I and that he was half hoping I would be proved wrong about the questionable Mrs. Johnson. Sethos went with us, despite Emerson's attempts to dissuade him. I hadn't expected Emerson would have any difficulty in persuading Mr. Saw to violate a visitor's privacy. We found the manager more than eager to oblige. The chambermaid had reported that the lady's bed hadn't been slept in, nor the towels in the bath chamber used. Mr. Salt was in a slightly nervous condition anyhow. A second mysterious disappearance would have a bad effect on the Winter Palace's reputation, especially if it were followed, like the first, by murder. I do hope, he said pathetically, that nothing else has occurred. Perhaps Mrs. Johnson has just gone away for a few days. Without mentioning it to you or the desk clerk? I asked. Mr. Salt groaned. The room had the musty smell of a chamber which hadn't been occupied for some time. Also palpable to the olfactory sense was the scent of stale perfume. The bed covers had been turned down, and a nightgown spread carefully out across them, as was the custom. I went immediately to the wardrobe, where I found what I had expected, several elegant gowns of the size that would fit Mrs. Petherick. An even stronger scent wafted from the top drawer of the dresser when I opened it. It is the same scent she used, I said, sniffing. Hmm, said Emerson. That's not proof, Peabody. What about this, then? I held up a linen underbodice and indicated the name written inside the seam in the indelible ink used by laundries. Hmm, said Emerson, in a different tone. Oh, come, Emerson, be generous, Sethos said. She was right on the mark. Acknowledge it. I did, grunted Emerson. We had to explain the situation to poor, bewildered Mr. Salt. He kept shaking his head and muttering about the press. They will have to be told, I suppose. 
Not by us, I replied. But the police will certainly have to be notified, and I don't doubt the news will get out. We made a thorough search of the room. I turned the dresses inside out and felt along the seams while Sephos unfolded the linens, shook them out, and refolded them. Emerson, who would as soon have spied on a naked lady as handle her personal undergarments, watched his brother's long, deft hands with unconcealed disapproval. We found nothing of importance except another jewellery box. The ornaments were few, but of a much more valuable nature than the trinkets I had found earlier. As I had observed, the Countess Magda liked sparkling gems. The shinier, the better. Two pairs of diamond earrings, a bracelet encircled by emeralds and diamonds, a tastelessly large diamond brooch, and a string of pearls made up the contents of the box. I handed it immediately to Mr. Salt and asked him to put it in the hotel safe. Tell your employees that under no circumstances are they to enter the room until after the police have been here, I instructed. Locking the barn door, Sethos inquired, raising his eyebrows. They've had ample opportunity to go in and out as they pleased already. Which of them has keys? Mr. Salt started. Oh, dear, he murmured. Oh, dear, keys? Oh, let me think. The chambermaid, the laundryman, the suffragio on duty, the assistant manager... The door might as well have been left open, Emerson said. Well, well, it's too late to remedy that. Shouldn't we tell the Petherics what we've found? They went out early this morning, Mr. Salt said. Where? Emerson asked. They asked me to recommend a reliable dragoman, so I presume they intended to visit some of the sites. I do not spy on my guests, Professor. That's a job for the police. Emerson agreed. He gave the manager a consoling clap on the back. Salt staggered. Here now, Salt, buck up. This will all blow over in a few days. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson was reverting to his old habits. He sent them all off to the Valley of the Kings before he and his wife left for Luxor, with instructions to continue clearing the tomb, keeping copious notes and taking photographs of every stage. Ramses went without protest. His father's new schedule meant he would have from mid-morning until late afternoon for his own work, which was fair enough. His mother didn't protest either. She was suffering from a severe case of detective fever and couldn't concentrate on anything else. There was only room for a few people to work inside the burial chamber, and dirty work it was. The floor was covered with a layer of hardened mud, some of which had to be removed with dental picks. So far, the results had been meagre, scraps of broken pottery and stone vessels, bits of gold foil and a few seals. Examining one of these, Ramsay said in disgust, Unreadable. This looks like a neb sign, but that's all I can make out. What part of the tomb did the seal come from, do you suppose? David asked. Your guess is as good as mine. The outer entrance was closed, and the seals of the necropolis applied to the stones. But the tomb was entered at least once after the burial. Davis's lot demolished the blocking they found, and apparently destroyed or lost any remaining seals. Do you think the professor will want to photograph? David asked eyeing the unintelligible scrap. Doesn't he always? Take it upstairs with the rest of this rubbish. Ramses put the seal carefully into a tray with the few other objects that had come from the square on which they were working. A short time later, Hassan came down. There are many, many tourists, he announced. Two of them ask to see you. Tell them to go to blazes. Ramses got stiffly to his feet. They say they are the son and daughter of the lady who died. The Petherics? Nefret, who'd been diligently scraping away at the brick-hard mud, straightened. You'd better talk to them, Ramses. Oh, hell, I suppose I had. We may as well leave off work for now, Hassan. Find anything, Nefret? She held out her hand. Cupped in her dusty, scratched palm were several small golden beads. She tipped them into the box Hassan held out, and Ramses took advantage of the young man's departure to kiss her scraped fingers. Not much to show for all that effort. She smiled and stroked his cheek. 
But darling, it's such a romantic ambience, here alone with you. She sneezed. Ramses laughed and helped her up the three-foot drop between the corridor and the burial chamber. Here you go, darling. We'll find more romantic surroundings later. Tourist cameras clicked as they emerged into daylight. One of the most discouraging aspects of this job, said Nefret resignedly, is that my dusty, dirty, crumpled image will appear in thousands of photo albums all over the world. It'll be the most beautiful image in the album, her husband said gallantly. Damn it, Hassan, get those idiots back from the edge. Nefret scrambled nimbly up the ladder. Ramses followed, after ordering Hassan to remove the ladders and joined Nefret, who was talking to Adrian and Harriet. I'm sorry we have to be so strict about visitors, Nefret was saying. It isn't only tourists we have to worry about. Some of the local people refuse to believe we aren't looking for gold. Have you found anything? Adrian asked eagerly. One wouldn't have known there was anything wrong with him, Ramses thought. He was smiling and at ease, his hat in his hand, as he addressed Nefret. She smiled back at him and indicated one of the boxes of scraps. As you see. Harriet Petherick offered her hand. Ramses shook his head and spread his own filthy hands out for her inspection. It's dirty work, Miss Petherick. And unproductive, she said. What are you hoping to find? He couldn't think of any reason for refusing to answer. Some evidence that the statue came originally from this tomb. In father's opinion, this is the most likely place, so we're looking here first. That's a rather negative approach, isn't it? Your failure to find evidence doesn't mean the statue wasn't there. Right, Ramsay said. She was as quick as she was forceful, and she was looking almost feminine that morning. Her thick hair rolled back under the broad-brimmed hat, which was tied under her chin with a jaunty bow. He went on. However, it's the only approach open to us at this time. We've learnt the name of the dealer from whom your father bought the statue. How? The word was as sharp as a shout. From Montague. He came to us first, trying to purchase the statue. That won't do him any good, will it, so long as your father sticks to his promise? You may rest assured that my father will do precisely that. I didn't mean to offend you. She put a propitiatory hand on his arm. It was a strong, capable-looking hand, with a broad palm and long fingers. Professor Emerson's reputation is of the highest. I understand why Mrs. Petherick went to him. Thank you. The sun was hot and he wanted to get home and wash. He was about to make his excuses when Nefret addressed him. Adrian would like to see the tomb. Ramses scowled at his beloved wife. I don't think we can spare a few more minutes, Nefret said, can't we? I'd really appreciate it, Adrian said. This is my first trip to Egypt, you see, and I'm trying to understand why my father was so keen on the country and its antiquities. His eyes fell. I wish I had taken a greater interest while he lived. It would have pleased him so much. Ramses looked to Harriet Petherick for help, but got only a shrug and a cynical half-smile. It would have been heartless to reject that appeal, even though Adrian's interest was born of guilt, and Pringle Petherick probably wouldn't have given a damn whether his children shared his interests. All right, he said. Just for a few minutes. Hassan, will you please lower the ladder? I'll go down first. Adrian had no difficulty negotiating the ladder. Harriet swung herself neatly onto the topmost rung and descended as easily as her brother had. Adrian, watch your step, Ramses said. Miss Petherick, take my hand, please. Dust motes swam in the ray of sunlight that angled off one of the mirrors used for lighting. They had lost a good deal of their effectiveness, as the sun had moved since they were last adjusted. Ramses switched on his torch. Aren't these mirrors rather an old-fashioned method of illumination? Harriet Petherick asked. She'd caught on to the idea immediately, showing off her intelligence, Ramses wondered, or admitting to a greater knowledge than her expressed disinterest in Egyptology had implied. If it was an admission, it was deliberate. 
This was not a woman who made careless mistakes. Adrian had to have the method explained. Jolly clever, he exclaimed. But why not torches or electricity? Torches burn out too quickly and don't give an even light, Ramses explained. It's hard to get permission to run an electric line. This works well enough. He stopped them on the edge of the three-foot drop into the burial chamber. This is as far as we go. There's not much to see, really. Not like some of the other tombs we saw this morning. Adrian sounded disappointed. Why aren't you digging in places like that? Ramses patiently explained again why they were there. Adrian lost interest. He preceded them up the sloping passageway. Look here, Miss Petherick, Ramses said softly but urgently. If you know anything about the statue that you haven't told us, I strongly advise you to do so. Holding back information will only damage you and your brother. A pebble slipped under her feet. She caught more tightly at his hand. Can I trust you? To do my best for you and Adrian, yes. I believe in his innocence. A carefully equivocal statement, she said mockingly. So you wouldn't lie for us? No. But I hope I won't have to. He's not entirely responsible for his actions, though he seems much more cheerful today. He has his moods. She stopped and turned to face him. I admit I haven't confided fully in you and your parents. I doubt I can tell you anything that will throw light on my stepmother's death, but perhaps I haven't the right to hold anything back. May I speak to you in private, without anyone knowing? I will leave it to your discretion to decide what to tell the others. Yes, of course. When? Not today. Adrian is determined to see every tomb in the Valley of the Kings. I will send you a message. His parents returned from Luxor shortly after Nefret and he reached the house. Emerson immediately demanded a report on the morning's work. Ramses was able to condense it into two sentences. We've finished the burial chamber, except for the far corner and the niche. Nothing. Hmm, said Emerson. Starting tomorrow. Perched on the arm of his chair, Nefret interrupted with a laugh and a playful hand across his lips. Never mind about tomorrow. I want to know what you discovered this morning. To judge by your expression, Mother, you were right about the mysterious Mrs. Johnson. It was not a difficult deduction, his mother said. The words were modest, but her expression could only be described as smug. Mrs. Petherick's name was inscribed on certain of the linens, and the gowns, none of them black, were obviously hers. There was also a jewel case with several valuable pieces of jewellery. Did you find a wig? Ramses asked. His mother's smile widened. Well done, Ramses. No, we did not. She must have been wearing it the night she was murdered, which means the killer took it away with him. One can only speculate about his reasons for doing so, but don't speculate, Emerson ordered. If you say so, my dear. We intended to inform the Petherics of our discovery and ask them to look over the contents of the room to see if anything is missing, but we were unable to locate them. They were in the Valley of the Kings, Nefret said, behaving like ordinary tourists. Except, Ramses added, that they asked to see KV-55. You let them in? Emerson demanded. Not into the burial chamber, obviously. Oh, all right then. Now, as I was saying, Ramses had become accustomed to his father's abrupt changes of plan, but this one caught all the others by surprise. Even his mother. "'Join Cyrus in the West Valley?' she exclaimed. "'Why, for pity's sake, I thought you wanted to finish in KV-55.' "'I do. I will,' said Emerson, fumbling with his pipe. "'I am only postponing it. Too bloody many tourists.' "'There would be just as many tourists in a week's time, or in two weeks.' "'Ramses was beginning to get an inkling of what his father was up to. "'He had a foothold in the Valley of the Kings, and he intended to hang on to it. "'The only question was, why? "'After luncheon, Emerson sent David to Deir el Medina "'to take photographs and confer with Selim. "'The rest of them headed for the West Valley, "'leaving Ramses with his papyri and Mikhail Kachanovsky. "'Ramses was becoming attached to the quiet Russian.' 
He was so anxious to please and so efficient and so good with the children. The twins gravitated to him at once when they all met for tea, and as he watched them, Ramses wondered if the Russian had had children of his own. It would have been inappropriate to ask, of course. The man's personal life was his own affair, and the subject might be a tender one. Wasim came up to the house with the post while Kachanovsky was telling a story about an evil werewolf and a princess and the brave peasant boy who had rescued her. Ramsey sorted through the messages as he listened. And there was this, Wasim said, handing over a much folded paper, delivered by hand for you. One glance told Ramsey's it was not the message from Harriet Petherick he had hoped to receive. The dirty paper was addressed in awkward Arabic writing to the Brother of Demons. After he had read it, he folded it again and put it in his pocket. Who gave you this? he asked. I do not know Brother of Demons. I found it with the other letters. There were many people here today. He had ample time to think about what he should do. Nobody asked him what he had accomplished that day. Emerson was too busy interrogating David about Dier el Medina and describing Cyrus's work in the West Valley. Ramses was still weighing the pros and cons when, after an early dinner, his mother sent everyone to bed. They had put in a hard day, and Emerson had decreed they would be out again at dawn. Having made up his mind, Ramses managed to intercept David. Oh, no, the latter groaned after he'd read the message. Not another anonymous letter inviting you to a secret rendezvous in the middle of the night. We haven't had one like that for quite a while. David had had his share of midnight rendezvous during the war. He fixed Ramses with a formidable stare. You aren't thinking of accepting, I hope. He says, Ramses took the letter back, How did the lady die? I know. Come alone. I will tell you. His Arabic isn't very good, is it? Not a native speaker. Oh, he's semi-literate. Could be one of the suffrages at the hotel. They are understandably cautious of the police. You're going, David said resignedly. There's a chance the fellow may really know something, Ramses argued. A chance worth taking. I'm going with you. I thought you'd say that. I'm not fool enough to go alone. And you're the only one with enough experience to stay in concealment. Nefret would raise hell if I told her, and father would raise a different variety of hell. And mother would come charging after you, waving her parasol. I see your point. What about Zethos? Ramses was silent. You don't trust him? David asked. No. Yes. Damned if I know what to think. He turned up most conveniently and coincidentally just after we got hold of one of the most valuable antiquities even he has ever seen. The truth is you don't like him, David said. Yes. No. I feel the same way. Well, David leaned back and folded his arms. I'm with you, of course. It'll be like old times. Do you miss them? Ramses asked curiously. If I had no responsibilities and no hostages to fortune, I'd be up to my neck in the nationalist movement and probably in prison, David added with a wry smile. I know. Maybe a murder investigation will take some of the edge off. I hate to ask you, but... I'd have been deeply hurt if you hadn't. How are we going to go about this? They met behind the stable, an hour before the appointed time. The rendezvous point was in the hills south of Deir el-Bahri. Only a short walk, but this would give them time to scout the area and find a place of concealment for David before the informant arrived. If he did arrive. They were both wearing dark galabias and headcloths, and Ramses noted, with some misgivings, that David appeared to be in a cheerful frame of mind. Don't do anything stupid, he said sternly, such as jumping the fellow when he draws a knife on you. Nothing like that is likely to occur. He hoped he was right. He had told Nefret he meant to work late. She'd have his scalp for a trophy if she found out he had lied to her. Are you armed? he asked. Two of them. David waved his arms. If Ramses hadn't known his abstemious friend so well, he would have suspected David had been drinking. It must be the possibility of action that had got his adrenaline flowing. They walked briskly along the uneven path. It was as familiar to both of them as the passageways of the house, and the moon was bright. No one else was abroad. The villagers went to bed early to save lamp fuel, and would-be tomb robbers had apparently taken the night off, or were busy elsewhere. 
When they reached the steep slopes of detritus that edged the foot of the Jebel, Ramses said softly, It's somewhere near here. The letter writer had been vague about the precise location, possibly because his Arabic vocabulary was limited. Ramses planned to stand full in the moonlight, a safe distance from the cliff face, and wait for the man to come to him. David was no longer smiling. His lean face was set in lines Ramses remembered well from their war days. He nodded without speaking and slipped away, fading into the shadows. He hadn't lost his touch. There was no one in sight, no sound, no movement. Ramses went back the way they'd come, waited for a while, and then retraced his steps. It lacked only ten minutes till the designated time. He came to a stop not far from the cleft into which David had vanished and removed his turban. The ten minutes passed, and so did another ten. He moved a little farther away from the cliff face into full moonlight. He had just about decided his informant wasn't coming when he heard the sound of someone approaching slowly and cautiously. In the dead silence, the crunch of stone under shod feet was as loud as a rockfall. The footsteps stopped. He was close by now, watching. Ramses didn't move. A few minutes passed with agonizing slowness. Then a dark form took shape against the deeper darkness and came toward him. It was a woman. She was completely covered with the black tob and face veil worn by old-fashioned Egyptian females, but Ramses got the impression of feeble old age from the way she moved, slowly and bent over. The uneven steps stopped a few feet away, just out of reach, and the veiled head tilted as if in inquiry. Don't be afraid, Ramses whispered in Arabic. You know me. You know I won't hurt you. He took a step forward, his hand outstretched. The veiled form stumbled back. It is well, Ramses said quickly. I will come no closer. What did you want to tell me? She flung out a black-clad arm, pointing, and let out a high-pitched cawing sound, like that of a bird. Ramses whirled round, staring in the direction she had indicated. And that was the last thing he remembered. 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 Chapter 7. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H Continued. Wake up, damn it. Say something. He knew the voice. The name escaped him for the moment, buried like other memories under a thick layer of pain. But something told him he owed the speaker acknowledgement. What happened? He croaked. Who are you? Don't do this to me, Ramses. Open your eyes, will you? I'd rather not. The name came back to him. David, drink this. An object was jammed against his mouth. One sip of the liquid brought him to a sitting position, choking and sputtering. That's better, David said with a long sigh of relief. I took a leaf from Aunt Emilia's handbook of convenient accoutrement. There's nothing like brandy, she says. Finding that his eyes were now open, Ramses surveyed his surroundings. The scenery hadn't changed. He was in the same place, but he was sitting instead of standing. Moonlight flooded the ground and shone darkly on a pool of liquid near where his head had rested. Blood, he said, pleased at being able to identify it. Mine. You got a hard knock on the head, David sat back on his heels. She had a club of some sort, hidden in that damned full sleeve. Swung it before I could move. She's gone. Damn right she's gone. I fired at her as she was raising her handy club a second time. Missed. Ramses got out a croak of protest, and David said, "'Knowing your dislike of firearms, I didn't tell you I'd brought a pistol. I'm glad I did. I didn't mean to hit her, only stop her before she could deliver another blow. She scuttled off. I didn't chase after her. I was afraid you were—' His voice failed. Ramses discovered he was now capable of uttering more than three words at a time. "'Have some of that brandy. Excellent idea. And then give me another nip. God!' My head feels as if it's about to fall off. Your head ought to be used to that sort of thing by now. You must have inherited the professor's thick skull. 
David handed him the flask. The blessed stuff ran through his veins like liquid fire. Cautiously, he got to his feet. Steady. David took hold of his arm. Maybe you shouldn't try to walk. I can go back to the house and get... No, I'm all right, Ramsay said, as they started back along the path. I don't suppose there's a hope of keeping the fret in the dark about this. What do you think? Not a hope. Damn it, she's going to be furious. Moonlight made walking tricky, hiding obstacles in shadow. He was grateful for the support of David's arm. By the time they reached home, he felt all right except for an aching head. But his spirits plummeted when he saw the main house was brightly lighted. Nefret was waiting for them, and she was definitely furious. When he had failed to come to bed, she had gone looking for him. Discovering he was not in the workroom, she had searched the house and, in the process, raised the whole household. They all trailed along when she dragged him off to the clinic and unwound the turban David had used as a bandage. It was like being attended by a flock of magpies, Ramses thought. They all settled down on various pieces of furniture and peppered him with comments and questions while Nefret bathed and bandaged his head. He let David do most of the talking. Nefret had already told David what she thought of him for collaborating in such a crazy scheme, and he was on the defensive. We took all possible precautions, he protested. It was seeing what I assumed was a woman that lowered my guard for a vital second. Me too, Ramsay said. Keep quiet, Nefret barked. It wasn't a woman, Emerson asked. If it was, she could run like a gazelle and swing like a batsman, David said. But that damned, excuse me, ladies, that all enveloping tob and the way she, he moved like a feeble old woman, took both of us in at first. All right, are you, my boy? Emerson asked anxiously. He'll live, Nefret pinned the bandage neatly in place. If I don't kill him, and David. He saved my life, Ramsay said, again. You think she meant to kill you? His mother asked. Bright-eyed and alert, every hair in place, she sat perched on a stool with the voluminous folds of her dressing gown flowing around her. Why? That's a good question, David said. We talked about it all the way back. Ramsay's claims he doesn't know why. People seldom murder other people without some sort of reason, remarked Sethos. He was leaning against the wall, his arms folded. Logical or otherwise. Ramsay's, have you been spreading alarm and dissension? No, Ramsay snapped. Well, well, Sethos echoed. It can't be relevant, Ramses insisted. I did spread the word that I was the only one, except Father, who knew where the statue was hidden. Mother had started a similar rumour about herself, and I thought it was wise to uh, take the danger upon yourself, his mother inquired coolly. That was thoughtful of you, my dear, but I agree that it does not seem relevant. If one wishes to learn a secret, one does not silence the holder of that secret. "'Expressed in your usual pedantic manner,' said Emerson, "'now reassured as to his son's condition. "'Perhaps she, he, didn't intend murder, "'but abduction and interrogation. "'Man or woman, it would take more than one person to accomplish that,' said his wife. "'Thank you,' Ramsay said. "'Now can I go to bed?' "'Definitely,' Nefret said. "'And if you say one word about breakfast at six, father?' Emerson looked at her in alarm. He wasn't at all intimidated by his wife. Their loud arguments were relished by both of them, but when Nefret spoke in that tone of voice, they all knuckled under. No, no, wouldn't dream of it. Sleep as long as you like, my boy. Um, eight o'clock? Nefret led him off in triumph, her chin set. Their house was quiet and dark, except for the nightlight in the children's room. The dog was stretched out across the threshold. Ramses didn't see her until he stumbled over her. Amira let out a moan of protest. Ramsay swore at her, and Nefret told them both to keep quiet. Lucky the children didn't wake, Ramsay said, in an attempt at casual conversation. Lucky for you. She closed the door of their room and turned into his arms. I hate it when you do this sort of thing, she whispered. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too, for scolding you. It was only because... Show me you're sorry, then. 
Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. The attack on Ramses was somewhat disturbing. My medical experience, confirmed by Nefret, had assured me he was not badly hurt. But if David had not been with him, the consequences might have been serious. When we met for breakfast, at eight o'clock, he looked quite normal, except for the bandage round his head. Fatima gave him an extra-large helping of porridge and four eggs. "'I've been thinking,' I began. (sighs) said Emerson. She thought at me for two hours last night. Bloody nonsense. Not a sensible idea in the lot. I can only conclude, I continued, unperturbed by the interruption, that Ramses knows something the rest of us do not, a fact perhaps unnoticed by him that makes him dangerous to our unknown enemy. Something to do with Mrs. Petherick. Or the statuette, said Emerson, forgetting he had dismissed my conjectures as nonsense. I can't think what it might be, Ramsay said. I had no conversations with the lady when others were not present. As for the statue, I know no more than the rest of you. Let's have another look at it, Sethos suggested. The gleam in his eyes might have been interpreted as greed. Emerson interpreted it that way. Later, he said, with a hard look at his brother. Have you seen the newspaper this morning? David asked. Never read the cursed thing, Emerson said loftily. Normally I didn't either. The news was always at least a day late, and little of it was of immediate interest to us. Since the mystery of the Black Afrit, I had of course perused the Cairo papers, but I hadn't had a chance to see them that morning. What do they say about Mrs. Petherick? I asked. Nothing new, Aunt Amelia. This a rehash of her literary career and her romantic biography by some gushing female admirer and a lurid story about Egyptian mummies. David did not mention the political news, though the major headline read, New Riots in the Delta. He was the only one who followed the political situation closely. It did not make for encouraging reading. The country was still in a state of unrest, anticipating that the forthcoming declaration of Egyptian independence would not answer all the demands of the radicals, as the British government termed them. Howard Carter arrived in Cairo day before yesterday, David added. What? Emerson bounded up. How do you know that? It's in the social column. David said, smiling. He knew that was one part of the newspaper Emerson would never consider reading. He's not planning to leave for Luxor for another week. Emerson sat down. Ah, making the rounds of the antiquities dealers, I expect. Hmm, a week, eh? Let's be off. That is, uh, Ramses, are you sure you're fit for this? Fit for translating hieratic? I inquired. I should think so. Now, Emerson, no objection, if you please. We agreed, did we not, that that was to be his primary task? Yes. Is it advisable for a person who has taken a head injury to work in the dust and heat? No. I patted Ramsay's hand. Have a nice quiet day, my dear. We'll be back for tea. I have never been a skilled horsewoman, but the smooth gait of our Arabians was a pleasure. It was certainly more pleasurable than the steep climb over the hills, which was the only other way of reaching the valley. Needless to say, reader, my thoughts did not dwell entirely on Egyptology. The welfare of my loved ones would always take precedence over scholarship, and there was good reason to assume that danger still threatened some, if not all. Emerson had scoffed at my conjectures, but that did not prevent me from pursuing them mentally. Mr. Lidman's misadventure had been a blow, to Lidman himself, naturally, but also to me, since I had reached the conclusion that he had been responsible for the attempts to break into the house. However, he had the best of all possible alibis for the attack on Ramses, having been incapacitated and guarded at the time. Were there two villains, three, four, a gang? The statuette was prize enough to inspire the lust of several persons, but as I had cogently pointed out, Ramsay's attacker could not have hoped to gain possession of it by that method. I was baffled, but only for the moment. Something was bound to turn up. 
Emerson sent the others down into the burial chamber and set me to work sifting debris. It was not an onerous task, since there was not much, and our people had already picked out the largest objects, such as they were, so I had ample opportunity to look about me. An hour or so later, Emerson pulled himself out of the pit and addressed me. How are you, my dear? Hot? Bored? Where are you off to? A little stroll, Emerson said. May I join you, Emerson? Need you ask, Peabody. Emerson seldom strolls. On this occasion, he actually sauntered, hands in pockets, whistling off-key and looking interestedly from side to side like an ordinary tourist. From time to time, he stopped and stared at nothing in particular that I could see. As I believe I have explained elsewhere, but will repeat for the sake of forgetful readers... The East Valley is shaped like a maple or oak leaf, with lobes reaching out in all directions. They are not interconnected, except at their base. Each ends in rugged cliffs, so it is necessary to retrace one's steps after one has explored each. Tomb entrances are everywhere, some blocked with steel gates, some open to visitors. We must have seen a dozen of them during that stroll, Ramses the Ninth, Ramses the Sixth, Amun Motha, and others. Instead of entering them, Emerson spent an inordinate amount of time staring at their surroundings. At one point, his well-shaped lips parted, and I waited breathlessly for a statement that would explain his actions. "'Workmen's huts,' he said. "'So?' I asked, when it was apparent he had nothing to add. "'Interesting,' said Emerson. "'Not very.' "'Now, now, Peabody, keep an open mind. Everything is of interest to a trained excavator.' The last area we visited was the side wadi in which the tomb of Thutmose the Third was located. Remembering our encounter with the Ibn Simsars, I moved closer to Emerson, but not a sight or sound disturbed the quiet of the place until Emerson spoke again. Might bear investigating, he muttered, contemplating the pile of rubble in which he had dug. It won't be investigated by you, I replied somewhat tartly, for his enigmatic comments were beginning to get on my nerves, and I was extremely warm. Lord Carnarvon holds the concession. You need not remind me of that, Peabody. Well, shall we start back? The usual crowd of sightseers had gathered round KV-55. Among them I saw Sir Malcolm's head, crowned by a fashionable pith helmet. He stood a little distance away from the jostling crowd, eyeing them disdainfully. Seeing Emerson, he moved to intercept us and bade us good morning. "'What are you doing here?' Emerson demanded in his customary forthright manner. "'I believe the Valley of the Kings is open to all visitors, Professor,' Sir Malcolm snapped his fingers. A worried-looking dragoman hastened up and opened a sunshade over his head. "'Observing an excavation in progress here is a rare treat.' "'Weren't you present when Howard Carter was working across the way?' I asked. "'Yes, the fellow's competent enough,' Sir Malcolm conceded. "'But all he turned up were some wretched workmen's huts. "'Professor Emerson is in a class by himself. "'I would consider it a privilege to observe his procedures.' "'The compliment mollified Emerson somewhat, "'but like myself he entertained doubts as to Sir Malcolm's motives.' My procedures, sir, are surely known to an aficionado like yourself. This tomb contains nothing of interest. Hassan's turbaned head appeared. Emerson, he called. Will you come? We have found something. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. A scrap of wood with a half-obliterated cartouche. Emerson said disgustedly. He laid it on the table in front of Ramses. But Hassan's announcement got the whole mob in a twitter, and there was a considerable amount of pushing and shoving. And that bastard Montague. Now, now, his wife said soothingly. His interest was understandable, and he was very polite. He's changed his tactics, Emerson declared. But he's still after the statuette. Can you make out anything, my boy? Holding the scrap delicately by one side, Ramses turned it to catch the fading light. Most of the original paint is gone. The impression at the top of the cartouche could be a sun sign, and this curve 
part of the Kepper Beetle. Smengare, Emerson said triumphantly. He was buried there. I knew it. Not necessarily, Ramsay said. A number of royal names have those signs, including Amenhotep II and Tutankhamun. What do you make of it, Mikhail? He handed the piece to the Russian, who received it on the palm of his hand. It is as you have said, Ramses. Only those two signs are certain. They were usually more deeply carved than others. I'll have another look at it in the morning, when the light is stronger, Ramses said. Though I doubt if it is significant. KV-55 was a cache, after all, with objects from various royals. He replaced the scrap in the box lined with fabric and moved it aside in time to avoid the reaching hand of his daughter. How many times must I tell you not to touch antiquities without permission? he asked sternly. It is only a dirty piece of wood, said Carla. Any object may have historical value, said her brother, blue eyes, accusatory. May I have a look, Papa? Another time, Ramsay said. He didn't want to discourage his son, who had already shown an interest in Egyptology. But he knew that if David John were permitted to examine the scrap, Carla would insist on her turn. Here, yeah, Fatima, will you be good enough to take this to Father's study? Kachinovsky distracted Carla by producing a piece of string and initiating her into the art of cat's cradle. He really did have a knack with children. Unfortunately, his mother got at the postbasket first. Fortunately, Harriet Petherick did not indulge in dainty scented notepaper. His mother handed over the plain white envelope without comment. The handwriting was as large and emphatic as that of a man. There were several other letters for him. He read them first and then opened Harriet's. It left him in what his mother would have called a moral dilemma. Harriet reiterated her request that he tell no one, and what a depressingly familiar sound that had. In this case, he told himself, there couldn't be any danger in going alone. She'd asked him to come to her room at the hotel. He could imagine what his mother would suspect. Poison in the tea, a passionate embrace that would end with a knife in his ribs, a posse of thugs hiding in the bath chamber, plots worthy of the Countess Magda. He laughed, and his mother looked up from the letter she was reading. Something amusing in your correspondence, my dear? No, not very. The situation wasn't at all amusing. He found himself between the devil and the deep blue sea, breaking his word to Harriet Petherick or deceiving his wife again. He could lie with a straight face when he had to, but the trouble with his affectionate, closely knit, inquisitive, helpful family was that the lie had to be clever enough to get them off the track. In the end, he told part of the truth. I'm going over to Luxor for a while. I'll be back in time for dinner. He hadn't expected to get off that easily, nor did he. In the end, he had to pretend to lose his temper. For God's sake, I don't need a bodyguard every time I leave the house. I'm going straight to the Winter Palace, and I'll come straight back. I only want to have a chat with Abdul and one or two of the other suffrages. You've remembered something? his mother asked keenly. Just an amorphous idea. They're more likely to talk to me if I'm alone. Now please, Mamma, may I have your permission to go? May I beg a ride? Kachinovsky asked. I have some business in Luxor. The children set up a clamor of protest. The Russian smiled and held out his hands to them. Little ones, I must not take advantage of your family's kindness. I will see you tomorrow. Falakas and gaily painted boats crowded the river as belated tourists returned to their hotels. The sun was setting when they reached the east bank. Kachanovsky, who had spoken very little during the trip, said good night and left Ramses outside the Winter Palace. Ramses hadn't spoken much either. He'd been remembering Nefret's caresses and loving words. If he had to break his promise to someone, and he obviously did, that someone ought not be his wife. And yet, mingled with his feelings of guilt, was that ungovernable curiosity. Damn it, he told himself. This was an opening not to be missed. His mother would have jumped at it and lied through her teeth if she had to. He had overlooked one little problem. 
Several of the suffragies greeted him with knowing grins as he walked along the corridor toward Harriet Petherick's room. They would spread the word. Nefret would find out where he'd been, and she would know he had deceived her. Harriet was some time responding to his knock. When she opened the door, he stood frozen for a moment. He wouldn't have believed she had such a garment in her wardrobe. It was more like the sort of thing her stepmother would have worn, flowing and feathery, ruffled and beribboned, and pink. Involuntarily, he looked over his shoulder. There, only a few feet behind him, was Abdul, grinning and bowing. Thank you for coming. Harriet threw the door wide, giving Abdul an excellent view of her dishabille. Ramses indulged himself in a curt, explosive suggestion to Abdul, stiffened his spine, and went in. He was in no mood to be polite. The fat was in the fire, and he intended to make sure she would sizzle, too. He gave her a long, insolent survey, from head to foot and back. Colour brightened her cheeks. He doubted it was embarrassment. Rage, more likely. Is there anything you won't do for him? he asked. She didn't pretend to misunderstand. What makes you suppose I wouldn't do this for myself? She came closer and put her hands on his shoulders, tilting her head back to look directly into his eyes. The line of her throat was long and smooth, the tanned skin fading into cream between her breasts. Her full sleeves had fallen back, displaying rounded arms. Ramses knew he ought to turn and walk out, but the damage was already done and there was still a chance she had something sensible to say. He took her hands and led her to a chair. All right, you've made the effort. Why? I told you. Forget that. What's he done that you feel obliged to go to such lengths to protect him? She leaned her head back and closed her eyes. Her hands tightened on the arms of the chair. Then they relaxed, and she looked up at him. You were attacked last night. By Adrian? No. I said I wanted to talk to you, and I do. I will. Please stop looming over me like that. Would you like a drink? No, thank you. Then will you be good enough to get one for me? Brandy. No poison in the drinks, Ramses thought, as he went to the table. He didn't take one for himself. At least he would go home without liquor on his breath. Moved by an embarrassing but irresistible impulse, he opened the door of the bath chamber and looked in after he had handed her the glass. When he came back, she was herself again, bolt upright in her chair, the ruffles drawn closer over her breast. She raised her glass in a sardonic salute. First round to you, she said coolly. What were you looking for? A journalist with a camera? He hadn't thought of that. Beads of perspiration formed on his forehead. Have you anything pertinent to say, or shall I go? He asked. I have a good deal to say. First, it couldn't have been Adrian who waylaid you last night. Oh, yes, I know all about it. The hotel servants gossip incessantly, especially with the help of a little bakshish. They saw Adrian go to his room before midnight and will swear he did not leave the hotel. I'm afraid their testimony won't carry much weight. Bakshish. And our European prejudices. However, there are points in his favour. I can't see him forging a note in Arabic and laying such an elaborate trap. The fellow had some knowledge of the terrain. Adrian doesn't. You'll tell that to the police? If it comes to that, yes. Ramses sat down, facing her. But I can't imagine that it will. There's no firm evidence against Adrian. That policeman thinks there is. Aid? What makes you think so? He's been round again, asking questions. Adrian... She hesitated. Adrian became agitated. It made a bad impression. One can't arrest a man because he became agitated, Ramsay said. He was so much better before we came here. I'd found a new doctor. Adrian was improving. This business has set him back. I want to take him home, but the police won't let us leave. But they can't hold Adrian indefinitely. They'll have to accuse him or let him go. Was that the reason you asked to talk to me? I wanted to give you some background. I don't know whether it will help clear Adrian, but 
Perhaps knowing more about the persons involved will give you a clue. My father... She paused to take a sip of her brandy. Pringle Petherick was a cold, uncaring father and a thoroughly selfish human being. His wealth and his interests were devoted solely to his collection. He married my mother for her money and spent it buying antiquities. She never had a penny for herself. She died, I have always believed, of indifference. Brutal as her assessment was, Ramses preferred this Harriet to the seductress. He doesn't sound like the sort of man who would fall in love with a woman like Countess Magda. Love. She pondered this for a moment, her eyes as cold as stone. I don't know what the word means, especially in this case. He was dazzled, intrigued, and for perhaps the first time in his life, manipulated. The real question is why she married him. He was not a bad-looking man, and in the eyes of the world a wealthy man. But she can't have been after his money. She was one of the most successful authors of the time, and she flaunted her diamonds and expensive gowns. Adrian was dazzled, too. At first she made a great show of maternal affection. It was rather sickening, really. All that cooing and caressing and flattery. But he was too young to remember our mother, and too much in need of love to be critical. His affection for her was genuine. She stopped speaking and drained her glass. Was that all? Ramses asked. Does it help? She leaned forward, hands tightly clasped. There must be other suspects besides Adrian. Your mother has quite a reputation as a detective. My mother, yes. Sooner or later, you will find the person who killed her. It wasn't Adrian. He loved her. A line of poetry slid into his mind. For each man kills the thing he loves. He didn't repeat it aloud. It was only poetry after all. I appreciate your confidence. He got to his feet. I'd better be going. She went with him to the door, ruffles trailing. Are you going to tell your wife you came here? She'll hear it anyhow, Ramsay said sourly. My only hope is to confess before someone else tells her. I've got you in trouble with her, haven't I? Probably. She was leaning against the door. He couldn't reach for the handle without touching her. If it's any consolation, she said, you've had your revenge. What do you mean? You refused me, flatly and without hesitation. Do you have any idea what a devastating blow that is to a woman who is prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice? I expect you'll survive the blow. It wouldn't have been a sacrifice. So you were good enough to say. He reached past her for the doorknob. Good night. He went straight out of the hotel without stopping, and then stood by the door, letting the night air dry the perspiration on his face. Harriet Petherick had enjoyed every moment of that awkward interview. The terrace was full of tourists, enjoying a late-night drink under the twinkling lights. One of them stood up and came toward him. "'How did it go?' inquired Antony Bisinghurst, alias his uncle. Ramses was glad to have a subject onto which he could focus his anger. "'You followed me.' Still in character, Sethos leaned languidly against the wall and folded his arms. I've decided it's time I took an active hand in this affair. You don't seem to have sense enough to take care of yourself. There wasn't any danger. Of another attack, perhaps not. But it will be all over Luxor by morning that you had a romantic tete-a-tete -tete with the Petherick woman. A photograph of you and the lady together would cook your goose with nefret and destroy your credibility as an impartial witness. There was no photographer either. He started down the stairs. She isn't as calculating as you. Defending the lady, are we? How chivalrous. She was calculating enough to swathe herself in filmy robes and make sure Abdul and the other suffragies saw her. Sethos hurried to catch him up. Did she try to seduce you? None of your damned business. Observe that I said try. If I were married to a woman like Nefret, I wouldn't be susceptible either. 
Ramsay swung round and caught his uncle by the collar. Why do you keep provoking me? I can't help it, Sethos said plaintively. Without apparent effort, he detached Ramsay's grip. Old habits are hard to break. Look here, Ramses, let's declare a truce. Someone was lying in wait for you tonight, lurking, as the saying goes. When he saw me join you, he left. Did you see who it was? I think it was your friend, Kachanovsky. Oh, for God's sake, Mikhail is totally harmless. If it was he, he probably only wanted to talk to me or beg a ride back across the river. You scared him off. He's a timid soul. Better safe than sorry. You sound like mother. I take it that isn't meant as a compliment. Ramses didn't reply. They went on down the steps. The area around the hotel and the corniche were brightly lighted, and so was the dock. There were no shadows in which an assassin could lurk. Sethos had probably invented the lurker. That could be the man I saw, Sethos said suddenly. He pointed. The man was Adrian Petherick. He gave the impression of having been out for an innocent evening stroll. There was no guilty start when he saw them, no change in his bright smile. Good evening, he said. A beautiful night, is it not? Yes, it is, Ramsay said. Does your sister know you're out? Adrian chuckled. Dear Harriet, I can't have her trailing me all the time, you know. She had an appointment this evening. Was it with you, by any chance? As a matter of fact, it was. What did she tell you? His smiling face was without guile, but there was something in his tone that set off alarm bells in Ramsay's mind. She's concerned about you, he said bluntly. You wouldn't go off without telling her. There is still an unknown killer at large. Unless it's me, Adrian said cheerfully. Is there any new information? No. Adrian shook his head. The police aren't very clever, are they? That fellow, for instance. He turned. He's been following me for two days. Plain clothes, you could say. He's dressed like all the other Egyptians, in that flapping robe and turban. But I spotted him right away. Well done, Ramses said. Aid's plain clothes detachment needed training. The turbaned head peering out from behind a tree was as conspicuous as a camel. I'm going in now, Adrian announced. Do give my regards to your beautiful wife and the rest of the family. He doesn't look anything like Mikhail, Ramses said, watching Adrian ascend the stairs two at a time. They are approximately the same height. When Kajanovsky isn't being Uriah Heap, and uh, both are slightly built, I didn't see his face. Standard clothing, pith helmet, dark trousers and coat. When they reached the dock, Sabia was lying in wait. You let another boatman bring you across, he said accusingly. But you found out, Ramsay said. I were, of course. So I waited to take you back. I cannot imagine how a criminal remains undiscovered for long here, Sethos remarked as they took their seats. Or is it only your activities that merit such close attention? The latter, I think. We don't want to talk about it. About what? Young Petherick. You feel sorry for him because of his wartime experiences, but he is either mad as a hatter or extremely cunning. In either case, he is a prime candidate for the role of murderer. But why? Ramses demanded, goaded into argument. What motive could he have? According to his sister, he was devoted to his stepmother. Motive? as all criminologists know, is not evidence. People kill people for the damnedest reasons. Some murderers hear voices. Others have such monumental egos that they appoint themselves judge as well as executioner. Then there are the simple souls, who let small grievances pile up month after month and year after year, until an equally small grievance pushes them over the edge. To say nothing of the, you've made your point... Ramses interrupted. No, I haven't. I was working up to the fact that, as yet, we know almost nothing about any of these people. We need more background. I may have to go to Cairo for a few days. The boat bumped gently against the bank. Ramses jumped out, leaving his uncle to fend for himself. His concern for Adrian, 
had been submerged in a more immediate worry. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses was late. I'd expected that, but I hadn't expected he would be accompanied by Sethos. The latter looked particularly bland. We've had to put dinner back, the fret said, accusing me. Even further back. Sorry, Ramses said. Sethos went to the table and poured two glasses of whiskey. He handed one to Ramses and settled himself comfortably in a chair with the other glass in his hand. Hmm, I said. That bad, was it? Ramses took a long swallow and a deep breath. No, not at all. That is, uh, not in the conventional sense. I've just had an interview with Harriet Pellerick. I suspected as much, I said. I didn't, said Nefret. I believed you. Ramsay's eyes fell under her accusing stare. I gave her my word I wouldn't tell anyone beforehand. You gave me your word you'd never go off again without telling me. I did tell, God damn it! Ramsay slammed his empty glass down on the table. Do you want to hear what happened or don't you? Oh, yes, I certainly do, Nefret said gently. Without further ado, Ramses plunged into his narrative, his description of Harriet Petherick's attire, though vague as one might have expected from a male observer, raised a number of eyebrows. Having completed what was obviously for him the most dodgy part of the story, he paused for breath and for another glass of whiskey. Pink, I said thoughtfully. Very interesting. She must have taken the garment from her stepmother's wardrobe. That implies premeditation. What happened after you refused her advances, Ramses? Was that her only reason for inviting you? She claimed she wanted to give me certain background information, Ramses said, more at ease now that the worst was over. She was extremely critical of her father, who was, in her own words, selfish and cold to his first wife and to his children. The second Mrs. Petherick was quite unlike his first wife, worldly and wealthy, famous and uh, feminine. Harriet couldn't understand why Magda was attracted to Petherick, but she was determined to marry him, and she succeeded. There are attractions a daughter might not understand, I said. And Petherick was rich, wasn't he? So was Magda, Ramsay said, flaunting her jewels and expensive gowns, to quote Harriet. That is no indication of wealth, I remarked, rather the reverse in some cases. I don't know what her income may have been, but she spent it lavishly, as for her success in uh, trapping Mr. Petherick. Men of a certain age are particularly vulnerable to such advances. She caught him at a susceptible moment. Emerson cleared his throat noisily, and I amended my analysis. Some men. Not I, said Sethos. I've always been susceptible. Is that all? Nefret inquired of her husband. She said that the lady had made a concerted effort to win Adrian over, at least at the beginning, and insists that he was genuinely attached to her. In retrospect, Ramsay said slowly, I believe she was and is primarily concerned with gaining our help for her brother. She claims the police have fixed on him as the killer. She wants to take him home for medical treatment. He is in need of it, Nefret said. Sethos uncrossed his legs. I'm not so sure, Nefret. We encountered the young man on our way to the dock, and his manner and conversation were those of a completely normal, very alert person. He even made a few little jokes about being under suspicion. A clever man can feign dementia, and it's a legitimate legal defense. I don't believe it, Nefret said stubbornly. That is... I suppose you are right, but I don't believe it applies to Adrian. Fatima poked her head out the door. Dinner is served. My man says he cannot put it back any longer. Is he crying? Emerson demanded. Yes, father of curses. Damnation! We're coming, Fatima. While the others were taking their places, I had a quiet word with Nefret. Ramses told you the truth, Nefret. Nothing, nothing happened. I know. She put her arm round my waist. Her blue eyes were clear and bright. I just like to stir him up now and then. He's absolutely irresistible when he loses his temper. She laughed and gave me a little squeeze. That's all right, then, I said, relieved. 
I remember once when Emerson... Peabody! Emerson said loudly. What are you gossiping about? Sit down, if you please. Over dinner, I requested that Ramses and Sethos go into more detail about their conversations with the Petherics. There was certainly food for thought in several of the statements that had been made. So, Aid is having Adrian followed, I said. That is extremely interesting, growled Emerson. The soup was quite salty. What do you mean, Peabody? Is that you are vexed because Aid hasn't consulted you? No, but I am a trifle surprised that Miss Petherick hasn't applied to me for assistance. Nefret gave Ramses a certain look, and realising I had revived a delicate subject, I hurried on. Or to a solicitor, British justice is British justice, and Adrian cannot be detained indefinitely. I told her that, Ramses said. He put his soup spoon down. It is not good? Fatima asked, anxiously. It's fine. I'm not hungry for lentil soup, that's all. I, it is only after one thing, Sethos said. Or rather, two things that are interrelated. He wants to be the one to catch the perpetrator. It would be quite a feather in his fez. And he wants to make sure one of his own people isn't made the scapegoat. That's nonsense, David said. No Egyptian would dare kill a foreigner. The penalties are too severe. You know that, and I know that, and Aid knows that, Sethos retorted. He also knows that accusing an Egyptian would be the easiest way out of the mess for the British. We've had a number of chats on the subject. What? I cried. You and the inspector? When? On several occasions, Sethos said, with an infuriating smile. He thinks I'm an agent of British intelligence. You are, David said blankly. He jumped. Someone must have kicked him in the ankle. I would have done so had I been closer to him. Not the one he thinks I am, Sethos said. Who, I demanded, is Antony Bisinghurst? It's me, Sethos said. Or rather, I am he. One of your numerous personae? It's one I use when I require official support, Sethos explained. Tony is a bona fide member of the Interior Department, well known to the authorities. Good God, Emerson muttered. So what has I told you? He sets his sights on Adrian right enough. I understand why. There isn't anybody else. What about Harriet? I inquired. Come now, Peabody, Emerson exclaimed. It can't have been she. Why not? Because she's a woman? I'm surprised you should still suffer from prejudice against my gender, Emerson, in view of the fact that we've encountered more than one female antagonist. Harriet is, in my opinion, a much more likely suspect than her brother. Unlike him, she detested her stepmother, and she is tall enough and strong enough to pass for a man. I wondered if you would think of that, Sethos murmured. You did, of course, certainly. You cannot accuse me, Amelia, dear, of harboring prejudices against the female sex. Before retiring that night, I made one of my little lists. I waited until Emerson had had his coffee next morning before I produced my list. In my opinion, I said, we've been negligent in failing to follow up certain of the inquiries we launched some time ago and in exploring other avenues. Emerson snatched the paper from my hand. Good God, Peabody, you've outdone yourself this time. I see that under suspects you have listed Sir Malcolm, Lidman, Karnofsky, Harriet, Adrian, and Mr. Salt, the manager of the Winter Palace. Why not Cyrus or Winlock? Because we are well acquainted with them, of course. The others are new to Luxor. Mr. Salt took over the management only a few months ago. How do we know he is not a homicidal maniac who was, perhaps, cheated by Mr. or Mrs. Petherick? Anybody can be a homicidal maniac, Emerson said, with more passion than accuracy. There are times when I feel myself leaning in that direction. Really, Peabody. If you will look at the second column of my list, you will see that I have suggested several practical lines of investigation. Hmm, said Emerson, scanning the paper again. 
We can't check on the backgrounds of all these people. For all we know, any guest in the hotel could harbour a grudge against Mrs. Petherick. He started to close his fist on my list, caught my eye and handed it back to me. I haven't time for this nonsense. Let's go. Where? I inquired acerbically. KV-55, Deir el Medina, or the West Valley? You can't seem to make up your mind. I know precisely what I'm doing, Emerson retorted. Come, if you are coming. When Emerson and I are having one of our friendly discussions, we're seldom interrupted. Now David ventured to speak. Do you want me to bring the cameras, Professor? Certainly. Be quick, if you please. He strode out, followed by Nefret, David, and after a moment, by Ramses. I may as well go along, I said to Sethos. What about you? Sethos smiled at Fatima, who was trying to refill his cup. No, thank you, Fatima. Your coffee tempts me to remain, but duty calls. The professor has questioned my abilities and impugned my talents. What on earth are you talking about? I asked. Fatima, who had even less idea than I, nodded and beamed. He thinks I missed something while I was looting, uh, investigating that tomb, Sethos said. I want to be on hand when he admits I didn't. We joined the others in the stable. Ramses very kindly offered me Risha, but I declined in favour of one of the stallion's granddaughters, a pretty little mare called Amber. As Sethos had guessed, Emerson led the procession to the East Valley and Tomb 55. I hadn't been there for several days, and I was impressed at the progress the men had made. Most of the burial chamber had been cleared. Only one corner, and the niche that had contained the beautiful canopic jars, remained to be examined. The morning's work was as unproductive as our earlier excavations. The far corner contained the same sort of miscellany we had already found. Pottery fragments, one of them bearing a red and black floral design, an unshaped lump of yellow quartzite and a few faience beads. The last of these having been recorded and removed, Emerson stood with hands on hips surveying the now empty chamber. No hidden rooms, said Sethos in a studiously neutral voice. I didn't expect there would be, said Emerson. Not even a hole in the wall. Emerson shot him a hateful look. There's still the canopic niche. Shall we start on it? Ramses asked. Um, not today. Emerson took out his watch. Good gad, it's later than I thought. Don't you want to get back to your bits of papyrus, my boy? Whatever you say, father. I am off to Luxor, Sethos announced. Emerson muttered something that might have been good riddance and headed back toward the entrance, leaving David and Nefret to pack up the cameras. My brother-in-law gallantly offered me an arm. It's odd, you know, he said. What is? Emerson's behavior. He's been digging in that wretched hole for the stated purpose of finding some evidence that the statuette was once there. Yet he doesn't seem bothered by his lack of success. One would expect a few curses at the very least, wouldn't one? We haven't quite finished yet. Hmm, said Sethos. Why are you going to Luxor? I asked. I intend to follow some of the leads you so cleverly suggested. May I borrow that excellent little list of yours? I believe I saw you put it in your pocket. I handed it over. You will, of course, inform me of the results of your investigations. How could you suppose otherwise, my dear? He and Ramses went off toward the donkey park, not exactly together, for although they walked side by side, they did not speak or look at each other. As we pushed through the tourists, I saw Sir Malcolm, dapper as ever, under a very large umbrella held by his dragoman. What luck? he called. None, Emerson bellowed, without stopping. It was only mid-morning, so I took it for granted that Emerson had no intention of returning to the house just yet. The West Valley? I inquired, hopefully. Cyrus always brought an ample supply of food and water. Emerson hadn't given me time to pack a luncheon basket. May as well, said Emerson. You're behaving most erratically, I informed him. No, I am not, said Emerson. Nefret and David caught us up soon after we turned into the road to the West Valley. 
I prefer to set a deliberate pace over rough ground for the sake of the dear horses. Cyrus hailed us with delight. I was hoping you'd come. Seems I'm in need of a photographer. Happy to oblige, said Emerson. David, let the boy have a glass of tea first, Cyrus said. Y'all look pretty hot and dusty. The ride is hot and dusty, I replied. Is that Mr. Lidman? Cyrus glanced round. Like myself, he always erected a temporary shelter when there was no convenient empty tomb at hand. My question had been unnecessary, seated under the canvas canopy beside a large basket, was the unmistakable form of Mr. Lidman. He insisted on coming out today, Cyrus replied. He still isn't fit for much, but he wanted to resume his duties. Lidman rose and removed his hat when we approached. In my opinion, he'd been unwise to leave his bed. Sunburn patched his pale, puffy face, and his attempt at a smile was rather pitiful. I have taken on the duties of a houseman, you see, he said. Alas, I am unable to do more. Nefret studied him with sympathetic concern. You ought not tax your strength so soon, Mr. Ledman. Take it slowly. Emerson had very little patience with weakness, and even less with Mr. Lidman. Quite, he said, having drained his glass. Now then, Vandergilt, let's see how you're getting on. David and Nefret unpack the cameras. Peabody, there's a nice high heap of debris that requires sifting. You can help Jumana. What? Don't I get Hassan and the other fellows, too? Cyrus inquired with a grin. They'll be along later, said Emerson, oblivious to sarcasm. I left them closing up KV-55. You finished there already? Cyrus asked. Not quite. No, not quite. However, there is more to be done here. Always give a friend a helping hand, eh? Ah, oh, Bertie! What were you doing over there with Jumana? You ought to be working on your plan of the tomb. I thought I'd wait until we finished the clearance, Bertie said meekly. The debris is piling up, and Jumana, Mrs. Emerson, will give her a hand. Come along. Nefret gave Bertie a consoling pat on the arm. Though Cyrus yielded to Emerson in most cases, he was adamant about stopping work by mid-afternoon. I've been out here since 6 a.m., he announced, and I'm tired and hot and ready for a long, cool bath. I sent Lidman home already. He was looking sickly. The man is absolutely useless, Emerson grumbled. I can't fire a fellow because he's been taken sick, Cyrus said. That wouldn't be right. I'll see you folks later. By the time we reached our house, I, too, was ready for a long, cool bath. Ramses and Kachanovsky were working, and Sethos had not yet returned from Luxor, so I was able to take my time. Splashing merrily about in my tin tub, I eventually attracted the attention of Emerson, and we had a nice little interlude. My attempts to persuade him to confess what he was up to failed, however, and I must admit I didn't persist in them long. Emerson's cheerful frame of mind dissipated when he saw Mr. Kachanovsky on the veranda, playing with the children. The game seemed to involve feeding one another pieces of biscuit. I'm tired of having that fellow hanging about, he complained. Why is he here every day? Not so loud, I protested. He'll hear you. Taking tea with us is part of his agreement with Ramses, as you know perfectly well. Good afternoon, Mr. Kachanovsky. I trust you had a productive day? Kachanovsky was unable to reply, since Carla had shoved an entire biscuit into his mouth. Ramses answered for him. Very productive. We've got most of the fragments flattened and dried, and have begun a preliminary catalogue. Several look particularly interesting. Ramses has a remarkable memory, said Kachanovsky, after a strenuous swallow. I believe he could recite a full list of the fragments. It's a matter of practice. Ramses said modestly. It's a matter of a peculiar mental quirk, Nefret said with a smile. At one time, he could take one look at a room and recall every object in it. Carla, don't keep pushing food into poor Mr. Kachanovsky's mouth. You'll choke him. He wind, Carla explained. 
We do the paper stone knife with our fingers, and the one who wins gets the biscuit. One, I said absently, not wind. Are you going to pour the tea, Peabody? Emerson demanded. What are you waiting for? Fatima hasn't brought the teapot yet. That is why I expect she's waiting for your, uh, for Seth, for Antony. He came in a while ago, Ramsay said, and went to bathe and change. Fatima emerged with the teapot. He comes, she announced dramatically. She had even trained Karim to fling open the door so that Sethos could make his entrance without breaking stride. I hope I haven't held you up, he said with a royal nod at Karim. Pour the tea," said Emerson, to me. "So, what is the news?" I said to Sethos. His gesture indicated the children, who had gathered round him and were simultaneously explaining the new game. "Ah," said Sethos. "I believe I will have to consider my strategy before I enter into contention. Practice on Mister Kachanovsky a while longer, eh?" "Something is wrong," I said softly. "There has been a new development." Sethos said in equally subdued tones, "The Petheriks have left Luxor. They caught the late night train to Cairo." "Good God!" Emerson exclaimed. "I cannot say I'm surprised," I said, pouring tea. "You wouldn't, would you?" Emerson growled. "Come now, Peabody. Not even you could have anticipated this." "I didn't say I had anticipated it. I said I wasn't surprised. Not after hearing Ramsay's account of his interview with Harriet." "I said nothing to bring this on." Ramses protested. "Quite the contrary. I did my best to reassure her. She was beyond reassurance, I believe." I said. "What a foolish act! The police will take flight for a sign of guilt. How did Edwin and Harriet elude them? Surely Mister Salt had been told to inform Aid if they checked out of their rooms. They didn't. They simply walked out of the hotel and went straight to the train station. They had each a single small suitcase. It's taken me all day to find this out." Sethos added petulantly, and for Aid to get permission to alert the police in Cairo, the train isn't due until this evening. They won't be on it, Ramses said. He was sitting quite still, his cup in his hand. Why do you say that? Nefret asked. Because Harriet Petherick knows the police will be on her trail, and that they can't possibly leave Egypt without being intercepted. God knows what she has in mind, but I don't like this development. Adrian isn't dependable. You surely don't believe he's capable of harming her," I exclaimed. "I'm afraid he might be," Nefret said in a stifled voice. She looked down at her clasped hands. "I've been thinking about what Ramsay said last night. Adrian's actions are consistent with a condition called manic depressive disease, alternating states of energy and lethargy. I was taught that mental illnesses are always a result of damage to the brain, caused by purely physical agents. But that view is changing, and the evidence is persuasive. Severe emotional trauma can also trigger such attacks. I too am familiar with modern psychiatric theory. I said, in his manic state, he could be dangerous. He has been dangerous, Nefret said wretchedly. Bursting into someone's house and threatening people with a gun can't be considered harmless. If Ramses hadn't taken the pistol from him, I don't know what he'd have done. That isn't the only indication, Ramses said. I didn't tell you because, well, because it seemed a violation of her privacy. There were bruises on her arms. I saw them when her sleeves fell back, fresh bruises. Chapter Eight. I've got to find them," Ramses said. Not until the next morning did we receive confirmation of our suspicions and fears. The train had been met and the passengers questioned. The Petheriks had not been among them. One of Sethos's colleagues had, at his request, taken part in the inspection, and Sethos assured us he could not have been deceived by a disguise, however ingenious. It was clear that he took the matter as seriously as Ramses. Why you? Nefret's blue eyes were hard. It isn't your responsibility. The statement was true in the narrowest sense, but as she knew only too well, Ramses had that rare quality—a burden, some might call it, 
of feeling responsibility for the weak and defenceless. Harriet Petherick was a woman who had appealed to him for help. He would have done the same for any man, woman or child. He had got this quality from me, so I did not attempt to argue with him. Emerson did. The Fred is right, you know. What can you do that the police cannot? The girl has lost her head. As women are inclined to do, I murmured. Oh, do be quiet, Peabody. Some women are, and some men too. She doesn't know her way around Egypt, and it won't take the police long to locate her and her brother. No doubt that is true, Ramsay said. He had pushed his plate aside and was pacing up and down the dining room. I'm concerned about what may happen before the police find them. For each man kills the thing he loves, Sethos intoned. Ramses shot him a quick look, and Emerson said in disgust, Poetry. Poetry often expresses universal truths, I said. And to put it in psychological terms, people may feel ambivalent about those they love, particularly if they are suffering from mental excitability. Psychology, Emerson exclaimed. I have asked you not to talk psychology at me, Peabody. It is worse than poetry. Whether you like it or not, Father, there is some truth in what Mother says, Nefret admitted reluctantly. Harriet is overprotective of her brother, for good reason, admittedly, but it wouldn't be surprising if he unconsciously resented her. Emerson clapped his hand to his brow. Please, Nefret, not the unconscious. I don't believe in it. Urged by Fatima, Ramses returned to his chair and picked up his fork. I'm sure the authorities would agree with you, Father. They'll be looking for a pair of fugitives, not for a woman who may be in danger from the person who is closest to her. They got off the train somewhere between here and Cairo. I'm going to try to trace them. His tone of quiet determination silenced even Emerson. There's a local train at eleven, Ramses went on. I mean to be on it. And I... David said, in the same tone. Cut it, Emerson said. Nefret and Selim can handle the photography as well as I, David said. <clears throat> Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. Let me do the dear man credit. Consideration for his son overruled even his preoccupation with his excavations. He did not really believe Harriet Petherick was in danger, but he was familiar with Ramsay's reckless habits. David was a restraining influence as well as a loyal friend. What about your friend, um, Karnofsky? he asked. Kachanovsky, Ramses corrected. I suppose I'm possessive about those scraps. He's competent and reliable, but I'd rather be here while he's working on them. And I would rather he were not working here alone, I said. It is for his own protection, really. He won't be under suspicion if anything untoward occurs. Something untoward, such as an attempted murder or theft? Sethos hadn't spoken for some time. Unlike Ramses, he was making an excellent breakfast. Something along those lines, I agreed. What are your plans? Sethos patted his mouth delicately with his napkin. In my opinion, I can be of more use here. If David is with him, Ramses will be amply protected. I'm going to pack a few things, Ramses said, pushing his chair back. Nefret, will you help me? Silently, lips tight, she went with him. Sethos chuckled. He takes my little jokes too much to heart. A pity he can't get over his dislike of me. You go out of your way to annoy him, that is why, I said. Ambivalence, Sethos explained. Unconsciously, I am really very fond of the boy. That was too much for Emerson. He jumped up and threw his napkin on the table. Then you can take his place on the dig. What dig? I inquired. KV-55, or the West Valley, or Deir el-Medina? The West Valley, of course. There was no of course about it. I had a glimmer of an idea of what Emerson was up to. If he had had the courtesy to tell me and ask for my assistance, I would have lent it. As it was, I simply sniffed meaningfully. I can't help you there, Sethos said. I'm no excavator. You excavated the best objects out of KV-55. Emerson retorted. An evil smile spread across his face. You can help Peabody sift the fill. We saw the boys off for Luxor an hour later. 
I would never give over thinking of them as boys, despite the fact that I had to stand on tiptoe to kiss them goodbye. Nefret had herself under close control. Only her responsibilities as a mother prevented her from insisting upon accompanying them, but her lined brow and anxious eyes betrayed her concern for her husband. Remember, she said, when they were about to leave, to approach him carefully. Anything that can be interpreted as a threat may set him off. And don't count on her to stop him. She will... I know, you told me. He smiled reassuringly and gave her a quick kiss. Don't worry. It's all right, you know. We watched them set off along the road. Side by side, as they had so often been, close as brothers and closely resembling each other in the length of their strides and the athletic grace of their tall frames and their waving black hair. Put on your hats! I shouted. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. You think I've gone off half-cocked, don't you? Ramses asked. I don't understand all that talk about ambivalence and manic depression, David admitted. You understand it all right. You mean you don't accept it, like father. One needn't resort to psychological jargon to acknowledge a not uncommon human trait. Children love their parents, but they also resent their authority. In a way... Adrian is Harriet's child. He's all she's got left. She'd fight for him like a mother tigress. They arrived early for the train, as Ramses had planned, in order to give them time to faddle with the porters and clerks. Gossip, in other words. That leisurely, casual sort of exchange, at which they were both experienced, was more likely to yield information than interrogation, particularly by a police officer, Egyptians had a well-founded reluctance to confide in the police. One of the porters remembered the Petherics. He had told the police that, but he went on to add information he hadn't bothered to give them. They had only two small pieces of luggage. The gentleman did not speak. She did all the talking and held him always by his arm and pushed him into the carriage. What way is that for a woman to behave? She had the money. A woman in control of money is like a camel without a driver. Perhaps he is an invalid, said one more charitable listener. God be merciful to him. By handing out additional bakshish, they got a carriage to themselves, but it was a long, tedious journey. Quaint mud-brick villages and humble minarets, groves of palm trees and water buffaloes splashing in the shallows had long since ceased to hold any novelty for them. The trip was enlivened only by their questioning of the porters at various stops. No one had seen the brother and sister at Kina, Achmim, or Asiut. At Minya, a peddler of fruit said he had sold oranges to a lady with dark hair and a voice as deep as a man's. He endorsed the first porter's assessment of women who held the purse strings. Aywa, there was a gentleman with her, but he did not come to the window. He let her do the bargaining and hand over the money. They didn't leave the train, though, David asked. No, oh, blessings be upon you for your generosity, Effendi. The train started up again. That's the last stop before Cairo, David said closing the window to keep the dust out. It already formed a thin layer on every flat surface. The train does stop at other stations on demand. They might have got off at any number of places. Not in the middle of the night. Ramses lit another cigarette. He was smoking more than usual, an admission of worry he didn't bother concealing from David. And there are no acceptable hotels in the smaller cities. She'd probably be aware of that. Not that I'm complaining... But this is beginning to look like a wild goose chase. They must have got by the police in Cairo somehow. There's one more stop, Ramsey said. Damn, that's right, Bedrashin. It's so close to Cairo, one doesn't think of it as a separate place. You think that's it? They'd have arrived around midday, and tourists get off there to visit Saqqara and Memphis. Safety in numbers, David said, looking chagrined, and several alternate routes. They could hire a carriage to take them to Cairo or to the Mena house from which one can catch the tram. Wake me when we get there, David said, and rested his head against the back of the seat. Ramses had brought a book. In his family, it was considered as much a travel necessity as shaving gear and a change of socks. He was unable to concentrate, though. 
Harriet Petherick's face kept intruding between his eyes and the printed page. Not the face of the unpracticed seductress, but that of the girl who had met his eyes without flinching, and whose features softened when she smiled. He kept seeing the bruises, too, on her forearms, where hands might have gripped her. An exaggerated sense of delicacy had prevented him from mentioning them until he realized it was more likely they'd been made by her brother than by a passionate lover. Harriet wasn't the sort of woman who entertained men in her room. The train didn't reach Bedrashin until after midnight. He and David were among the few who got off at that hour, and they were able to hire a carriage without difficulty. The drivers were responsive, but not helpful. Many persons had got off the midday train the day before. All foreigners looked alike, after all. Where to? David asked, as they got into their carriage. The manor house, I suppose. We may as well stay there tonight. I hope we can get a room. It's the height of the season. The famous hotel at the base of the Pyramid Plateau was full, but Ramses and his family were well known there. They were given a suite kept reserved for distinguished guests, with a broad terrace overlooking the pyramids and a bath chamber, big as a drawing room, with ornate gold fittings. When they inquired after their friends, who had arrived the day before, the clerk assured them that no one named Petherick had registered, and that he could recall no lady of Harriet's description. Adrian's description might have fit any of a number of men. They must have taken a carriage to Cairo from Bedrashin, David said, yawning widely as he took out his pyjamas. It won't be easy finding them. There are dozens of hotels. Are you suggesting we give up? Not at all. I'm perfectly happy to wallow in luxury for as long as it takes. They took the tram to Cairo next morning. None of the attendants remembered seeing the Petherick's. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson had been quite serious about enlisting his brother's assistance on the dig, though to be accurate, it was more a matter of conscription than enlistment. I could stay here and supervise Katanovsky, Sethos offered in a last-ditch effort, and entertain the kiddies. You do too much of the latter, Emerson retorted. David John gave me a lecture the other day on the best methods of forging Ushebdis. As for Karnovsky, you know perfectly well he won't be coming. Ramses sent a letter to the hotel for him, explaining the change of plan. Now get ready to go. I'll help Fatima pack a luncheon basket, said Sethos, and vanished before Emerson could object. Cyrus greeted Antony Bisinghurst cordially. I can sure use you, he declared. Lisman's walked out on me. Good God, I exclaimed. How did he elude you? Walked out, as I said. Right after breakfast this morning, while we were getting our gear together. The gateman had no reason to stop him. Not in broad daylight, when he wasn't doing anything wrong. But without even a word to you, I began... Oh, he left me a letter. Apologies, excuses, and so on. He said he couldn't handle the work. Didn't want to take advantage of my kindness. Needed time to recover. Did he say where he was going? I persisted. Nope. None of my business, was it? Hmm, said Emerson, stroking his chin. I rather think it is our business, Sethos said. We can't let our suspects go scampering off in all directions, now can we? I'll get on his trail. It might have been only an excuse to get out of sifting the fill, the most tedious and onerous of duties, but I didn't think so. Neither did Emerson. He nodded. Question the boatman first. If Lidman has nothing to hide, he will have returned to his hotel. Thank you for the advice, Sethos said. I might not have thought of that. Emerson ground his teeth. Sethos gave us a cheery wave and rode off. After a cursory glance into the tomb, where the men were still clearing the corridor, Emerson said, "'May I borrow Bertie this morning?' "'I guess so,' Cyrus said. "'What for? "'I want to have a look at the other tomb in this area, number twenty-five. "'What for?' Cyrus repeated. "'For the sake of thoroughness,' said Emerson, loftily and unhelpfully. Bertie asked the same question and got a slightly more informative answer. One of the tombs, number 25, is probably late 18th dynasty. 
Some people believe it was meant to be Akhenaten's, but it was never finished because he moved to Amarna and constructed his official tomb there. Isn't Tomb 25 uh, the one Belzoni found in 1817? Bertie asked. Emerson looked at him in surprise and then clapped him on the back. Well done, my boy. You've been reading up on the area. Bertie directed a longing glance at Jumana, hard at work on the fill, and accepted his fate. I heard it from Lidman, as a matter of fact. He spouted facts and figures by the yard to anybody who'd listen to him. What do you want me to do, sir? I want an accurate plan. The entrance was blocked by a stone wall when Belzone found it, Emerson explained as we walked on. As was the bastard's habit, he used a battering ram to destroy the wall, then left the place wide open. There were four coffined mummies inside. Probably later intrusions, I interrupted. Thank you, Peabody, said Emerson, with excessive courtesy. I am willing to accept your familiarity with the literature. Belzoni was an entertaining writer, even if his methods were questionable, I said. He didn't bother removing the coffins. I doubt there will be much left of them. There may be enough remaining to prove the mummies were not 18th dynasty, Emerson retorted, and that the tomb was never finished or occupied at that period, which will eliminate it as a possible source of the statue, I concluded. I see, said Bertie, who didn't look as if he did. The unfinished tomb was only a short distance away, the entrance had been cut through the hard-packed gravel at the foot of the cliff. A dark opening that led down into deeper darkness. Bertie was the only one of us who had had sense enough to bring a torch. I would have done if Emerson had bothered to mention what he had in mind before we left the house. Its light showed the topmost steps of a flight of stairs, though they were so littered with hardened mud and bits of gravel that they looked more like a steep ramp. Uh, let me go first, Bertie said, with an anxious look at me. No, no, my boy. Emerson took the torch from him and began picking his way down. Wouldn't want you to fall. Just follow my steps. We got down without incident, though Bertie's attempts to hold me by the arm were distracting. The dear boy meant well, so I did not object. At the bottom of the stairs, a square-cut doorway, typical of tombs of the period, debouched into a narrow room half-filled with rubble. This is all there is, said Emerson, waving the torch. It was meant to be a passageway, I believe, with a burial chamber beyond, but they never got that far along. Belzoni had said there were eight coffins, neatly arranged in two rows. The industrious modern thieves had been there since his time, looking for ornaments buried with the dead. Only fragments of cartonnage from the coffins and bits of mummy remained. Twenty-second dynasty said Emerson, shining his torch on one of the fragments. It was only six inches long by three wide, and most of the paint had flaked off, but neither of us questioned Emerson's analysis. If you will permit me to say so, I said, this little expedition was a waste of time. Clearing the tomb out will take days, and for what purpose? It is the most unlikely place to find something like... Hmm. Hmm, what? Emerson inquired. Nothing. I had remembered Abdullah's cryptic statement. The last place you would think of, he had said. But Emerson had thought of it, and my assessment stood. Several other archaeologists had inspected this tomb. It had undoubtedly been ransacked by modern looters, but an Amarna work of art would not have been owned by a commoner who lived several centuries after that period. We made our way back to the entrance. I'm afraid, sir, Bertie said diffidently, that I can't do a proper plan until the place is cleared out, unless you'd like me to... No, no, Emerson winked at him. I wanted to give you an excuse to get away from the cursed Phil. Boring job. Thank you, sir. Emerson strode off with the cocksure pose of a man who has just done a good deed. I took the arm Bertie offered. How are you and Jamana getting on? I asked. The same. I've asked her to marry me six times. Then stop asking her. Ramsay said essentially the same thing, Bertie admitted with a sheepish smile. He suggested I find another girl. 
as if all I had to do was spin round and point at the first one I saw. Spin round and look, at any rate. Keep an open mind and leave off pressing Jumana. That often has a negative effect, especially with a strong-minded young person like her. Was that how the professor wooed you? He gave me a sidelong look, as if he feared he'd gone too far. I laughed and squeezed his arm. My dear, the professor will tell you I did the wooing. One of his little jokes, of course, but until the moment when he asked me to be his, he had done nothing but criticize me and shout at me. I could try that, I suppose. I studied his friendly, ingenuous face and tried to picture him shouting at Jumana. I doubt you could be convincing. Just ignore her. Let her sift her own rubble. Bertie followed my advice, and I went to help Jumana. She was bored with the job and told me so. I have had no chance to practice excavation, she complained, or even look for other tombs in the West Valley. Why didn't the professor let me go with him instead of Bertie? I assured her she hadn't missed much, but agreed that her abilities were being wasted. Like many of the youngsters of Gona, she had spent her childhood scrambling around the cliffs looking for lost tombs. The Gonawis had a knack, inherited, some might say, from their ancient ancestors for locating them. I kept watching for Sethos, but the day wore on without a sign of him. What could he be doing all this time? Our suspicions of Lidman were based on very slight evidence, after all. One couldn't really say that he had fled. He had left the castle openly, as he had every right to do. Thanks to Cyrus's habit of closing down at a reasonable hour, we got home earlier than was the case when Emerson was in charge. I took advantage of the opportunity to have a leisurely bath and to wash my hair. By the time I had concluded this somewhat delicate operation... The colouring had a tendency to run when wet. Emerson and Nefret were on the veranda waiting for tea. Just outside the door, rolling in the dust, were the children, the dog, and my brother-in-law. Come in here at once, I ordered. No, not you, Amira. David, John and Carla, you will have to wash your hands again. Go to Fatima. It's only sand, Sethoff said, dusting off his hands. Not a German a lot. There are plenty of germs on the dog. Oh, very well. He was back almost at once. What took you so long? I asked. What did you find out? Not a great deal. None of the boatmen recalled having taken Lidman across the river. But I went to Luxor anyhow. He didn't go back to the Luxor Hotel or to any of the others, nor has he been seen at the train station. The steamboat offices also denied any knowledge of him. The trouble is... Sethos added, rising to hold the door for Fatima and the tea tray. Lidman isn't a very memorable individual. Medium height, undistinguished features, a tendency toward embonpoint. But that characteristic is shared by most of the male tourists. He may still be on the west bank, but I'll be confounded if I can think where. Fatima looked up at him. Is it Mr. Lidman, the gentleman who was sick of whom you speak? He was here this morning. Here? Yeah, Emerson shouted. When? This morning. Fatima knew from his tone that something was amiss. She began twisting her hands together. He was looking for you. He waited for a while and then went away. Hell and damnation! Emerson jumped to his feet. Have I done something wrong? Fatima asked anxiously. He had been here before. He works for Mr. Vandergelt. It's all right, Fatima, Sethos said. Emerson had disappeared into the house. We all dashed after him, followed by the children, who had reappeared, looking very pink and scrubbed. One look was enough to disclose the ugly truth. The bottom drawer of Emerson's desk had been broken open. The painted box and the statuette were gone. Watch your language, Emerson, I implored. The children. David John shook his head. If you'll forgive me for saying so, Grandpapa, I told you that was not a secure hiding place. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses enjoyed the relative peace and quiet of Luxor, but there was something about Cairo... Not a breath of fresh air, since it was far from fresh, but a sense of bustle and excitement. 
They walked along the river, past the museum. There were plenty of tourists and the usual foreign officials and a number of motor cars. But these intrusive modern elements were submerged by the teeming masses and the cacophonous sounds of the real Cairo. Men in turbans and gullabillas, veiled women, camels moaning, donkeys braying, dogs barking. Would you rather be here than in Luxor? Ramses asked. I'd rather be at home with Leah and the children, but there's something about Cairo. Their progress was slowed by encounters with old acquaintances. Beggars and revolutionaries and policemen, Ramses remarked, after they had detached themselves from one of the latter. Don't we have any respectable friends? Not unless you consider Egyptologists respectable. The Petherics were not known at the Semiramis Hotel. In order to save time, they took a cab back into the centre of town, where most of the other leading hotels were located. They drew a blank at the Savoy, the Hotel d'Angleterre, the Continental and the Eden Palace. Midday came and went. David finally ventured to suggest that they stop and take stock, and perhaps a little nourishment. You can't go on like this all day, Ramses. We've only covered a few of the larger hotels. Are you planning to stop over in Cairo tonight? Ramses ducked under a tray of bread, carried at shoulder height by a baker making a delivery. I plan to keep looking until we find them, but if you're hungry, I'm ravenous, so should you be. Shepherds, then. It was one place where they could always be sure of getting a table. Emerson had, from the earliest days, made a profound impression, and the whole family profited by the terror in which he was held by the management. David set a deliberately leisurely pace as they skirted the Esbekia Gardens. It was his way of telling Ramses to slow down. Ramses knew he was right. Unless they were lucky, their search was going to take some time. David didn't share his sense of urgency. He would have had a hard time explaining it without referring to premonitions or to the working of the unconscious mind, neither of which David really believed in. We may be in Cairo for a few days, he said. Do you want to look up any of your political acquaintances? Getting involved with politics is the last thing I need. The situation is, as they say, volatile. Once the Declaration of Independence is published, things ought to settle down. David made a rude noise. The contents of that precious document have already been leaked. It isn't independence if Britain reserves the right to protect her own interests. Nice ambiguous phrase, isn't it? And leaves the question of the Sudan unsettled. Sorry I brought it up. David lowered his voice to its normal pitch. Sorry I got so worked up. You know how I feel. But I promised Leah I'd stay out of politics, and Lord knows we've enough to worry about without that. They got not only a table on the terrace, but a room for the night. According to the desk clerk, there was no reservation in the name of Petherick. We've been booked solid for months. It is only because of our long acquaintance with your family that we are able to accommodate you. Um, you will mention that favour to Professor Emerson? Their table was one of the best, near the balustrade, with a good view of the gardens and the busy street below. After they'd ordered and enjoyed some general gossip with the waiters, Ramses scanned the other diners. The usual lot, David said. Tourists and local gentry. You aren't hoping to run across the Petherics, are you? One never knows. Damn, there's Sylvia Bennett, the worst gossip in Cairo. I refuse to have her prying into our affairs. Pretend you don't see her. It would take more than that to put Sylvia off. He ignored her coy, beckoning finger, but as he had predicted, she came to them. Sylvia always kept up with the latest fashions. Her hair was bobbed, her lips brightly painted, her skirts short. She doesn't have the legs for it, Ramses thought uncharitably, as he rose to greet her. After the usual gushing queries about Nefret and the other members of the family, there's just sweet, adorable little children, Sylvia plunged into the subject that really interested her. She wanted to know all about the Petherics, the Countess Magda, the Black Afrit, and the Statuette. Ramses fended the questions off as best he could. He was damned if he would give Sylvia the satisfaction of being better informed than her equally inquisitive friends. We're here on business, he said. Nothing to do with the death of Mrs. Petherick. It's in the hands of the police. I'm afraid that's all I can tell you, Sylvia. Give my regards to your husband. Pouting, Sylvia took herself off. 
she had acknowledged David with the barest of nods. What a dreadful woman, David said, resuming his seat. At least she doesn't seem to have heard of the Petherics leaving Luxor. I didn't realize she had met them while they were in Cairo. Sylvia knows everyone, except natives like me, David said. Ramses called Sylvia a rude name. David laughed. The opinions of people like that don't worry me, Ramses. Let's go before we're accosted by another dear old friend intent on gossip. You won't be able to avoid all of them, David predicted. By evening, everyone in Cairo will know we're here. The Bristol, the National, the Metropole, hotel after hotel denied any knowledge of Harriet and Adrian Petherick. It's unaccountable, Ramses muttered. We've covered most of the first and second class hotels. I can't believe Harriet would settle for anything less. We've missed something, but I can't think what. What if they've changed their appearances? David asked. Then we're sunk, since we've no idea how they may have disguised themselves. All we can do is proceed on the assumption that they look the same. So, we stay over tonight? Yes, damn it. Let's clean up, and then have dinner at Bassam's and the Khan. He knows everything that goes on in Cairo. They paused on the corner of the Shari Qasr el Aini and the Shari el Munira, waiting for a chance to cross the former. The traffic was horrendous. Nobody yielded the right of way to carriages or carts or pedestrians. People pushed and shoved along the pavement and into the street. It was a wonder there weren't more accidents, Ramses thought, as a camel lumbered past, cutting off a cab whose driver shrieked curses at the camel and its rider. A motor car, driven at reckless speed, wove in and out among the slower vehicles. It was almost even with them, when a hard shove sent Ramses staggering forward. The driver couldn't have stopped if he had wanted to. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Fatima would not be consoled. It is my fault. I should not have left him alone. I should have watched him. Sephos offered her an impeccable handkerchief. If it's anyone's fault, Fatima, it is mine. I didn't think to warn you. None of us thought to warn you, I added my words of consolation. In fact, to do all of us justice, there was no reason why we should have done. Yes, there was, Emerson muttered. Here now, Fatima, nobody blames you. Please don't cry. You've set the twins off, too. You do not blame me, father of curses. <laughs> she mopped her wet face and gave him an appealing look. Good gad, no. David John, Carla, I am not angry with Fatima. Do you hear me? They were clinging to her skirts and sobbing in sympathy. The noise level was quite high. That will be quite enough from you, too, I said. Have a biscuit. Their infantile distress reminded Fatima of the need to recover herself. She gave a final swipe to her face and used the handkerchief to wipe their faces and noses. It is all right, do you see? I am not unhappy. The father of Curses is not angry. Come, have a biscuit. Have two. He's had five hours or more to make his getaway, I said. At what time did you interrogate the boatman? Sethos knew what I was getting at. I left instructions, along with promises of extravagant bakshish, that they were to report immediately if he turned up. We can't just sit here and let the bastard get away with it. Emerson groaned. She trusted me to take care of the bloody thing. I'm going back to the landing. Language, my dear, language, I said, gently, touched by his self-reproach. Waste of time, said Sethos, holding out his cup. I suggest we consult Selim and notify the police. The police? Emerson's eyes widened in surprise. I didn't think of that. You never do, said his brother. If Lidman is still in Luxor, East or West Bank, we'll catch up with him eventually. But we will be in trouble if he succeeds in getting out of town. We need guards at the railroad station. Dependable guards. I wouldn't trust any of Aid's fellows, I said. Not that I doubt their loyalty, but none of them know Lidman. They can't ask for identification from every passenger. That would take too long. And some pompous idiot would be bound to register a complaint. 
Obviously, I am the right man for the job, Sethos said, with a martyred sigh. Then what do we need the police for? Emerson demanded. Because, said Sethos, slowly and patiently, I do not have the authority to detain Lidman. I can identify him, but only the police can hold him for questioning. Hmm, <laughs> said Emerson. He shifted uneasily in his chair. Um, do we have to tell them he's stolen a statuette worth a hundred thousand pounds? Good God, if that news gets out, he'll have a pack of vigilantes on his trail, baying for his blood. You are mixing your metaphors, Emerson, I said. They won't be after his blood, they will be after the statue, and not for the purpose of restoring it to its proper owner. However, I doubt they would be averse to spilling his blood if they had to. Supposing he is innocent after all, he could come to serious harm. He is guilty as Cain, Emerson growled, and personally I wouldn't care if he were torn limb from limb, so long as I were the one doing it. He didn't really mean it. Emerson is the mildest of men, unless provoked. Though I must admit, it is not difficult to provoke him. His honour and his pride had been sorely damaged, and he held himself personally responsible for the loss. A hundred thousand pounds would make quite a dent in our investments. I have it, I cried. We will accuse Mr Lidman of making off with some of Ramsay's bits of papyrus. The police know we care about such things, but no one else does. Well done, Peabody, said Emerson. Do you think Aid will take that loss seriously enough to stay on the hunt? My dear, I said, returning his smile, I feel certain that if he is not inclined to do so, you can convince him. Let's go then, Emerson said. You and I, a eh, Peabody? And I, said Sethos. Nefret wanted to come too, but I persuaded her to stay with the children, who had set up an outcry at the prospect of losing both grandparents and a particularly entertaining guest. Console yourself with one cheering thought, my dear, I told her. If Lidman is our villain, which seems more than likely, Adrian Petherick is innocent. Ramses and David are in no danger. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Another pair of trousers ruined, Ramsay said, inspecting the stained, ripped knees of that article of clothing. They can be mended. David's face was pale and his voice unsteady. I'll tell Aunt Amelia it was my fault. It was your fault I didn't fall flat on the road under the motor car. He got to his feet. The onlookers who had gathered to offer assistance advice dispersed. It was a common enough occurrence, and one that often ended more dramatically. Somebody shoved me, Ramsay said. I thought so. You aren't that clumsy. You didn't see who it was. I was too busy trying to stay on my feet. And you? I was too busy trying to keep you from falling forward. People were jostling one another. It might have been an accident. Ramses brushed grit and scraps of cabbage leaves off his palms. He had landed on hands and knees after David swung him back onto the pavement. Another accident? David raised his eyebrows. It looks as if you were right about Adrian Petherick, and I was wrong. We know he's in Cairo. We don't, not for certain. How many people are there in the city who have it in for you? Quite a few, I should think. You did cut rather a wide swath during the war, David admitted. So did you. That was a long time ago. Most of them have got over their grudges by now. No, my brother, it looks more and more like Adrian. Ramsay's disheveled appearance raised a few eyebrows as they crossed Shepherd's Terrace. And one stylishly dressed woman was heard to say, I'm surprised they allow riffraff like that in the hotel. And isn't the other man... When they asked for their keys, the clerk handed them several messages. Ramses looked through them as the lift took them up to the second floor. Fancy that, he said. This is from Monsieur Lacour, summoning us rather peremptorily to his office tomorrow morning. I hope he hasn't changed his mind about allowing father in the valley. The professor will ignore him anyhow, 
David said with a grin. Who's that one from? Sylvia, the woman who couldn't take a hint if you hit her over the head with it. And this one is from Annabelle, Sylvia's chief rival in the gossip game. He crumpled the letters and shoved them in his pocket. One of your former lady friends, wasn't she? David asked. Good God, no. I spent hours hiding behind various objects in order to avoid her. The suffragi on duty in the corridor hissed in surprise at the sight of Ramses. What happened to you, brother of demons? I fell. Ramses inserted his key in the door. Was anyone looking for me while I was out, Ahmed? No, brother of demons. Shall I take your clothes to be cleaned and mended? A look in the shaving mirror told Ramses the man's concern and the criticism of the people on the terrace had been justified. There was a rip at the shoulder of his coat, where the sleeve had been pulled loose by David's desperate grip. And since he'd been in too much of a hurry to shave that morning, his beard darkened his cheeks. He took the letters from his pocket and realized there was one he hadn't read. Carter, he said, after perusing it, you were right. Our presence is known. Here, hand these clothes out the door to Ahmed, will you? A quick bath and a shave, and the only other suit he had brought with him restored him to respectability. When David was ready, they walked down the stairs between the statues of the voluptuous Nubian maidens that were among the famed sights of shepherds. The maidens had been photographed, fondled, and even carried off by visitors. What did Carter have to say? David asked. Wants to see us any time. Didn't say why. He must want to see you very badly, David said. Sitting in the lobby, a cigarette in his mouth and his nose in a book, was Howard Carter. They told me you'd come in a short time ago, he explained, after shaking hands with both of them. I didn't want to intrude. Ramses had known Carter since his early days, when he was working as an artist and draftsman, and later, when he was appointed inspector for Upper Egypt and later than that, after he had lost the post and had been reduced to dealing in antiquities and selling his paintings to tourists. Now that Lord Carnarvon was his patron, he looked more prosperous. His face was fuller and his moustache less exuberant. There were new lines around his mouth, though. Carnarvon was said to be a generous employer and amiable man, but having one's livelihood depend on the whim of a dilettante must not be conducive to peace of mind. Carter had no private means and not much formal education. Many of his peers considered him brash and ill-mannered. Emerson despised him for continuing to deal in antiquities. But Ramses couldn't blame the man for hanging on to a sure source of income. We're on our way to the Khan and Bassams, he explained. Care to join us? Fred, I can't this evening. I have an engagement with Lord and Lady Dinwhistle. I've time for a drink or two, if that would suit you. They made their way to the long bar. Since the war, the rules about admitting women had been relaxed. Nefret had been one of the first to ignore them, and the tables were all taken. They found a relatively quiet corner where they could stand and talk. Ramses waited for Carter to start the conversation. He thought he knew where it would end. We've been hearing some tall tales about you people, Carter began. Murder, robbery, assault. Same old thing. David said. Carter gave a bark of laughter. Quite, quite. Any discoveries in KV-55? Not so far. We didn't expect anything, really. It was good of you to allow us to excavate the place. Carter inserted a cigarette into an ornate holder. I couldn't refuse Professor Emerson such a small favour. I owe him too much. Good to me. Very, your parents, in past years. Not that I was really worried about illegal excavations in the valley, he added. In other words, Ramses thought to himself, your father can get away with more than most people so long as he doesn't push me too far. The young man, who had been so humbly grateful for encouragement and support from those he considered his social superiors, had gained confidence. And he was after something, a return favour. It didn't take him long to get round to it. So, what about the famous statue, he asked. The professor wired me, asking if I knew anything about it. I had to tell him I didn't. 
And you would have known if it had been on the market before last year? Ramses kept his voice neutral. He wasn't criticising, he was only asking for information. Obviously I didn't, Carter said, somewhat defensively. I um, assist many of the major museums, you know, in addition to private collectors like Lord Carnarvon. If I'd known of anything so remarkable, I'd have uh, entered into negotiations. Such negotiations are often conducted in secret, though, Ramsay said. That's the devil of it, Carter said, finishing his whiskey and beckoning the waiter. I believe I may claim I am noted for my discretion, but another bark of laughter. So are many of my competitors. Describe it for me, will you? The newspaper accounts can't be trusted. Ramses glanced at David, who shrugged. There was no reason why they shouldn't be candid with Carter, since so many other people had seen the object. He described the statuette in detail and watched Carter's eyes take on a hard glitter. It's absolutely unique, Ramses finished, and in superb condition. I suppose you've already had offers for it, Carter said, trying to sound casual. I know Cyrus Vandergilt is a friend of yours. It isn't ours to dispose of, Ramsay said. I thought uh, Mrs. Petherick had given it to Father. He wouldn't accept a gift so valuable, even if he had the right to do so. We don't know who the legal owner is, now that Mrs. Petherick is dead. I see. Uh, you're sure, but you couldn't be mistaken about its authenticity. You'd be willing to testify to that? Father would probably give his expert opinion, if he were asked. I see, Carter repeated. Well, I must go now. Don't want to keep his lordship waiting. I expect I'll be seeing you all shortly, and the statue. When are you coming to Luxor? David asked. Oh, Carter gestured with his cigarette holder. Shortly, another week or so, I expect. Give my regards to the family. He'll be busy for another week, negotiating with dealers, David said after Carter had gone. Would you care to wager a small sum that Lord Dinwhistle is not in the market for unique antiquities? Not tuppence. No one can blame Carter. You never blame anyone for anything short of mayhem. I wonder if the professor realizes that he got permission to work in the valley because Carter thinks it will soften him up. He wants the statuette for Carnarvon. Ramses called the waiter and paid for their whiskies. Father is even more duplicitous than Carter. He'll take full advantage and admit to no obligation. The sun was setting in a dusty haze. Across the way, the lights of the Esbekia twinkled in the twilight. Why don't we dine here, or at the Savoy? David suggested. Because the food isn't as good as Bassam's, and I am not going to behave like a timid tourist. No, he said, as David raised his hand to hail a cab. We'll walk. Down the dark streets and narrow alleyways. You're hoping he'll try again, aren't you? If he does, we'll be ready for him. We haven't had much luck tracing him. It wasn't the first time they had strolled the byways of the old city, keeping a wary eye out for attack. The ambience was certainly conducive to justifiable paranoia. There were few lights, and the balconies of the tall houses overhung the streets, casting shadows even in the daytime. Ah, the fond memories, David said, as they crossed a small plaza with a central fountain. Isn't this where you ended up after you escaped from the lady dressed like Hathor? No, that's farther on. This is where Mother whacked Selim over the head when she mistook him for a spy. Bassam had heard they were in Cairo and was expecting them. But where else would you dine? he demanded. I have prepared for you bami and lamb cooked with spices and fresh cucumbers and tomatoes in oil. So I see, said David, glancing at Bassam's apron. Bassam had grown stout on his own cooking, but he was still capable of throwing a rowdy patron out the door. He joined them for coffee and asked what brought them to Cairo. Has the black Afrid come here? You know about that too, do you? Ramses said. Yes, to be sure. It seems, said Bassam, that the father of curses did not cast it off after all. Emerson's reputation was obviously in jeopardy. Suppressing a smile, Ramsay said, 
That was only a um, preliminary attempt. Sometimes, with a spirit so powerful, even the father of curses has to try more than once. Hmm. Bassam scratched his beard. That is so. He will perform another ceremony, then. Ramses let that statement stand. He didn't bother to ask about the Petherics. This was not the sort of place they would visit. The talk soon turned to politics. Bassam knew they were in sympathy with the cause of independence, so he spoke freely and passionately. His comments gave Ramses a new insight into the situation. If Bassam, a peaceable man and a successful merchant, felt so strongly about the subject, the mobs of Cairo could easily be incited to violence. There would be unrest in Egypt for years to come. By the time they left the restaurant, the street outside was deserted, except for a slow-moving donkey and its rider. Ramsay stopped long enough to inform the fellow, in his most courtly Arabic, that beating a tired beast violated the laws of the Prophet, and that he was about to discover whether beating a driver made him move faster. "'I did not see you, brother of demons!' The driver faltered. I hear and obey. Beyond the lights from the restaurant, the familiar street, hardly wider than a path, was dark as pitch. David fell back a step or two. The attack did not come from behind. Ramses was the first to hear the sound. Not the regular pad of bare feet, but a faint, surreptitious rustle, as of cloth rubbing against a harder surface. He broke into a run. The shot whistled past his side, and David cried out. Cursing, Ramses whirled round, ran full tilt into David, and caught hold of his sagging body. Where are you hit? Not hit. My damned leg gave way when I started to run. Don't worry about me. Go after him. Be careful. Ramses followed his advice, staying close to the walls on his right. The pursuit was almost certainly futile. He had caught a glimpse of a dark figure disappearing around a sharp curve in the street before he turned back. No hero, that one. Ramsay's rapid advance had caught him by surprise and spoiled his aim. And if he hadn't run away, he might have picked both of them off with a second and third shot. He could hear David hobbling behind him and quickened his pace. Rounding the curve, he saw ahead the lights of the Place de Babelouk, the plaza was deserted except for two cabs hoping for passengers. No fleeing fugitive, no lurking shadows. He waited for David to catch him up, keeping an eye on the arcade across the plaza for signs of movement. No sign of him, he said. He did not inquire about David's leg. The grisly wound David had received during the war would slow him for the rest of his life, but he didn't acknowledge weakness or appreciate solicitude. He's not very gung-ho. David said. If he'd gone on shooting, he stood a good chance of hitting one of us. Well, I was coming at him at a good pace, Ramsay said fairly. If he had waited to fire again, and missed again, I might have caught him. Did you get a look at him? I'll give you three guesses what I saw. A shadowy figure robed in black, David recited in a sing-song voice. That disguise is rather wasted on us. But it's totally concealing and easily obtained. Almost half the women in this country still wear the tob or the habara. One of the cab drivers looked hopefully in their direction. Ramses waved to him and looked the other way while David climbed in. The carriage was an open Victoria, and the horse was setting a good pace. Ramses leaned back with a sigh. Another missed opportunity. We learned one thing, David said. He has a gun. Must you always look on the bright side? I took Adrian's away from him, you know. He could easily get another. If one looks respectable and has the money, shopkeepers don't ask for identification. Not even a visiting card. Visiting card? Oh, good God! He smacked his forehead with the flat of his hand. Don't hit yourself on the head. It damages the brain. David recited one of his mother's admonitions. I've done it too often, I guess. Why didn't I think of that before? Think of what? David asked, patiently. The cab circled the Esbekir and pulled up in front of Shepherds. It was still early. The terrace was filled, and flower and souvenir sellers milled round at the foot of the stairs, vying with one another to see who could yell loudest. They wouldn't have to register under their own names, 
Ramsay said. They wouldn't need passports, not the lordly English. David was silent for a moment while this sank in. Oh, hell, does that mean we have to start all over again? You don't know what they look like, or what name they might have used. I think I do, though. Ramses tossed the driver a coin and jumped out of the cab. David was slow to follow. He was still favouring his bad leg. Ramses said, We'll wait till morning. I'm too tired to go on tonight. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Sethos went across to Luxor with us and then announced his intention of returning to the railroad station instead of accompanying us to the Zabtiye. There's been only one train since midday, and it's a local with no first-class carriages, he explained. He'd have stood out like a sore thumb if he had caught that one. I'll wait for the evening trains. You'll miss dinner, I said. Sethos made a face. I'll have time for a bite at the station hotel. A single bite is about all I'll be able to stomach. But my beloved Fatima will leave something in the larder for me. Good luck. Inspector Aid was not at the Zabtiye. He had gone home for dinner, his assistant informed us. Goodness knows he had every right to do so. But I shared Emerson's sense of urgency, which led him to swear and ask for Aid's address. Torn between his orders from his superior and the looming presence of Emerson, the assistant did not hesitate long. I am not supposed to do that, father of Cursus, but I know he will not object if it is you who ask. The inspector had a flat in a new group of buildings behind Luxor Temple. The door was answered by an elderly lady wearing black, who screeched and retreated at the sight of Emerson. What did I do? Emerson demanded, in a hurt voice. I was just about to address her respectfully. Your mere presence is enough to frighten the timid, my dear, I replied. Ah, Inspector Aid, our profound apologies for disturbing you and the lady. Your mother? Yes, I assure you we would not have intruded had not the matter been urgent. Please go on with your dinner. I was not eating, said Aid, as courtesy demanded. Come in. The small sitting room was neat enough to meet even Fatima's standards and comfortably furnished with a mixture of European and Egyptian furniture. At Aid's insistence, we seated ourselves in a pair of matching armchairs, upholstered in purple plush, and accepted his offer of tea. It would have been rude not to do so, even ruder than our uninvited visit. Aid's mother had got over the first shock of Emerson and kept peeping round the door at him. We will not keep you long, I promised, and launched into the reason for our visit. Papyrus, Aid's eyebrows lifted. You want me to arrest a man who stole scraps of papyrus? They are valuable antiquities, Emerson began. Um, that is, uh, oh, what the devil? We may as well tell him the truth, eh, Peabody? It was a clever move on Emerson's part, I must say. Aid was clearly flattered at being taken into our confidence, and he was in complete agreement with our reasons for not wishing the truth to be more widely known. The temptation would be too great, even for some of my own men, he admitted. For most men, said Emerson, who was really in top form that evening. So, you will give the necessary orders? Yes, he is to be held for questioning at your request, Professor. Emerson grinned. That's right. Why should you take the responsibility? I had remembered another responsibility. The one we owed Cyrus, who was almost as deeply involved in the business as we. Rather than keep Nefret waiting for news, or irritating the cook, we went straight back to the house and sent Jamad off to the castle with a message inviting the Vandergelds to an after-dinner conference. We were just finishing the meal when they all turned up. What has happened? Catherine demanded. Your message only said the matter was urgent. Has someone been hurt? I reassured her on that point and suggested we retire to the parlour for coffee. 
I thought it best not to go into detail in a letter, I explained, but the situation is serious enough. Mr. Lidman came here this morning, and after he left, without seeing us, we discovered that the statue was gone. And you're just getting round to telling us now? Bertie cried. Good Lord, this is terrible. What can we do? In my usual, well-organized fashion, I described the steps we had taken. Well, I guess you've been busy, Cyrus admitted. It's terrible news, all right. But see here, folks, the son of a... The fellow can't get away with this, so long as he doesn't leave town. And it sounds as if you've got that covered. We'll catch up with him sooner or later. You put Selim and Dawood on the job, and with their contacts, they'll track him down. You just let us know what you want us to do. Sethos did not return to the house until after midnight. Aid himself had been on hand at the train station. Lidman had not. Where the devil could he have got to? Emerson demanded, between bites of egg and bacon. Dawood sniffed appreciatively at the latter comestible, but of course did not eat any of it. He and Selim had come by to report and to enjoy Fatima's cooking, which included a variety of other dishes besides the forbidden bacon. It is a mystery, said Dawood. You are sure he hasn't been seen on the West Bank? I inquired of Selim. Not yet, said Akim, but before long he will need food and water and shelter. The villages here are small, not like Luxor. He cannot approach any of them without being noticed. Perhaps the father of curses should use his magical powers to find the man, Dowd suggested. Emerson, who was still smarting over the failure of his exorcism, looked suspiciously at Dowd and then concluded correctly that his large friend had not meant to be sarcastic. The devil with magical powers, said Emerson, jumping up. I'm going to look for him. Please, Emerson, do not go riding off in all directions, I implored. Wait until I... Make one of your little lists. Peabody, my dear. I have the highest respect for your lists, but... Selim has raised an important consideration, Emerson. How many places on the West Bank are there where a man like Lidman could remain concealed for more than a few hours? Hmm. Emerson sat down again. He could not take shelter with one of the villagers. They would turn him in. To us, if not to the police. He wouldn't take the chance, I said. Not when he has the... Ouch! I beg your pardon, Peabody, said Emerson, giving me a terrible look. My foot slipped. The statue, you mean, said Selim. Fatima refilled his cup. He thanked her. And I said, rubbing my shin, Fatima, did you... No, sit, Selim said. Fatima said nothing. I deduced it myself. A valuable object and a missing man whom you want to find. It is, as Ramses would say, too much of a coincidence. He was so proud of himself, I hadn't the heart to deny the truth. We were naive to suppose that the connection would not be made, I admitted. "'though not everyone is as clever a detective as you, Selim. "'To return to the previous subject, "'can we assume Lidman would not openly approach any of the villagers? "'Yes, he would be just as noticeable "'if he took a room at one of the West Bank hotels. "'So that leaves only a hiding place in the cliffs of the High Plateau. "'There are dozens of empty tomb shafts and caves there.' A somewhat sweeping generalization, Peabody, said Emerson, rubbing his chin. But I think you are on the right track. Up he got again. It is an extensive area, I pointed out. Why not leave the search to Selim and our other fellows? I can't sit still and do nothing, Emerson said forcibly. Wait, said Selim, the detective, raising a finger just as Sherlock Holmes might have done. I have thought of something. It would help if we had a photograph of the man. That's a very good thought, Selim, Nefret said. I can't recall seeing a likeness of him in any of the films we've printed so far, but a number of the plates we took in the West Valley haven't yet been developed. It was agreed that she and Selim should get at the job immediately, while the rest of us started the search. 
It was, in my opinion, a comparatively futile enterprise, but my dear Emerson was too perturbed to sit still. Obviously, I couldn't let him go dashing off without me to protect him. I made sure I had all my accoutrements, including my parasol and my little pistol. We were about to leave when Cyrus, Jumana, and Bertie rode up. Where are you off to? Cyrus asked. Not planning to work today, are you? No, said Emerson. Me neither, Cyrus admitted. We were talking last night after we left you folks, and Jumana came up with a real bright idea. Where could this fella go, she asked, that he wouldn't be spotted right away? Assuming he stayed on this side of the river, that is. We asked ourselves the same question, I said. I presume you reached the same conclusion, that he is likely to have found a hiding place in the cliffs. We were about to begin searching there. It's a large stretch of territory, Cyrus said. Suppose we take one section and you another. What about Selim and Daoud and, uh... Antony, I said. I couldn't blame Cyrus for forgetting the name. Sethos had so many of them. He's gone back to the railway station. We sent Daoud to Guna. His web of informants are on the lookout and will report to him if they discover anything. Selim is helping the Fret develop some photographs in the hope that they may contain an image of Mr. Lidman. It sure would help to have a picture of him, Cyrus agreed. So, how shall we go about this? We need a plan. I had, of course, already given some thought to this. It was agreed that Emerson and I would begin at Deir el-Bahri and work our way south toward Deir el-Medina, while the other three covered the area of the Asasif and the long stretch of cliffs at Dra Abul Naga that ended at the road to the Valley of the Kings. Ours was the longest and most difficult path, but we were the more experienced. I had observed Jumana's disappointment when I anticipated her deductions, so as we rode side by side toward Deir el-Bahri, I took the opportunity for a cheering chat. I am counting on you, Jumana, to guide the others. You know the area better than they. Yes, Sitakim, her face lit up. You can count on me. I will miss nothing. I had a word with Bertie, too. Don't allow her to bully you, Bertie. Disagree with her. Sneer, if you like. Oh, no, Mum. I, I couldn't do that. She's so much more intelligent than I am. Ah, oh, well, I thought. I've done my best. Some persons can't be helped. As usual, the road to Deir el-Bahri was encumbered with carriages and donkeys, carrying tourists to that popular site. Emerson and I left our horses with Jamad, who had accompanied us and who was to ride with them to Deir el-Medina, where we would eventually meet him. We were further delayed by the Metropolitan Museum people, who were working at the 11th Dynasty Temple, south of Hatshepsut's monument, and who wanted us to stop and chat. Their men had informed them of Lidman's flight. We heard he stole some of the papyri from Deir el Medina, Mr. Winlock remarked. The men don't believe that story, you know. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. I laughed merrily. Naturally, they wouldn't. You, however, know that those scraps are valuable to the scholarly world. Sure, Winlock said. We'll keep an eye out for the fellow. Funny his taking something like that said George Barton. I mean, the guy isn't a philologist, is he? One never knows what strange quirks may affect the human brain, I explained. Well, gentlemen, we must be off. I hope to see you all again soon. I wouldn't want to miss another exorcism, Winlock said with a smile. Hmm, said Emerson. Come along, Peabody. We've wasted enough time. The distance between Deir el-Bahri and the workman's village is only a mile as the crow flies. On foot, over rough terrain, it seemed more like twenty. We followed the line of the cliffs, scrambling over heaps of fallen stone and exploring the innumerable small wadis that pierced the rocky ramparts. As we went on, under a baking sun, the futility of our search became more apparent, to me at any rate. We could not 
possibly penetrate into every crevice and hole. All we could hope for was a sign that someone had recently passed that way. There was ample evidence of human and animal presence, from scraps of cloth to gnawed bones, but nothing one could specifically connect with a fleeing German. By the time we reached Dera and Medina, I was hot, dusty and thirsty, and Emerson was out of sorts. The sight of Jamad, patiently waiting with the horses and the water bottles, was as welcome as a green oasis in the desert. Emerson was all for mounting and riding back immediately, but by feigning exhaustion, which was not entirely feigned, I made him agree to rest and refresh himself, while I did the same. After a single sip of water, he was on his feet again, prowling round the ruins of the ancient temples. The anonymous digger has not been back, he reported. And no sign of Mr. Lidman, I added. Do sit down, Emerson. I doubt he would have come this far. I had informed Nefret and Selim of the change in our strategy. Or is it tactics? We were all to meet at the castle, so Emerson and I went directly there. I apologised to Catherine for our untidiness. She was gracious enough to reply that the search for Lidman took precedence and showed me to one of the guest chambers where I was able to freshen up before we enjoyed a late luncheon. Cyrus's group had had no more luck than we. Germana was unusually silent. She was taking her failure too much to heart, which I pointed out to her. "'You cannot find something that isn't there, Germana. "'I am beginning to believe that Mr. Lidman managed to cross the river without being observed. "'It is much easier to hide among hordes of people than in a wilderness.' "'At least we now have a photograph,' Catherine said, trying to look on the bright side. "'Not a very good one,' Nefret murmured. "'It shows him in profile, with his hat shading his face. "'But it was the best we could come up with.' "'Surely!' That is another suspicious thing, Selim said, that he would avoid having his picture taken. You mean he's been planning this ever since he came to work for me? Cyrus demanded. Maybe so, Selim, but we were photographing the tomb, not people. So, what do we do now? I was unable to repress a sigh. Emerson focused on me for the first time in an hour and frowned. "'Tired are you, my dear? I'm afraid I wore you out this morning.' "'Not at all,' I said briskly. "'But I confess I am at a loss as to how to proceed. "'Perhaps we should wait to hear from Daud and Seth Antony. "'Tomorrow may bring fresh inspiration.' "'I declined Catherine's invitation to return to dine, "'for, to be truthful, I was a trifle weary.' After promising we would inform them immediately of any new information, we returned to the house, and I managed time for a nice long soak in my tin bath before facing tea with the children. The little dears were even more boisterous than usual, sensing, as children do, the distraction of their elders. Even the advent of Sethos, looking as disgruntled as Emerson, did not keep Carla from demanding when Papa and Uncle David would come home. "'No messages as yet,' I reported after sorting through the post-basket. "'I had rather hoped to hear something from them by now. "'I would settle for hearing anything from anybody,' said my brother-in-law. "'We seem to have drawn a blank everywhere. "'I went the runs of the Luxor hotels again, between trains. "'Not a sign of him.' "'Something is sure to turn up,' I replied, repressing a yawn. You can try again tomorrow, now that we have a photograph. What a wonderful thought. I know every knothole and every splinter in that station platform, and every desk clerk in Luxor. However, troubles never come singly, as the saying goes. Bertie arrived next morning before breakfast, on a horse he had ridden hard. Jumana was gone. 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 Chapter 9. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. 
The desk clerk at the manor house remembered the lady very well. Magda von Ormond, yes, she is a very forceful lady. We had no rooms available, but she uh, prevailed upon me to make an exception. Ramses wondered how much it had cost Harriet in Bakshish, and how much money she had, and where she had got it, not from her father, if her description of him had been accurate. She and the gentleman have been here for several days, the clerk went on. Her um, secretary, she said he was. He rolled his eyes and smirked. Either he didn't read the newspapers, or he hadn't connected the murdered Mrs. Petherick with her nom de plume. Are they in their rooms? Ramses asked. They went out early this morning for a ride around the pyramids. It is a favourite ride, as you know, out into the desert to the point from which one can see all nine of the... Yes, I know. Who went with them? The answer was reassuring. Ahmed Ali was one of the most reliable and persistent dragomen at Giza. They wouldn't have been able to elude him even if they had wanted to. Shall we hire horses and go after them? David asked as they turned away from the desk. Ramses thought for a moment and then shook his head. Nefred said we must avoid doing anything that might agitate him. If he spots us heading directly for them, he may interpret it as a threat. They'll be back for luncheon. We will casually encounter them in the dining salon. Oh, we get to eat? David inquired with a grin. Things are looking up. It wasn't difficult to pass the time at Giza, where they had once excavated. They spent the morning wandering round the cemeteries of private tombs and examining the six minor pyramids. The three large pyramids were the chief attraction for tourists, and the interior passageways were usually too crowded for comfort. Reisner's crew isn't working, David said, as they approached the site where the Boston Museum, Harvard University crew were excavating. Ramses consulted his watch. Stop for lunch, I expect. We'd best go back to the hotel. Perhaps Father's prestige can get us a table. Fame had its penalties as well as its privileges. They were intercepted by the desk clerk, who proudly announced that he had told Madame von Ormond and her uh, secretary, a member of the distinguished Emerson family, was looking for them. Ramses and David stared at each other in consternation. I suppose they've got out again, the former said trying to keep his voice down. But surely they will return soon. They have not lunched, nor even changed their clothing. A well-manicured brown hand lifted. Ramses handed over the expected bakshish. It wasn't the clerk's fault. He hadn't been told to keep their arrival secret. God damn it, said David, who seldom used bad language. The fat is well and truly in the fire, Ramses agreed. Let's find Ahmed Ali. There's no hope of a casual encounter now. For years, the normal methods of travel around the Pyramid Plateau had been by camel, donkey, or the so-called desert carriage, a diabolical conveyance that jolted the occupants inside to a jelly. Camels were selected by many tourists. What would a trip to Egypt be without a photograph of the traveller on that picturesque beast? but they weren't the carefully bred riding animals owned by aficionados of the breed. There was an old saying, everyone should ride a camel once. Ahmed Ali had only recently introduced horses. He and his brother ran the operation, which had proved to be highly successful. They found him sitting in the shade of the shed he had erected, fardling with some of the other dragomen, and enjoying his lunch of bread, cheese, and onions. After the Obligatory exchange of courtesies, which took some time, Ramses asked about his friends. Strange people, Ahmed Ali said, shaking his head. As befitted a successful merchant, his turban was very large and very intricately wound. Very strange. No sooner had they returned than they were back again, demanding fresh horses. They wanted to go alone, but I could not permit that, so I sent Ibrahim Mohammed with them. Where did they go? David asked. They said to Abu Rosh. Now, why would they want to go there, where there is nothing to see except El Ka, the most ruinous of all the pyramids hereabout? 
Even if I had not feared for my beautiful horses, I could not have let ignorant foreigners go so far without a guide. They bargained for horses, which Ahmed Ali let go at a price that will ruin me, but only because I trust you to be careful with them. He didn't insult them by offering a guide. He should have asked the Petherics for payment in advance, Ramses said, as they turned their horses' heads north. You don't think they've bolted, do you? David demanded. Where the devil would they go, on horseback and without luggage? Far out into the desert, where a fatal accident could be arranged. Or to the ruined pyramid of Abu Roche, whose superstructure had almost entirely disappeared, but which provided a handy pit and a dangerously steep slope down into the subterranean burial chamber. Few tourists went there, as Ahmed Ali had said. It wasn't much of a pyramid compared to the giants of Giza, and there wasn't even a rest house. Ibrahim Mohammed would have to be disposed of first. A substantial bribe might accomplish that. If it failed, there were other ways. Ramses didn't reply to David. He would have been the first to admit his fears were based on slight evidence, but there was a possible motive. If Adrian had murdered his stepmother, his sister must know he was guilty. She was the only person who could testify against him. Ramses didn't believe she would, but a killer prefers not to take chances, and Adrian had already shown resentment of her care. Their route took them through the desert, along the edge of the cultivated land, and then eastward to the village of Kadassa, attractively situated in groves of palm trees. Up to that point, they couldn't be certain they were on the right track, but Ramses didn't think the Petherics would stray from the path they had announced while the dragoman was with them. In Kadassa, they received the first news of the fugitives. Ibrahim Mohammed had tried to persuade them to stop at the local market, but to the annoyance of the merchants, and presumably that of Ibrahim Mohammed, who received a percentage of all sales, they had pressed on after purchasing only a basket of fruit. They do seem to be heading for Abu Roche, David said, and Ibrahim Mohammed is still with them. All very innocent, Ramsay said, except that it's late in the day to start on a trek like this. And why did they rush off after they learned we were here? Pure panic, David said promptly. By the time we catch them up, they'll have had time to think it over. Half an hour's ride brought them to the village of Abu Roche and another group of disappointed merchants. Their faked antiquities and colourful local handicrafts had been rejected. The travellers had headed west across the desert. Ahead of them, a rocky hillock rose against the sky. The sun was halfway down the west. The light shone straight into their eyes. Ramses shaded his with his hand. There they are, he said, near the foot of the hill. They've stopped. I think they've seen us. Ibrahim Mohammed won't let them take the horses up that slope, David said. It was that simple, Ramses thought. The fool tourists could damn well make the ascent on foot, and the dragoman would be content to remain with the horses. He urged his horse to a gallop. The Petherics were nowhere in sight when they came up to Ibrahim Mohammed, who was squatting on the ground, smoking. They have gone on, he said, in answer to Ramsay's question. Up the path to the top. I saw you coming and told them they should wait for you, but they would not. Are they friends of yours? Yes, Ramsay said. His heart was hammering. It was a steep climb to the top of the rise, where once the king's pyramid had stood, looking out across the fertile valley toward the tombs of his predecessors. Only a few courses of stone remained at the base of a natural mound that had formed the core of the pyramid. The ruins of the mortuary temple and other subsidiary structures littered the ground with obstacles ranging from pebbles to fallen blocks several feet high. Slow down, David panted, vaulting one of the blocks and catching Ramses by the arm. The fellow has a gun. God damn it, Ramses, wait. Nefret warned you not to go charging at him. Right. Ramsay stood still, trying to catch his breath. In the silence he heard voices. They came from the north side of the pyramid mound, where the entrance was located. Harriet's voice, sharpened from contralto to soprano by strong emotion, 
rose over that of her brother. Give it to me, Adrian, please. The sound of scuffling feet and a sharp cry from Harriet propelled Ramses forward. He didn't need David's grasp on his arm to proceed slowly. The wrong move now could precipitate the very thing he feared. Brother and sister were standing on a cleared space in front of the great pit that dropped at a steep angle toward the burial chamber. It gaped wide behind them, more than sixty feet deep. Harriet leaned against a fallen stone, her hand raised to her cheek. Her magnificent hair had been cut short and was now a dreadful shade of mahogany streaked with orange. Henna, hastily and inexpertly applied. It altered her appearance dramatically. Adrian was several feet away, square in front of the shaft. He held a rifle, which was pointed at Ramsay's. Don't come any closer, he said coolly. Whatever you say, Ramsay stopped. Why don't you put that down and we'll talk? There's nothing to talk about. This is the end. It needn't be, Ramsay said quietly. He could feel David beside and a little behind him, taut as a coiled spring. We want to help you, Adrian. That's why we're here. Come with us. To what? A madhouse? Or to the gallows? I killed her. I deserve to be punished. But I'll choose my death, thank you. I wanted Harriet to come with me, but she wouldn't. And then I got to thinking, is she in love with you? The pathetic, childlike curiosity in his voice raised the hairs on Ramsay's neck. Harriet was crying. The tears ran down her face, over the marks of her brother's fingers that reddened her cheeks. She loves you, Ramsay said, praying he had found the right answer. You can't do this to her, Adrian. Not after all she's done for you. She means well, Adrian conceded. But she won't leave me alone. That can get on a fellow's nerves, you know. Adrian swung round toward Harriet, and the rifle swung with him. She held out her hands in appeal. Forgive me, Adrian. From now on we'll do everything your way, I promise. Why are you crying? Adrian asked curiously. I wouldn't hurt you, Harriet. You know that. Ramses never knew what pushed Adrian over the line. His own loud catch of breath... The movement of David's arm hard against him, ready to push him aside, or Harriet stepped forward. The gun went off. Harriet dropped to the ground, her arms covering her head. She hadn't been hit. The bullet had gone high. Adrian let the rifle fall to his side, his eyes wild, and Ramses jumped. He was in no mood to take chances. He hit Adrian hard and low, caught him by the collar, and dropped him onto the ground a safe distance from the open shaft. Harriet flung herself down beside the limp body and lifted her brother's head onto her lap. She raised wet eyes to meet those of Ramsay's. He didn't kill her. I did. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript... H. Not another mysterious disappearance. Emerson raised eyes, fists, and voice to heaven. Not another visit from the damned black afreet. Bertie had obviously dressed in some haste. He wore no hat, his shirt was only half buttoned, and his boots were laced askew. Uh, no, he gasped, breathless with agitation. She's gone to the West Valley. She left a letter. He fished the crumpled paper from his trouser pocket and handed it to me. Jumana's neat formal script set out her reasons for taking action, and I had to admit they made perfect sense. She had concluded that the West Valley was the most likely place for Lidman to have holed up. He knew the area, and he had had plenty of opportunity to squirrel away supplies from the overflowing baskets Cyrus's chef always provided. Her reason for going alone, that she would be better able to creep up on him than a crew of clumsy-footed men, also made sense, to someone who was indifferent to her safety. Cyrus sent me to bring you, Bertie went on. He's gone on ahead. Alone? Emerson shouted. Good gad, he's as defenceless as Jumana. We must go after them at once. 
Now, now, Emerson, be calm, I implored. In my opinion... Uh, excuse me, Mrs. E., Bertie said, but opinions don't enter into this. Most likely Lidman is not there, but we can't take the chance. He scarcely ever interrupted me, or anyone else for that matter. Recognising this as a sign of extreme perturbation, I nodded and said graciously, You are correct, Bertie. I did not mean to suggest that we should refrain from taking action, only that Emerson was already out the door, with Bertie treading on his heels. I had better go with them, I said to Sethos, who was reading Germana's note. And you? Back to the confounded railway station, Sethos handed me the note. We can't risk missing him there, but I think the girl has made a convincing argument. She's a clever little creature, isn't she? Too clever. I only hope it will not be the death of her one day. I paused only long enough to collect my accoutrement, waving aside Fatima's attempts to make me wait while she packed a basket. When I reached the stable, Jamad had finished saddling a horse for Emerson and another of our Arabians for Bertie. I had known it would take Jamad a while. He was not a hasty man. It took a while longer to put saddle and bridle onto my horse. I made them wait for me. They are at least an hour ahead of us, I pointed out. Haste will accomplish nothing. Despite this reasonable remark, Emerson and Bertie soon forged ahead of me. I went on as fast as I dared, but I did not catch them up until I got to the West Valley. There, near the tomb of Amenhotep III, I found my husband and Bertie talking with Cyrus. Not a sign of her, Cyrus reported. I've been up and down the valley, calling her name. Not even her horse, I said, for there were only four of the animals, including mine. She came on foot, Cyrus tugged agitatedly at his goatee. By one of the paths over the hills, maybe. She could have fallen and hurt herself badly. Wouldn't she have answered me if she could? She is as nimble as a goat and knows every foot of the cliffs, I said, trying to reassure myself as well as Cyrus. Accidents can happen, even to the most expert. Let us go about this in a logical fashion. We will proceed slowly along the valley to the tomb of I, where you've been working. The sun had risen, bathing the barren ground in light, except for the shadows below the eastern cliffs. No sign of life rewarded our anxious eyes. No voice responded to Emerson's stentorian calls. When we reached the tomb of I, we dismounted and left the horses. They had all been trained to stand. Either she is out of earshot, or she has chosen not to answer, said Emerson. He was in command of himself and of us, as Emerson always is in cases of emergency. His next order admitted another possibility, one none of us wished to face. Bertie, you and Cyrus go that way. Peabody and I will work along the west face. Stay within hailing distance. It was a slow, painful search, painful in every sense of the word, for anxiety increased the discomfort of heat and rough terrain. We looked into every crevice and down into every gully and hole, fearing to find a crumpled body. She may have given up and returned to the castle, I said. Emerson grunted. There had been four possibilities, not three, and the fourth possibility was, after all, the correct one. A shout from Bertie stopped us in our tracks and sent us hastening back. Though they were not far distant, we did not see them until we were almost upon them owing to the unevenness of the cliff face. They had reached the unfinished tomb we had briefly investigated. Number 25. Cyrus had both arms round his stepson, trying to hold him back. In the mouth of the tomb were two forms. Lidman's pale, unshaven face showed the effects of two days of privation. But he had strength enough to hold Jumana tightly against him. Her hands and feet were tied... Over the folds of the gag, her eyes blazed with frustrated fury. The point of the knife in Lidman's right hand rested against her breast. Stop, he shrieked. Don't come any closer. You heard him, Betty, said Emerson. Stand still and be quiet. That deep, powerful voice never failed in its effect. Bertie stopped struggling and Cyrus relaxed his grip. I'm sorry, the boy gasped. I lost my head. 
Perfectly understandable, said Emerson, in the same calm voice. But not sensible. Let me do the talking. I presume, Mr. Lidman, that you are prepared to negotiate. Lidman nodded. He was breathing hard, and the hand holding the knife trembled. Just take your time, Mr. Lidman, I said soothingly. You don't look at all well. My sympathetic tone calmed him. I ran out of food and water, he muttered. Tired, thirsty. Oh, dear, I said. Would you care for a drink? I held up my canteen invitingly. The gurgle of water drew Lidman's eyes. No, Mrs. Emerson, you won't catch me so easily. All right, so far, Peabody, said Emerson out of the corner of his mouth. May I get a word in now? By all means, my dear, I only meant to assure Mr. Lidman that we mean him no harm. Bertie's murderous expression contradicted that statement, but he remained motionless. Uh, I don't want to hurt anyone either, Lidman faltered. Excellent, Emerson said. We see eye to eye on that. What is it you want? Lidman drew a deep breath and burst into speech. The statue, it is mine by rights. I have hidden it where you will never find it. Let me take it away with me. Give me free passage out of Luxor, and I will release the girl unharmed. Agreed, said Emerson. Now, let her go. Lidman's sunken, shadowed eyes hardened. I am not so far gone as that, Professor. You are a man of your word, but you would lie to save a life. We need to work out the details of our agreement, is it not so? One of you must accompany me to the railway station and go with me to Cairo. Hmm. Emerson rubbed his chin. I see several difficulties in that scheme, Lidman. I could get you past the police at the railway station and onto the train. But you aren't fool enough to suppose you can keep me under control during the entire journey. Even with a knife in my ribs. I'd have you flat on your back before we reached Kena. Good Lord, Professor, Betty cried. Why are you arguing on his side? Look here, I'll go with him. Emerson shot him a look that silenced him. I knew, of course, what Emerson was doing. Lidman's offer had not been serious. We were in the first stage of negotiations. But they could not go on long, not with two impulsive young persons involved. Jumana's eyes were closed, and she leaned against her captor. She was going to do something foolish. I knew it. And if she didn't, Bertie would. Mrs. Emerson will accompany me. Lidman said. No, she won't, said Emerson. Not, he added, with a nod at me, that she isn't perfectly capable of laying you by the heels as effectively as I. But I would never live it down if I allowed my wife to take on such a job. Come, come, Lidman, you can do better than that. All right, Lidman said. All right. It's a statue. It is mine by rights, but I will give it up in exchange for freedom. When Mrs. Emerson has escorted me to Cairo, I will tell her the hiding place. You will never find it otherwise. Even if you captured me and tortured me, I would not speak. Wild horses could not tear the truth from my lips. We haven't any horses of that sort, Emerson said absently. Like the sensible man he was, Cyrus hadn't spoken, though he had tugged at his goatee so persistently that it hung limp and twisted. Now he said, She here, Lidman. What about if I go with you? I'm a harmless old fellow, not nearly so dangerous as Mrs. Emerson. What's more, I'll pay you for the statue. We'll go straight to my bank in Cairo, and I'll hand over fifty thousand pounds. I'll trust you to keep your part of the bargain. I must think, Lidman muttered. You have me confused. 
Go ahead, Cyrus said. I wondered what trick Lidman had up his sleeve. He must know his proposed plan and all its variants were doomed to failure. There were too many of us. He couldn't herd the lot of us onto the train or control the activities of those left behind. Unless he had a confederate? I looked up at the cliffs towering toward the sky and saw only a pair of vultures swinging on the blue air. And what had he meant by that claim, repeated a second time, that the statuette was his by rights? As I pursued these thoughts, I also kept a close eye on the less predictable members of the group, Lidman, Bertie and Jumana. Bertie was poised on the balls of his feet, his hands clenched into fists, his face distorted. Jumana was quiet too quiet. Even as the thought entered my mind, the reckless girl acted. Stiffening, she pulled away from Lidman's grasp and threw herself sideward against his right arm. At the same instant, almost as if they'd been in mental communication, Bertie made such a leap as I have never seen, even from Emerson. He caught Lidman's knife hand and dragged it away from Jumana. As the two struggled for possession of the knife, Jumana fell and rolled a helpless bundle down the stairs into the tomb. Cyrus rushed after her. Emerson pulled Bertie away from his adversary and clamped a hard hand over the boy's wrist, which was spurting blood like a fountain. Lidman looked wildly around and began to climb up the cliff. Emerson reached in his pocket, and to my astonishment, produced a handkerchief. He hardly ever has one. Knotting it tightly round Bertie's arm, he shoved the boy at me. Here, yeah, he said, and began to climb after Lidman. The makeshift tourniquet had stopped the worst of the bleeding. Single-minded and staggering, Bertie made for the opening of the tomb. I considered my choices, selected the most imperative, and took my little pistol from my pocket. Lidman was a good twenty feet above, slipping and stumbling and dislodging stones that bounced off Emerson's bare head. Get back, Emerson, I shouted. I am about to shoot. Emerson looked down. Peabody, don't do that, he exclaimed loudly. Oh, good gad! He ducked, trying to force his body into a crack less than a foot wide. I pulled the trigger. I had aimed at Lidman's leg. Somewhat to my surprise, for the angle was difficult, my aim was true. Lidman screamed and lost his balance. He fell quite heavily, hitting the cliff face at least twice and missing Emerson by a narrow margin before his body came to rest at my feet. So much for the statuette, said Emerson, lowering himself to the ground. Peabody, I told you, he isn't dead. I said. But he might have got away, Emerson, if I hadn't fired. I hit him, you see. Very nice, my dear, said Emerson. He turned the crumpled body over with his foot. Lidman's face was smeared with blood and his shirt was torn to bloody rags, but he was still breathing. Your bullet didn't do as much damage as the form. He's had a rough few days, hasn't he? Leaving Emerson to guard Lidman until we could send a litter, we got the other wounded back to the house. Nefret put several stitches into Bertie's arm, while her assistant, Nasreen, and I tended to Jumana. This family is certainly hard on clothing, I remarked. I fear your shirt and trousers are beyond repair, Jumana. I tossed them into a corner, and since she was now attired only in her undergarments, pulled the curtain that separated that part of the examining room from the outer half, when a fret was working on Bertie. Perched on the edge of the table, with her feet dangling, Jumana pressed her lips tightly together, while I applied antiseptic, and Nasreen smeared Khadija's green ointment lavishly over face and limbs and body. Jumana had a number of nasty bruises, not only from her tumble down the stairs of the tomb, but from her initial encounter with Lidman. Not until we had finished did she speak. I did wrong. If you will not punish me for my stupidity, at least scold me. I think you have been punished enough, I replied. 
You will be stiff and sore for days. Thank God it was no worse. Her wide eyes were fixed on the curtain. There hadn't been a sound from Bertie. It might have been worse, much worse. I only meant to find him if I could. There were footprints, not yours or Bertie's or the professor's, at the entrance to tomb 25. I was going to go back to tell Mr. Vandergelt when he jumped out at me and knocked me down. And, and he was strong, stronger than I thought. I didn't think he would do that. He had seen the advantage of taking a hostage, and he had handled the poor girl ruthlessly. She was wiry and strong, but so small, and Lidman's strength had been that of a desperate man. Betty had overheard. You behaved like a bloody little fool, he shouted. If you suspected Lidman was there, why didn't you tell me and Cyrus? Oh, no, you, you had to prove your superiority. It would serve you right if you'd broken every bone in your body. Jumana stiffened. You didn't think of it, did you? We caught him, didn't we? No thanks to you. The only thing that, that saved you was the fact that Lidman hadn't the least idea how to use a knife. If he'd had it at your throat... Well, he didn't, Jumana yelled. The curtain was yanked aside. Bertie's shirt had been another casualty. Nefret had strapped his arm to his chest and every muscle was rigid with rage. Jumana gasped. Are you... All right? No, I might have bled to death. Damn it, Jumana, if you ever pull another stunt like this... His eyes moved from her swollen, green-streaked face over bare brown shoulders and arms down to her little bare feet. G Good God, are you... She'll be fine. And so will you, I interrupted, before his naturally kindly nature could destroy the effect of that admirable shouting match. Now, go and rest. We need to clear the examining room for Mr. Lidman. Lidman was still unconscious when they carried him in. After a quick examination, Nefret's face lengthened. It doesn't look good, Aunt Amelia. There are internal injuries. I daren't operate under these conditions. His blood pressure is dangerously low. Will he recover consciousness? One never knows, but it isn't likely. Emerson had refused our medical assistance. He had no more bumps and cuts than was usual after a day at work. And, for a wonder, his shirt was relatively intact. I expected he would declare his intention of returning to work somewhere, but instead he hung around, getting in the fret's way and asking after Lidman every few minutes. Leave the man alone, Emerson, I scolded. We'll find the statue. He can't have taken it far. It isn't only that. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. He's guilty of something. No question about it. But of what? If he is a murderer as well as a thief, who shoved him in the river? I countered with another question. Are you ready to commit yourself as to the identity of the killer? Hmm, said Emerson, and took his departure. I had sent one of our fellows across to Luxor to tell Sethos and Inspector Aid that they could abandon their stakeout, as I believe it is called, at the railway station. Both of them arrived shortly thereafter, and I brought them up to date. He cannot be questioned, I informed Aid, who had expressed his intention of doing so. Nefret and I are of the opinion that he will probably pass on without ever regaining consciousness. Can she do nothing to rouse him? Aid demanded. I wondered what he had in mind, smelling salts or a touch of torture. I said firmly, you may rest assured that she will do whatever her physician's oath permits. She is with him now, and I will sit by him tonight. You can count on me, I believe, to conduct a proper interrogation, should that be possible. Believe me, said Sethos, you can count on her. And, he added, with a secretive little smile, on the fret. Aid had to accept that. I promised to inform him at once if there were any change in Lidman's condition. When I relieved Nefret after dinner, 
A single glance was enough to assure me that Lidman's condition had worsened. His breathing was shallow and his face bloodless. Lafrette looked exhausted, her blue eyes sunken. It was mental distress, not physical weariness, that affected her. A doctor hates to lose a patient, even one as despicable and beyond help as Lidman. I sent her off to bed, promising to call her if there was a change. My vigil was twice disturbed, once by Emerson, who took one look at Lidman, swore and went away, and again by Sephos. The latter was disposed to linger. He selected the most comfortable of the armchairs in the guest chamber, whither Lidman had been moved, and sat down. I received several telegrams this afternoon, he said. Would you like me to tell you about them? That depends on what they contain. One was in answer to my inquiries about Heinrich Lidmann. He did work for the Germans at Amana. When the war broke out, he joined up, like a loyal lad, and was declared missing in action in 1917. Then his story was true. In the confusion following the cessation of hostilities, many men were lost sight of, Sethos said, and some records were never corrected. It is irrelevant now, is it? Before I could answer, he went on. The second telegram was from one of my associates in London. Aslanian purchased the statue two years ago in Cairo, from Zahi Gabra. Well done, I said. Another step along the trail. The trail ends there, I'm afraid. Gabra is dead. If he kept records, which is unlikely under the circumstances, they've been lost. And the third telegram? You said there were several. Margaret. She arrived in Cairo this morning and will be coming on to Luxor shortly. How nice. Yes, isn't it? He rose lightly to his feet. I would offer to take your place, but you wouldn't let me, so I will say good night. The night wore on. Sitting by the bed, notebook and pencil in hand, I beguiled the time by thinking over what Sephos had told me and making one of my little lists. It clarified my thoughts wonderfully and kept me from drowsiness. So did the chair, a hard wooden object that did not permit slumping. In the small hours after midnight, the change I had hoped for occurred. It is at that time, according to old folk legendary, that the soul of the dying takes wing. Lidman's eyes opened. He knew me. Are you in pain? I asked softly, for the duty of a Christian woman demanded that I ask that question first. No. The word was so faint I had to bend close to hear it. In that case, perhaps you have something you would like to tell me. Am I dying? Yes. By the mercy of Providence, you've been given an opportunity to cleanse your conscience before you face his judgment. I never meant you harm, Lidman whispered. I never meant harm to anyone. I only wanted what was mine. Tell me, I urged. If you make a clean breast of it, you will have my forgiveness to carry with you into uh, whatever hereafter awaits you. Where have you hidden the statue? If he heard me, he did not answer. Slowly and with difficulty, his broken speech interrupted by long pauses, he began to speak, not so much to me as to himself, and I knew he was reliving parts of the past. At daybreak, the last breath rattled out of Lidman's labouring lungs. I said a little prayer, folded his hands over his breast, and closed his staring eyes. You missed Mr. Lidman's funeral, I announced, but the case is solved. I have his confession. That makes three confessions, David said. He and Ramses had arrived shortly after midnight, unannounced and unexpected. Jamad's shout of welcome roused the household. We all tumbled out of bed and, attired in a variety of hastily assumed garments, rushed to the veranda. I had ordered them to sit down, and Fatima hurried off to make tea. 
Ramsay's eyes were shadowed with dark stains of exhaustion. I knew what had caused them. Neither he nor David had suffered physical injury, but mental distress affects my son almost as painfully. Nifret sat next to him on the settee, holding his hand in hers. "'Both the Petherics confessed?' I exclaimed. "'Nonsense. Tell me what happened.' After one glance at Ramsay's, Emerson had gone back into the house. He came out with a glass in his hand. "'Here,' he said gruffly. "'This may prove more therapeutic than tea.' Ramses took the whiskey, but did not speak. "'It is quickly told,' David said, watching his friend. "'We had some difficulty finding them, since they registered under Mrs. Petherick's nom de plume. "'Unluckily, the desk clerk at the Menor house informed them we were there, "'and they set off into the desert before we could speak to them. "'We followed. "'They rode to Abu Roche, and when we caught up with them, Adrian was holding a rifle.' He was in a state of considerable agitation and actually fired the rifle before Ramses tackled him. No one was hurt. It was a bald and boring narrative, but I did not insist on elaboration at that time. What did you do with him? I asked. We escorted them back to Cairo, and late last night managed to get Adrian admitted to the Presbyterian Hospital. He had relapsed into a state of stupor and could not resist. Harriet stayed with him, of course. "'Of course,' I murmured. "'And you say he confessed to murdering Mrs. Petherick?' "'Nefret had managed to get Ramses to drink some of the whisky. "'He looked up and spoke for the first time. "'His confession doesn't count. Neither does hers. "'She was trying to take the blame for him, as she has always done. "'It must have been distressing,' I said, "'for my sympathetic imagination had filled in some of the gaps in the narrative.' Thank you, Fatima, but I don't believe either of them is hungry, or in a proper state of mind for prolonged discussion. Sleep is what they need. We will have a little council of war tomorrow, after we have all rested. Cyrus will wish to be present, I'm sure. Now, off to bed with you, boys. In fact, I was not sorry to postpone my account. It may come as a surprise to my readers to learn that... I myself have, on occasion, a weakness for the theatrical. I had deliberately held back from Emerson some of the information I had learned from Lidman, and certain of the conclusions I had drawn from it, and I was looking forward to addressing a larger and more appreciative audience. After a late breakfast, Fatima assisted me in arranging chairs and tables in the sitting room. As our friends arrived, I directed them to their seats. Is this to be a lecture? Emerson inquired, taking in the rows of chairs and the desk behind which I had seated myself. A discussion, my dear, I corrected. Will you take this chair at my right? Thank you. Catherine, you there, and Jumana, Dawood and Selim. It took a while to get everyone settled, since Ramses exclaimed over Jumana's spectacular bruises, and David asked about Bertie's arm. I was forced to exert my authority and make everyone sit down and be quiet. I took my place behind the desk and arranged my papers. First, I invited David and Ramses to give their account, since some of the others hadn't heard it. Ramses, who was looking better, gave a more detailed version of their adventures. It inspired quite a variety of reactions. He is mad, Dawood said. A madman is not responsible for what he does. You're right there, Dawood, said Bertie. Ha, said Selim, scowling. He hadn't his cousin's kind heart and was as sceptical about psychology as Emerson. Did he describe how he killed her and why, I asked. Ramses shook his head. He said very little after he recovered consciousness. There's no real motive, Mother. You can talk about ambivalence all you like, but postulated emotions aren't evidence. He didn't do it, Emerson said, fidgeting. We know who did. Peabody, why don't you get to Lidman's confession? First, I began. Second, you mean, or third. If I am boring you, Emerson, you may be excused. Go play with the children. Emerson grinned. I beg your pardon, Peabody. Proceed. First, said Ramses, if you will allow me, Mother, I would like to know how you caught Lidman. 
It seems to have been a rather physical encounter. That is precisely what I intended to do, dear boy. It all began when we learned that Lidman had broken into the drawer in Emerson's desk and taken the statuette. By raising my voice at intervals, I was able to keep comments and questions to a minimum. And now, I said, we come to the heart of the matter. The identity of Mrs. Petherick's murderer. First, I quelled Emerson with a stern look. First, I want to read you the biographical notice her publishers put out. Having done so, I went on without pausing. And now, my friends, I will read you the true story of her life. Magda Ormond, no fawn, was born in Leipzig to a respectable merchant family. From an early age, she displayed considerable intelligence, and her father, having no son, hired tutors for her. One of them was a young teacher of English, Moritz X. Daffinger. He, too, recognised the girl's abilities. She had a taste for tales of the supernatural and made up stories, which she told her indulgent tutor. He had fallen in love with her. She was, at that time, approximately sixteen years of age and quite striking in appearance. She returned his love, and when her parents got wind of the situation, they dismissed young Mr. Duffinger and arranged a marriage for her with the son of a prosperous butcher. The lovers eloped to Berlin, where they were married. To augment his paltry salary as a teacher, Duffinger got the idea of writing novels. At first it was a collaboration. She wrote the books, basing the plots on the tales of werewolves and vampires in which she reveled, and he rewrote them in proper English. The books were an immediate success. Realising that they might appeal more strongly to a female audience if they were written by a woman, the lovers invented a romantic background for Magda. The publishers never questioned it, because they too realised it would sell more books. To do them justice, they had no reason to question her biography, but I fear the mercantile instinct is strong in the industry. Then war broke out. Daffinger shouldered arms and went off to battle. Magda never heard from him again. I am forced to believe that she didn't try very hard to find out what had become of him. She had begun to yearn for a more exciting life, and here was her chance to achieve it. In the last months, when the German lines were crumbling and the populace was suffering from despair and privation, she made her way to England. Success, popularity and a good marriage followed. I turned over a page. Duffinger had suffered greatly during the war. He had served on the Russian front and been taken prisoner. Ill and impoverished, he made his way back to Berlin and searched for his loving wife. The search took months. No one knew what had become of her. He was forced to dubious expedients, including theft and assault, to stay alive. Not until two years ago did he come across a story in an English newspaper about her most recent book and her forthcoming marriage to Pringle Petherick. I could tell by the looks of dawning comprehension on the faces of my listeners that they had anticipated my denouement. So I hastened on. You can imagine her consternation when her husband, her legal husband, came back from the grave and confronted her. I am sorry to say that his was not a forgiving nature, and he certainly had grounds for bitterness. She was now rich and successful, in part because of his help. He was poor and unknown. To make a long story short, he demanded payment in return for his silence. She sold many of her jewels to satisfy him. When her resources began to run out, Petherick conveniently passed away. Emerson had maintained his silence. Now he could control himself no longer. She killed Petherick? We will never know for certain, I replied. What we do know is that Daffinger increased his demands. One of the men who had served in his unit during the war was a young archaeologist named Lidman. They became friends and talked about their various interests. In the final bloody weeks, Lidman was killed, blown to bits, as Duffinger put it. Duffinger had learned a great deal from Lidman, including the value of antiquities. He wanted half of Petherick's estate. 
Magda fled, taking with her the most valuable object in the collection. Furious at what he considered her betrayal, he pursued her. I turned over another page. By the time he tracked her down, Mrs. Petherick had got her nerve back. She pointed out that if he spoke, she stood to lose her inheritance. But he stood to lose everything and might have to face a charge of blackmail. They entered into negotiations. Fearing he might attempt to steal the statuette from her room, she presented it to us. She had already concocted her story about the curse and taken another room in the name of Mrs. Johnson in order to set up her scheme. Emerson had heard most of this before and was waxing restless. She took us in completely, he growled. He does not like to be taken in. With all that talk of curses and black freaks, I didn't believe it, and neither did you, I retorted. But I admit we might have been more sceptical about her motives. At any rate, Daffinger was furious when he found out what she had done. He made several attempts to break into the house. Being unsuccessful, he tried another trick, representing himself as his deceased friend in order to be hired by Cyrus. "'which would, he hoped, gain him entry to this house. "'He was an intelligent man with an excellent memory, "'and he had spent hours listening to Lidman expound on Amana. "'I suppose there wasn't much else to talk about in the trenches. "'It was he who killed her then?' David asked. "'Why? It's usually the blackmailer who is murdered, not the victim. "'She tried to kill him,' I said, that night, when they went walking along the river, she had offered to meet him to discuss his demands. She was a large, strong woman, and he wasn't expecting danger. It was pure bad luck for her that he survived. Naturally, that angered him even more, and when they met next, in the Winter Palace Garden, he was in no mood for trifling. Seeing her, sumptuously attired, bewigged and bejeweled, with no sign of remorse, was bad enough— then she made the fatal mistake of offering him a trumpery pair of diamond earrings and told him this was her last payment. She had learned that he had a criminal record in Germany. Now he was the one who stood to lose most. In a fit of rage, he attacked her, and in the process of stifling her cries for help, caused her heart to stop. He claimed he didn't intend to kill her. Perhaps he didn't. But once the deed was done, he had no choice, as he explained, but to conceal the body. He took the earrings, though, and stripped her of her jewels in order to give the impression that robbery had been the motive. The strangest thing of all was what he did after he had placed her under the coral vine. Dowd's informant was right. There were white petals strewn over the body. Aid, who is not interested in horticulture, did not observe them, but white roses were her favourites. Nefret shivered. Why do I find that horrifying? Ambivalence, I said. Love and hate intertwined and inseparable. To those of us who never feel such conflict, it is horrifying. What about the wig? Nefret asked. Her mouth was tight with distaste. Did he keep that as a... a memento? Nothing so bizarre, I said. It fell off during their struggle, and he couldn't get it back on. One can imagine how difficult that would have been, with his hands shaking and her head... Quite, said Ramses, glancing at his wife. So he took it away with him? And discarded it. He didn't say precisely how. Well done, mother, said Ramses. You got all that from Lidman's uh, Duffinger's confession, did you? Most of it. I stacked my papers neatly. That concludes my lect... the discussion... And the case? Not quite, Ramsay said. His eyebrows were tilted and his eyes were intent on me. We still haven't found the statue. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Not that they hadn't tried. No one except his mother and Nefret had bothered to attend Lidman Duffinger's hastily arranged funeral... The others had spent the day searching the areas in and around the West Valley tomb, where he'd been hiding. It isn't in the tomb, Emerson said flatly. I'd stake my reputation on that. 
We couldn't do a complete excavation, not in such a short time. But we shifted everything that could be shifted. And put it back in the original place, of course, Ramsay suggested. Of course. Took a cursed long time. They were on their way back to the West Valley. It was early afternoon and the sun was merciless. But Ramsay's shared his father's desire to get on with the job. There could be no question now about the legal ownership of the statuette. Since Magda Ormond's marriage to Petherick had been illegal, Petherick's children would inherit. They could use the money, and they would get it one way or another. Emerson would see to that. It was not only the prospect of losing a great sum of money that bothered him, though. His reputation was at stake, and he would spend the next ten years looking if he had to. Emerson spoke forcibly to his horse and forged ahead to join Sethos, who had taken his place at the head of the procession. The whole family had come, including Selim and Daoud and a full crew of workmen. Those magnificent soaring cliffs were full of hundreds of crevices, large enough to conceal something the size of the small golden statue. Ramses waited for his mother and Nefret and fell in beside them. He hadn't had a chance to talk to his mother in private since her performance that morning. All right, are you, mother? he asked. Certainly. She wiped her wet face with a neat white handkerchief. Cyrus has had the men bring plenty of water, Ramsay said. Enough of the horses, too. I appreciate your concern, my dear, but it is unnecessary. You have something else on your mind, don't you? That was an impressive summary you gave this morning, Ramsay said. Are you completely satisfied about the solution to the case? A little murmur of amusement escaped her lips. You noticed a few unexplained items? The others will, eventually, but I threw so much information at them they haven't had time to absorb it. Why? Ramses asked, bluntly. Her smile faded. For one thing, I hadn't heard your story when I arranged my notes. Obviously, it cannot have been Daffinger who was responsible for the attacks on you in Cairo. You don't believe it was Adrian, do you? I don't see how he could have managed them. The man... The person who shot at us outside Bassam's used a pistol. Adrian had only a rifle. I searched him and his luggage before we went back to Cairo that night. He might have disposed of the pistol, possibly, but why would he? Emerson, now well ahead, turned and shouted at them to hurry up. They joined the others, who were gathered in an attentive group around Emerson. We've been over some of this ground before, said Emerson, his jaw set. We will do it again, painstakingly and methodically, leaving not a square inch of ground unexplored. Under his guidance, they fanned out in three directions, right, left, and up, starting at the mouth of the unfinished Tomb 25, probing into every opening in the rock. It was going to take forever, Ramses thought. He looked at his uncle, who was strolling slowly along, hands clasped behind his back and whistling, in perfect tune and metre, a complicated air Ramses recognised as the opening theme from a Mozart horn concerto. Sethos's ostentatious nonchalance provoked him into speech. "'I didn't know you were fond of the classics,' he said. "'There are a number of things you don't know about me,' said Sethos blandly. He dusted off a boulder with his handkerchief and sat down. "'I'm a man of many talents.' A talent for hard manual labour isn't among them. Why should I do that when I can get someone else to do it for me? For instance, said Sethos, with the slightest sideways movement of his head, that fellow up there, no, don't turn and stare, has been watching us for over an hour. Perhaps you would care to wander casually in his direction? The direction was straight up, on a ledge that jutted out from the cliff face, there was a path of sorts winding up from the valley floor. Out of the corner of his eye, Ramses caught a flash of light, binoculars, and what might have been a head looking down. Wander and casually don't apply, he said, caustically. He's got a good vantage point. He'll see me start to climb. I will provide a distraction, said Sethos. He stood up and dusted off the seat of his trousers. Then he walked back to where Emerson was standing, shouting instructions to the searchers. Ramses didn't hear what Sethos said, but it galvanized Emerson into a furious retort that was clearly audible, not only to his son, but to everyone for some distance. 
You dare criticize my relationship with my wife? You don't deserve her. Sethos pointed accusingly at Ramsay's mother, who was working her way along the cliff face just above them. She stopped and stared down. No man worthy of the name would allow her to take such a risk, Sethos shouted. Ramses didn't see what happened after that. He was too intent on making his way up the cliff with all possible speed. He heard grunts and thumps and several outraged cries from his mother. The outcropping hid him from sight most of the way. When he reached the ledge, he hauled himself up and over in a single movement. The flash of light hadn't been made by binoculars, but by a camera lens. The photographer had his eyes glued to the camera and was snapping photographs of the melee below. He was too absorbed to notice Ramses until the latter caught hold of the camera with one hand and the man's collar with the other. Don't drop the camera, he shrieked, squirming. Ramses got him down by way of the path, which was negotiable for a man in reasonably fit condition. The others were waiting for them at the bottom. Sethos was dabbing delicately at his nose with a bloody handkerchief. There wasn't a mark on Emerson, who was crimson with rage. A damned journalist, he shouted, extending a long arm. Don't damage the camera, the photographer gasped. Emerson snatched it from him and threw it onto the hard ground. The photographer screamed. It's Mr. Anderson, isn't it? Nefret looked more closely at the man's face. You fell into the tomb the other day. And tried to get information out of my daughter, Ramsay said. Anderson, my eye, Cyrus exclaimed. That's the artist I told you about. The one who came asking for a job and never turned up again. May A. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 10 I wondered briefly if Mr. Anderson was a relation of Kevin O'Connell's, her cousin or younger brother. But no, I thought, Kevin's hair was fiery red and this man's was brown. Instead of the cerulean blue of Kevin's, his eyes were a muddy green. The resemblance was not physical, but one of expression and manner. He's a journalist, I said. Is he also, I wonder, a thief and a murderer? The question got Mr. Anderson's mind off the camera, whose broken pieces he was collecting with little moans of anguish. He jumped to his feet. Now, see here, Mrs. Emerson, don't go around accusing people like that. All I wanted was an exclusive story. Uh, Mr. O'Connell is my mentor, my idol. He taught me everything I know and challenged me to equal his success in, um, worming his way into our confidence. I said, grimly. You represented yourself as an archaeological artist in order to get a position with Mr. Vandergeld, a scheme worthy of Kevin himself. Not so clever, Anderson admitted. I can sketch a bit and thought I could carry out the deception for a few days, but when Mr. Vandergeld refused to hire me without seeing my portfolio, I knew I'd have to try some other method. Ha! Emerson exclaimed. I was right, you see. I said those bastards would stop at nothing, even blowing up the guardhouse. 
Anderson's eyes widened in alarm. No, sir, I never did that. Look here, let's call it square. You've smashed my camera and ruined some first-rate pictures. So I'll just be on my way. How did you get here? I asked. Anderson grimaced. Walked all the way from the East Valley. Me and a dozen Egyptians. They said you were here yesterday, looking for something, so they figured they would have to look too. Damnation, said Emerson. Did they find anything? I don't think so, but they're sneaky rascals. They ran off when you came along. Hell and damnation, said Emerson. I have a few questions to ask you, Mr. Anderson, and this is not the time or the place for an interrogation. Hassan, escort this person back to our house and keep him there until we return. Anderson had perked up as the discussion became more civilised. His face fell. But, sir, I haven't any transport, not even a confounded donkey. You got here on foot, you can return the same way. Emerson bared his large white teeth. Off you go, and don't try to bribe Hassan. He is incorruptible. Hassan glanced at his father, Daoud, who stood with his arms folded. He is, said Daoud, whatever it means. We watched them walk off together. Anderson was limping. Sethos removed the handkerchief from his nose. Thank you, Nefret. It stopped bleeding. I'm an expert at nosebleeds, said Nefret. Um, uh, said Emerson. Apology accepted said Sethos with a grin. Accept mine as well. I didn't mean what I said. It was well done, Ramses conceded. Anderson was so fascinated he didn't spot me until I was on top of him. Emerson, who had gone as far as he was capable of going in the way of apology, uttered the familiar litany. Back to work! We have to find the statuette today, or risk one of those energetic rascals stealing a march on us. It's over there, said Sethos, about eight feet to the left of the entrance, bedded in the scree. No one so much as questioned that arrogant assertion. In an unruly scamper, the whole lot of us went pelting back toward the spot he had described. It took a few minutes to retrieve the wrapped bundle, since we had to proceed with care, but the disturbance of the scree was so obvious I could only wonder why none of us had observed it. Because it was too obvious. We had assumed Duffinger would take greater pains to conceal his prize. Emerson unwrapped enough of the bundle to make certain we had found what we sought. Cradling it as tenderly as if it were an infant, he had it back to where his brother had seated himself nonchalantly on a rock. How did you know? Sethos ruefully examined his stained handkerchief. I asked myself where I would have hidden it. Like Daffinger, I am averse to strenuous exercise. Cyrus burst out laughing. Like the old saw about where to look for the lost horse, eh? As Amelia would say, there is often profound truth in such aphorisms. I'd been just about to say that. We passed Mr. Anderson and Hassan on our way back to the East Valley. Anderson raised a face of piteous appeal. He looked so miserable, hobbling and dripping with perspiration, that Nefret pleaded with Emerson to let him ride for a while. Emerson, who could have walked the whole distance without breaking into a glow, shook his head and gave Mr. Anderson an evil smile. He hates journalists even more than he hates tourists. However, he is not a cruel or vindictive man, and Fred's good opinion means a great deal to him. When we reached the donkey park, he sent one of the men back with a mount. Again, I found myself side by side with Ramses. Another suspect, he remarked. I hardly think so, I replied. Daffinger's confession doesn't explain everything, mother. I gave him an affectionate smile, thinking with some complacency how well he'd turned out. Except for his father, there was not a finer-looking man in Egypt, or anywhere else. He sat his horse with the ease of an athlete, and his features were as finely shaped as those of a Greek statue. Except for his nose, which was a trifle large, and in my opinion, all the better for it. 
I did not doubt that Harriet Petherick had been motivated by more than concern for her brother when she made that clumsy attempt to win Ramses over. Well, Ramses demanded. My intent regard had made him self-conscious. My, but you are persistent. We'll discuss it later. Vandergilt has asked us to stop at the castle for a spot of luncheon. Emerson turned to address me. I presume that is agreeable to you, Peabody. Yes, Catherine will be anxious to know that we've found the statue. Emerson's smile was particularly smug. You agreed to the delay because you want to keep Mr. Anderson sweating a while longer, I said, accusingly. How can you think that of me, Peabody? We need to discuss our future plans. Our work has come to a complete standstill these past days. Murder takes precedence over excavation, I said. You needn't pretend, Emerson. I know you too well. Your strong sense of duty demanded that you avenge Mrs. Petherick, and now you have done so. Hmm, said Emerson, and urged his horse ahead. When we unwrapped the statuette, we found that a few more bits of the inlaid collar had fallen out. Thanks to our care, they had been preserved and could be replaced. It's a pity about the Uraeus serpent, Cyrus said. Dowd rumbled in agreement. We should try to find it, he declared. I'm afraid that's a lost cause, Dowd, Ramses said. We can't sift every tomb in Egypt. With the statuette as a centerpiece, we sat down to a sumptuous meal served by Cyrus's aging but devoted majordomo, Albert. At Cyrus's direction, he opened several bottles of champagne, and we toasted our success, and, as Cyrus put it, the triumphant conclusion of another investigation. I don't know how you do it, Amelia, he declared. She had Daffinger's confession, said Emerson. Sounds to me said Ramses, toying with his glass, as if he confessed to everything except sinking the Titanic. Mother, are you sure you didn't... I don't know quite how to say this. Put words in the mouth of a dying man? I finished the sentence with perfect good humour. Uh, unconsciously, of course, Ramses said quickly. Emerson twitched. He'd become somewhat sensitive to any mention of the unconscious. He was not as coherent as my account suggested. I admitted, especially toward the end. However, I already had reason to suspect him. I took a folded paper from my pocket. Emerson groaned. Cyrus chuckled. Sethos grinned broadly, and Dowd put his fork down, prepared to give me his full attention. Another of your little lists? Sethos inquired. Clues, I said. There are three of them. The clue of the white petals, the clue of generosity and the clue of excessive erudition. I get the first one, Cyrus said eagerly. The flower petals meant that she was killed by someone who knew her well, who cared for her, even. I nodded approvingly. Generosity, Ramses said thoughtfully. I presume that refers to Mrs. Petherick's handing the statue over to us. Precisely, I said. We assumed her motive was to involve us in the publicity she was courting. But she could accomplish that without actually giving it into our hands. I asked myself whether her real motive was fear. A potential thief would transfer his attentions to us and leave her alone. I say, Bertie exclaimed, this is as good as a Sherlock Holmes story. But so far, all you've proved is that she was afraid of someone. What about the third clue? That one pointed directly to Lidman Duffinger, I said. Aside from the coincidence of his turning up when he did, his familiarity with Egyptology was of a highly suspect nature. He knew a great deal about matters that could have been learned from others, in person or from books, but he always found an excuse to avoid actual field excavation. Whenever anyone asked him a question he couldn't answer, he started lecturing. Ramsay said, with some chagrin. I ought to have spotted that. It was far from conclusive, I said. There were other suspicious circumstances, though. His illness was feigned. Nefret was unable to find anything seriously wrong with him. It accomplished two purposes, getting him out of a job he couldn't do 
and admitting him to this house. He was in a perfect position to feed the dog a sleeping potion and make another attempt at searching for the statue. It seems so obvious now, Bertie said ingenuously. It always does afterward. I caught Ramsay's sceptical eye and smiled pleasantly at him. We'd better be getting home. Poor Mr. Anderson must be in quite a state by now. Poor Mr. Anderson. Bah, said Emerson. Hassan had taken his instructions seriously. Mr. Anderson was seated on a very hard chair, his eyes fixed on Hassan, who stood over him, fingering his knife. Please, Anderson gurgled. Tell this man to back off. He threatened me. Well done, Hassan, said Emerson. You can go now. Hassan did so, and Anderson let out a long breath of relief. He took off his hat, not so much as a token of courtesy, but in order to push his damp hair back from his face. That was intimidation, he declared. I could sue. O'Connell would be proud of you, Emerson said, taking a comfortable chair. You are as resilient as he, but he ought to have mentioned that threats get you nowhere with us. You're damned lucky to get away without a sound thrashing. All I wanted... Yes, yes, an exclusive story. Well, you've got it. I'm sure you can make a lurid tale of this morning's events, even without photographs. Would you care for something to drink, Mr. Anderson? I asked. You look very warm. Anderson's wary eyes moved from Emerson to me and back to Emerson. What do I have to do? Say please, Mr. Anderson. Fatima was peeping out the door. At my gesture, she came out with a pitcher of lemonade, and we each had a glass. Mr. Anderson had two. Now, I said, taking a paper from my pocket, a few questions before you go. This time, my little list consisted of what I had labelled untoward events. We have accounted for all but a few, I explained. I want to know which you are responsible for. The first attempt to break into the house? Uh, I did that, Anderson admitted, but I only wanted... Blowing up the guard house? No, no, I never did that. Luring Ramses out into the hills and attacking him? What? His consternation appeared to be genuine. I never attacked anybody, Mrs. Emerson. That's the God's truth. He's too much of a coward, Emerson declared, like his mentor. I went through my list, item by item, and then I said, Very well, Mr. Anderson, I am satisfied, for the moment. Then can I go? He put down his empty glass and jumped up. One little reminder, said Emerson, grinning broadly. You have confessed before witnesses to breaking and entering. Anderson's lips parted, and Emerson amended his accusation. Entering, then. I could have you arrested for that. And I will, if you cause us any more trouble. Anderson was so glad to get away, he didn't even ask for the loan of a horse. As he ran down the road toward the landing, I called, Give my regards to Kevin, Mr. Anderson. That takes care of that, Emerson declared, rubbing his hands together. Now we can get back to work. I like the way you coolly dismiss murder, theft and violent assaults, Nefret said perching on the arm of his chair and patting his hand. Where'd we go first, father? I have it all worked out, Emerson said. Dear El Medina tomorrow, I want to see what Selim has been up to. Then we finish with KV-55? David asked. Um, <clears throat> Emerson looked shifty. Not yet. No, not yet. We will put in a few days at Dear El Medina. I think it's time we close down the dig there. As soon as I've made certain everything is in order for the French. Isn't tea ready? Where are the children? I'd been going through the postbasket. I looked up from the letter I was reading. Dear me, Monsieur Lacour sounds somewhat put out with you, Ramses. Did you break an appointment with him while you were in Cairo? There was no appointment. Only a somewhat brusque summons, Ramsay said. I'd more urgent matters on my mind. I will just drop him a little note explaining the situation, I offered. The devil with Lacour, Emerson said. 
Who does he think he is ordering us about? The director of the Antiquities Service, that is who, I reminded my husband. There are a few other loose ends to be tied up as well. We have the statue back, and we know who the legal owner is. But we must inform the authorities about what we have discovered. I doubt they are aware of Mrs... of Magda's first marriage. I must also get off a telegram to Harriet, giving her the good news. She will be glad of the money. The small inheritance she received from her mother was expended on her trip to Egypt, and Adrian's care will probably be expensive. And Inspector Aid must be told that we know the identity of the murderer. I thought you did that this morning, Emerson said. I dropped a few little hints, but we must make an official report and give Aid a copy of Duffinger's confession. I promised we would do that today or tomorrow. I had hoped we would be able to report that the statue had been recovered. And as you see, my optimism was justified. Sethos's silence was as provocative as speech. Thanks to you, I said, nodding at him. We'd have found it sooner or later, Emerson said. Don't be a dog in the manger, Emerson. Say thank you. Not at all. Sethos waved a languid hand. I trust that now you're willing to concede that my reformation is sincere. Though I wouldn't mind an apology for your suspicions. You did suspect me, didn't you? I said, I fear your past conduct could not help but inspire a certain doubt, not about the murder of Mrs. Petherick, but about several of the attempts to steal the statue. Lidman Duffinger's suspicious behaviour on the occasion of the dog that did not bark in the night-time rested solely on your word, and you had as much opportunity as he to drug Amira. I wasn't even here when the first attempt at robbery occurred, Sethos protested, or the second. I don't doubt that we had more than one would-be thief at work, I said. However, for what it is worth, I apologise. I too. Emerson sounded as if the words had been wrenched out of him. Good heavens, Sethos clapped a hand to his heart. I hope the shock won't be too much for me. Emerson declared we might as well go to Luxor and get the official part of the business over with. Sethos offered to accompany us. I declined the offer. Our business was expeditiously concluded, as was our interview with Aid. I had taken the liberty of adding a few remarks to Duffinger's confession, praising the work of the police and the dedication of the inspector. Aid read the final sentence aloud. Had he not immediately acted to prevent the suspect's escape, the man might have been able to leave Luxor and lose himself with his ill-gotten gains in the teeming slums of Cairo. Very uh, eloquently put, Mrs. Emerson. Thank you. You didn't tell him about that bastard, Anderson, said Emerson, as we strolled arm in arm toward the river bank and our waiting boat. I am holding it over Anderson's head, I replied. That method is more effective with journalists. Emerson helped me into the boat and took his place beside me. We're in no hurry, he informed Sabir. Take your time, eh? Moonlight made a shimmering path across the water. Emerson glanced at Sabir, who had tactfully turned his back and put an arm round me. Good to be alone at last, he declared. That bust, that um, hissing hurst was always on our heels. Bizzing hurst, I corrected. You mustn't let him get on your nerves, Emerson. He only does it to annoy, because he know it teases. I had expected the romantic ambience would keep Emerson occupied, but he had something on his mind. Why were you and Ramses exchanging those meaningful glances? When did we do that? Off and on all day. Don't equivocate, Peabody. Never, my dear. I moved a little closer to him. Ramses isn't satisfied that Daffinger's confession solved all the unexplained incidents. 
You said yourself that there were dozens of people after the statuette. A slight exaggeration, my dear. To be honest, I would love to find Sir Malcolm guilty of something. But I fear he is too cautious to break or even bend the law. However, the points that bother Ramses are the incidents directed at him here and in Cairo. Gavinger couldn't have been responsible for the latter since he never left Luxor. It was the Petherick boy, Emerson said flatly. So I assume Ramses doesn't want to believe it. He's too damned soft-hearted, Emerson said in a fond grumble. I pity young Petherick. He's another casualty of that filthy, unnecessary war. But he can't be held blameless because of his misfortune. I wonder what will become of the girl. Harriet? You rather liked her, didn't you? I admire her spunk and her loyalty. I fear she is another casualty of the war. She will spend the rest of her life taking care of Adrian, with no chance for her own happiness. I wonder if I ought not make a quick trip to Cairo. Now there I draw the line, Peabody. Emerson gathered me into a close embrace. You cannot take all the troubles of the world on your shoulders. I need you here. Tomorrow? We go to Deir el Medina, and Ramses gets back to work on his papyri. Oh, said Emerson. Hmm. It will help distract him, I suppose. I do wish you would take more interest in his work, Emerson. He seems to be quite excited about some of the fragments we found this year. I don't mean to denigrate his work, Emerson said guiltily. It is of first-rate importance. You think I haven't been complimentary enough? Very well, my dear. I will try to make it up to him. He meant it, most sincerely, as he proceeded to demonstrate at dinner. His unexpected interest so astonished Ramses that at first he replied only in monosyllables. Tell us more, my boy, Emerson urged, leaning forward with his elbows on the table. Consciousness of personal sin, you say? Ramses hadn't said that. I had, when I explained his theory to Emerson. He couldn't avoid the question, though, and as he went on, enthusiasm overcame his modesty. I think the concept appears much earlier than Professor Breasted believed, he explained. There is one fragment in particular, quite a large one, that from the handwriting would seem to be 18th dynasty. I haven't had a chance to translate it as yet, but the words crime and forgiveness appear several times. Then it's time you did, Emerson declared. Get your friend Kachevsky back, why don't you? Kachanovsky, Ramses said patiently. I'm sure he is waiting to hear from me. Thank you, Father. Not at all, not at all. Emerson looked at me for approval. I nodded, and Emerson beamed. Tell me more, my boy. Our morning's work at Dero Medina went smoothly. We had borrowed Bertie, who began a final plan, and Emerson's praise made Selim glow with pride. The only one of our crew who appeared somewhat sulky was Daoud. We did nothing to help, he said. All by yourselves you found the evil man and what he had stolen. We did nothing. You protected the house and brought us the dog, Ramses offered. Daoud's large face wrinkled. The dog did nothing. There was no need, I said, realizing that his distress was genuine. It was the magic of the father of curses that prevailed, uh, eventually. Ah, said Daoud. Eventually means that the magic took a little longer than usual to work, Ramses explained. Ah, Daoud thought it over. Yes, the black afrit was very strong. The black afrit has gone for good, I said. It will not return. Inshallah, said Daoud. Fatima was preparing the tea tray when we got back to the house. You are early, she said, accusingly. We are in no hurry, I said. Where is Ramses? Who is his friend? They have been working. I will tell them tea will be ready soon. When I approached the workroom, I heard their voices. I stood still and listened, my heart pounding. 
The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Kachanovsky had been slow to respond to Ramsey's message. Ramsey's had been working on the papyri for some time before he arrived, full of apologies and questions. Ramsey's answered the latter somewhat abstractedly. The suspicion that had entered his mind seemed absurd. The Russian looked and behaved as he always had, eager and humble. He took the text Ramsey's handed him and began transcribing it. Ramsey's watched him for a while. Then he selected another piece of papyrus. You translated this, didn't you? Kachanovsky looked up. When he saw what Ramses was holding, he got quickly to his feet and backed off a few steps. Ramses' heart sank. He'd been almost certain, but he had hoped he was wrong. I know you did, Ramses said. It wasn't in quite the same position where I put it originally. Kachanovsky raised both hands as if in protest and then shoved them into his pockets. Why deny it? Your memory is faultless. I read it, yes. A remarkable document, Ramsey said, scanning the crabbed lines. It would make your reputation if it were published. It's worth more than that, and you know it, the Russian said. One might look at it as a treasure map. There are some people who would give a great deal to have the information it contains. Ramsey straightened and turned to face the other man. Kachanovsky had taken a pistol from his pocket. Ramses recognized it as the one that had belonged to Adrian Petherick. He had hidden it at the back of a shelf in the workroom, high above the reach of small hands. He'd meant to dispose of it eventually, and had never got round to doing so. Serves me right, he thought, noting that Kachanovsky held the gun like a man who had had experience with such weapons. Why, Mikhail? he asked. I don't want to. Kachanovsky's eyes were haunted. But I must. If I take it, you would know. You remember every wretched scrap. You are the only one who would know it came from here. I can say I bought it from a dealer. That's why you tried to kill me in Cairo. And in Luxor, when you replied to my message last night. Kachanovsky's bowed shoulders straightened. His hands were steady. I had to. If you were dead, no one else would know. That takes care of the unexplained items on Mother's list, Ramses thought. He was faintly surprised at his own coolness, at his relief that he had been right about Adrian Petherick. He simply couldn't take this threat seriously, not from the mild, amiable Russian. You can't kill me now, he argued. The house is full of people. They'll hear the shot. You'll be caught red-handed. Kachanovsky glanced at the open window. I'll tell them someone burst in. Two shots, one for you, one minor wound for me. He dropped the gun and fled. Sethos had been right. When Kachanovsky was standing straight, his head lifted. He was taller than anyone else had noticed, and his thin frame had a wiry strength. His will was as strong. Ramses didn't doubt the man had struggled with his conscience, but now he had made up his mind, and there wasn't much chance he could be persuaded to change it. There was a slim chance, though, and he was prepared to go on talking as long as he could. Then he heard a sound outside the door, a too familiar sound, and knew the time for talk had passed. Kachanovsky turned toward the door, and his finger tightened on the trigger. She burst into the room and ran straight at the Russian, firing her little pistol. As usual, she missed. Kachanovsky didn't. Ramses didn't feel the bullet that tore through his sleeve. He didn't hear the cries of alarm and the sound of running feet. He was only conscious of his fists ramming into yielding flesh and the collapse of the Russian. Falling on his knees beside his mother, he pressed his hands against the blood stain spreading across her blouse. Her eyes opened. A smile of triumph curved her white lips. I suspected him. From the first, she whispered. She would consider that a fitting epitaph, Emerson said hoarsely. Ramses sat with his elbows on his knees and his face hidden in his hands. He couldn't stop shaking. 
They were waiting on the bench outside Nefret's clinic, all in a row like worshippers in a church pew, Ramses and his father, David, Sethos and Selim. There wasn't room on the bench for Daoud. He stood next to them, monolithically calm. Overhead, the feathery fronds of a tamarisk rustled lightly. Sunlight filtered through the leaves like a rain of gold. A hand clasped his shoulder. Should be all right, Emerson repeated for the fourth or fifth time. Nefret said so. I thought she was dying, Ramsay said through his fingers. There was so much blood. Some of it was yours, said his wife, standing in the open door of the clinic. Come in and let me have a look at you. It's nothing. He didn't want to move. Go on, my boy. Emerson's hand tightened. She's all right now, isn't she, Nefret? Inshallah, Daoud intoned. Inshallah, Nefret echoed. She looked like a weary angel, Ramses thought, with sunlight stroking her hair and her blue eyes warm. She'll be waking soon. I think she will want to see you and father. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I had never beheld Abdullah in such a rage. He shook his fist at me. What did I tell you? Why did you not heed me? There was no pain here. I took a deep breath of the fresh morning air. Did I die? I asked. No, Abdallah said grudgingly. Not this time. You have as many lives as a cat, Sit, but you have used most of them. What was I supposed to do? I demanded. Stand by and let him kill my son? Abdallah's scowl softened. You love him best, next to Emerson. Love cannot be measured, Abdallah. The more I give, the more I have to give. I couldn't remember the rest of it, so I paraphrased. For love is infinite as the sea. Poetry? Abdallah asked suspiciously. I laughed and threw my arms wide, embracing the day. All in all, I was glad to hear that my life was not over. I had a good many things left to do. Stop scolding and tell me you are happy to see me, I coaxed. Hmm, said Abdallah. He stroked his black beard and covered his smile with his hand. I have remembered the clue you gave me. Is it so? Will I still remember it when I wake up? Only the god knows, said Abdallah, no longer hiding his smile. Waking was not a pleasant process. Hot air smelling of antiseptic replaced the morning breeze, and I had a feeling that deep down under the cottony comfort of morphine, something was hurting. There was a lump on my feet, heavy and warm, and there was Emerson's face, hovering over me, and his strong hand holding mine, anxiety had carved deep lines in his face, which were set in a skull. Don't yell at her, said Nefret's voice, distant yet distinct. I don't mind if he does, I murmured. Ramses, is he... I'm all right, mother, thanks to you. Excellent. What is that weight on my feet? The cat! Emerson said. I'll take him. That's all right, Emerson. Leave him, I whispered. We've a great deal to talk about. Uh, not now, Nefret said. Tomorrow, I said. I have remembered. It was late the following morning before I awoke from a refreshing sleep, feeling almost myself again. I was in my own bed, and the great cat of Ray was curled up at my feet. Sunset light gilded the air, and there was the scent of flowers. Emerson sat beside me. When I stirred, he pounced his big, gentle hands on my shoulders. Don't move, Peabody. Fatima, run and tell Nefret she's conscious. Cautiously, I turned my head. 
On the table beside the bed was an enormous bunch of flowers, jammed helter-skelter into a vase. Roses, zinnias, marigolds, hollyhocks, bougainvillea, sticking out in all directions in a horrible confusion of colour. Tears came to my eyes. Oh, Emerson, did you pick them for me? The hand that brushed my cheek was covered with scratches. Everyone's been round to ask about you. Nefret said, Dowd and Selim, and Mr. Winlock and Mr. Barton, and half the village of Guna, including a curious goat, and Marjorie Fisher and Miss Buchanan, and a dozen others. The Vandergelts are here now. How nice, I said. Ask them to come in, will you? Mother, you mustn't overdo. Too many visitors will enliven me, I declared. And I want to see Ramses and David, of course, and... All right, Nefret said. For a few minutes, promise me you will remain quiet and not talk. I must talk. I have a great deal to say. Nefret's grave face broke into a smile. Ten minutes, mother, and not a minute longer. They crowded into the room, and the sight of those beloved faces would have lifted anyone's spirits. All right, are you, my boy? I asked Ramses. He nodded speechlessly. "'Excellent,' I said. "'I overheard much of what you said to Kachanovsky. "'What have you done with him?' "'He's in hospital,' Emerson said. "'Ramses damaged him rather extensively, but he'll live "'to face a charge of attempted murder.' "'I am sorry about him,' I said. "'He is a talented scholar and was, I believe, a good man "'before temptation got the better of him. "'His confession clears up the remaining items on my list.' Adrian Petherick is guilty of nothing except bullying his sister. You mustn't talk too much, Nefret said, feeling my brow. Then let Ramses talk. What the devil? What was in that papyrus? I've made a preliminary translation, Ramses said. He took a paper from his pocket. Parts of it were damaged or missing, so I have filled in the gaps as best I can. It is the confession of the original thief, describing where and how he found the golden statue. I took the image of this god from his tomb in the great place. Bakanaman, son of Tamosa, took the other image, and Sebekhotep, the draftsman, took rings of gold and a jeweled collar. The guards of the necropolis came upon us, and seized Sebek, Hotep, and Bakinaman. But I ran away without them seeing me. Now a sickness has seized my limbs, and the gods are punishing me for my crime. And I cannot put the image of this god back. So I offer it to you, Lady of Turquoise, Lady of Mercy, that I may not profit from my crime, and that I will win forgiveness in the hereafter." Lady of Turquoise, Nefret said. The goddess Hathor. Ramsay smiled at his wife. The golden one. He buried it near her temple, and that is where it was found a few years ago, by a modern thief, in the last place one would expect, Dero Medina, where the thief lived over 3,000 years ago. Amazing, Bertie exclaimed. It, it m must be absolutely unique. There were other papyri dealing with tomb robberies and the confessions of the thieves, Ramsay said. They are 20th dynasty in date. This is much earlier, 18th dynasty, if my analysis of the grammar and handwriting is correct. However, this is the only case where we have not only the confession of the thief, but the actual object he stole. I still don't see why that is so important, "'Except, of course, from a scholarly point of view,' Bertie added, with a glance at Jumana. "'Be quiet, mother.' Ramses placed his fingers lightly on my parted lips. "'My voice somewhat muffled by Ramses' fingers, I said, "'There are two unknown royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings. "'Abdallah told me so.' "'She's delirious,' Catherine said anxiously. Nefret shook a thermometer under my nose. She won't be quiet while you are all here. Out, everyone. 
The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. How is she this morning? Ramses asked. He was too familiar with his wife's features to miss the faint signs of worry. The two light lines between her curved brows. A little feverish, that's only to be expected, but I think I'd better stay with her today. Emerson pushed the food round his plate. Of course. If someone doesn't sit on her, she'll be up and doing. I won't go either. There's no need for you to stay, father, Nefret said. She needs to rest. Ramses didn't want to go either, but he understood what Nefret had not said, that his mother stood a better chance of resting if everyone was out of the house. He was fully prepared to argue with his uncle if he had to, but Sethos went without demur. He pitched in more energetically than he'd ever done, even offering to sift debris and brushing aside Emerson's doubts that he could do it properly. If I can't spot a shaped object among the rubble, I've wasted a good many years in the wrong profession. He was working in order to keep his mind off what might be happening back at the house. So were they all. Movements were slower and clumsier, voices louder. Fear was like a small distant cloud, no matter how Ramses reassured himself. Only to be expected, Nefret had said, a little feverish. And those two faint lines on her forehead. The only one who was unaffected was Daoud. He had absolute confidence in Nefret, and he had prayed for long hours. When they sat down to lunch, he talked of nothing but the golden statue and the thief's confession. Do you think it was here all the time, he said, waving a chicken leg in the general direction of the temple. Emerson, enveloped in frowning silence, did not reply. Not at this temple, Daud. It is much later than the 18th dynasty, David said. There were older temples to Hathor. We worked at one of them last year, do you remember? Yes, said Daud, who never forgot any site where he had excavated. And still we did not find it. We may have missed it by only a few feet, Ramses said. But it doesn't matter now, Daud. There's nothing else there. The thief mentioned only the statue. Back to work, said Emerson mechanically. He called a halt much earlier than was his habit. Daud and Selim went back to the house with them, the former carrying a silver charm in the shape of a hand of Fatima. The lines on Nefret's forehead were deeper, but she welcomed them with a smile. We'll have tea early, she said, with forced cheerfulness. Oh, Daud, how thoughtful of you. It's beautiful. I'm sure she'll love it. I will give it to her, Daud said. I'd rather you didn't disturb her, Nefret said. She's slept most of the day. Sethos sat down. She's worse, he said heavily. No, her temperature is up, but that doesn't mean... Father, wait. I want to see her, Emerson said. Only see her, only for a second. The fret's face twisted as if she was trying not to cry. All right, she said gently, just for a second. Look in and don't speak. Daoud rose ponderously to his feet. I will look too. I will not speak. He followed Emerson into the house. Daoud is a restful person for all his size, Nefret said with that painful smile. "'soft-spoken and slow-moving. "'Her need of comfort was so transparent "'that for once Ramses didn't give a damn about his audience, "'not even his supercilious uncle. "'He took his wife in his arms and held her close. "'It's just that the responsibility is so enormous,' she whispered. "'It's not your fault. "'You're doing everything you can and more. "'If I had moved a little quicker... "'Stop it, both of you,' Sethos said roughly. Fret, she couldn't have a more competent physician or one who cared more for her. As for you, Ramses, do you suppose she would rather it were you lying there? She knew what she was doing. She always does. He's right, David said. This is no time to give way, Nefret. You said yourself that the wound wasn't mortal. It might have been his gentle reassurance or Sethos's blunter variety of comfort that made Nefret laugh, even as she brushed the tears from her eyes. Do you know what saved her life? That blessed belt of tools! 
The bullet was deflected by her canteen and went at an angle through that leather belt so that it penetrated her side instead of going straight into her intestines. Emerson and Dowd came back to find Sethos pouring the whiskey. She's asleep, Emerson reported. Fatima's with her. Dowd did not speak at all. After a few minutes of profound cogitation, he left. Carla and David John knew Grandmama was sick and that they must be particularly quiet and well-behaved. But thanks to the strenuous effort of the adults, they remained unaware of how ill she really was. Sethos was magnificent. He lost again and again at knife, paper, rock, and got the cat's cradle into a hopeless tangle. But it was a relief when the children went off to bed. No one ate much at dinner. Ramses let his father take the place at his wife's bedside, as was his right. The rest of them stood outside her door until Nefret ordered them off to their rooms. You'll call me if there's any change, Ramses couldn't help asking. She's tough as a lion, Sethos muttered. She'll fight it off. Ramses went back to his house, to be near the children. He flung himself fully clothed onto the bed, but he didn't sleep. Staring open-eyed at the shadowy ceiling, he knew Sethos and David and Fatima and the other servants were doing the same. The night seemed to last an entire year. There was no summons from Nefret. When the first pallor of dawn entered the room, he got up. Anxiety and cowardice pulled him in opposite directions. He wanted to hear good news, and he was afraid to face a bad report. He walked slowly along the paved pathway, under the trees, while the light strengthened and the night-blooming Datura lifted great white trumpets toward the sky. It was going to be a beautiful morning. The house was silent. From the back he heard the clatter of pots and pans. Fatima was preparing breakfast. His stomach turned over at the thought of food. As he stood outside the door of the veranda, with his cowardly hand unable to turn the handle, he saw someone coming around the house. That giant form was unmistakable. Salam alaikum, Daoud said. I have found it. He held out his hand. Gleaming against his broad, brown palm was a small object, less than an inch long. The cobra raised its hooded head, defying enemies. Its eyes glittered an impossible green. As Ramses stared, struck dumb, Daoud said, We will give it to her now. Come. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. To my extreme vexation, it was several days before Nefret would allow me to sit up and talk as much as I wanted. On the Friday, Emerson carried me to the veranda, and it was like a kind of rebirth to be back in those familiar surroundings with all those I loved round me. The great cat of Ray stood by the outer door glowering at a mirror. He had abandoned his vigil on my bed as soon as I was out of danger. It is the nature of cats, Emerson had said, to seek out a warm, comfortable nest. So don't wax sentimental about the creature, Peabody. He had been sneaking treats to the cat ever since. Foremost on my mind was the Uraeus serpent I had found, tightly clasped in my hand, when I woke free of fever. Insignificant this might seem to others, but to me the image of Daud's large, patient form, squatting by the holes he had dug, sifting by lamplight, was a supreme token of friendship. Your fever was already going down, Nefret said, but I wouldn't for the world disabuse him of his belief that the Uraeus saved you. He worked so hard. How does he reconcile that heathen image with his religion? Sethos asked, eyebrows lifted. It was an answer to his prayers, Ramses said, a somewhat indirect answer, granted, but God, whatever his name may be, works in mysterious ways. And you must admit it was something of a miracle that Dowd located that small object. Except for the eyes which had fallen out of their settings, I said, laughing, 
Even Dowd couldn't find objects that tiny. So he chipped off bits of green glass from one of Khadija's ornaments and rammed them into the empty holes. Nefret shook her head in wonderment. He said that without eyes the great serpent could not be effective. Let's drink to him. Emerson handed round the whiskey. It was the first I'd been allowed, and after I had lifted my glass, I drank, reveling in even that small pleasure. I doubted that spirits were available in the afterlife. More important, said Emerson. Dowd's discovery proves beyond the shadow of a doubt. Had there been a doubt that the statuette was found at Deir el Medina? You'll be glad to hear, Peabody, that we've closed down there. No more sifting rubble for you. Even sifting rubble will be a pleasant change from my recent inaction, I declared. I am ready to take up the reins again. We must finish with KV-55, if only for the sake of thoroughness. There's no we about it, Emerson declared. You won't be dashing round the valley for a while yet, Peabody. I have been waiting with breathless anticipation for your analysis of the problem that was our first concern before we became distracted by other events. Where, specifically, did the ancient thief find the statuette? Where in the Valley of the Kings, you mean? Emerson nodded, smiling, and I said, You have a theory, do you not? I always have a theory, said Emerson. You, my dear, have your little lists. Don't tell me you haven't made another. Well, I said modestly, since you ask. A little ripple of amusement accompanied the removal of the paper from my pocket. I did not mind, since I knew it was prompted by affection. I returned Sethos's smile and unfolded the paper. I have set it out in the form of a syllogism, I explained. The statue is from the Amana time. The thief took it from a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, the Great Place. There are no tombs of that period known in the valley. So there must be another tomb, an unknown tomb, David exclaimed. I see one flaw in your syllogism, said Emerson, taking out his pipe. There is an Amana period tomb in the valley, KV-55. That has always seemed to me an unlikely possibility, I declared. The tomb was stripped of its valuables by people who ripped off the gold face of the coffin and tried to remove the shrine. They also erased the cartouches of Akhenaten, which indicates that they were not random thieves, but officials of the government that had assumed power after his death and wished to obliterate his heresy. They would have reused or melted down any gold they found. Well done, Peabody, said Emerson, his sapphirine eyes shining with the familiar pleasure of debate. I agree. While we are on the subject of syllogisms and lists... Would you care to explain why you suspected Kachanovsky from the first, as you claimed? Did I say that? Yes, Ramsay said. He reached for my hand. But you weren't... you weren't entirely yourself, Mother. Oh, yes, I remember now. I gave his hand a little squeeze. I did suspect him, though perhaps not from the very first. Shall I tell you why? Please, said Emerson, grinning broadly. It was after the first attack on Ramses that I began to wonder about Kachanovsky, I explained. What, I asked myself, was the one factor that distinguished Ramses from the rest of us? Nothing to do with Mrs. Petherick, uh, with Magda. It was his work with the papyri from Deir el Medina, was it not? I concluded that there might be something in those texts that inspired the murderous interest of the only other person here who could translate them. Though I will not claim I anticipated anything as remarkable as a confession, I added modestly. A round of applause broke out, led by Emerson. Peabody, he declared. You really are the most... Thank you, my dear. You really are, Aunt Amelia, David said. But to return to KV-55, if you believed nothing was to be found there, why did we spend all that time re-clearing the confounded tomb? 
Yes, Nefret said. Why, father? For the sake of thoroughness, Emerson replied. We found nothing. And now we know, he gave his son a respectful nod, that the theft of the statuette dates from the 18th dynasty, some years before the traditionalists began destroying Akhenaten's monuments and memory. Ramses cleared his throat. Now, Emerson, I said sternly, you see how important Ramses' little scraps of papyrus, which you scorned? How many times must I apologize, Peabody? Father, Ramses began, you need not... You are too generous, my boy, Emerson said grandly. I do apologize, and while I am in a forgiving mood, I would like to apologize formally to my... Um, to Sethos for suspecting him. I will never do so again. The more fool you, said Sethos, grinning. But I appreciate your sentiments all the same. Perhaps if I repeat them to Margaret, she will look more kindly upon me. I'm off to Cairo tomorrow to meet her. And as the saying goes, press my suit. You must bring her here for the wedding, I said. I will make the arrangements. Don't let Fatima start on the wedding cake yet, said my brother-in-law amiably. Margaret may turn me down again. You can tell her I have apologized too, Ramsay said, and that if she does accept you, she has my heartfelt sympathy. Sethos burst out laughing. Spoken like the true son of your father, and the true nephew of your uncle. Emerson said, with seeming irrelevance, Carter is in town. He wanted to pay his respect to you, Peabody, but I put him off. I would be glad to see Howard. Ask him for tea tomorrow. He and I have an appointment tomorrow in the Valley of the Kings. No, Peabody, you cannot come along, so don't badger me. I put my glass down. Emerson, you've been playing games with me for weeks. I know why you've been so slow to finish in KV-55, and I think I know what you're up to. It is time you confessed. <laughs> said Emerson. His eyes moved warily from one face to the next. David's open and candid, Nefret's curious, Sethos is wearing a knowing smile, and Ramsay's even more enigmatic than usual. You can trust all of us, I said. <laughs> said Emerson again. He picked up the statuette, which occupied a place of honour on the tea table, the Uraeus restored by Ramsay's careful hands. This is not Akhenaten, and it did not come from any tomb of his. It came from the burial of the only 18th dynasty pharaoh whose tomb is still missing, namely, and to wit, Tutankhamun, said Ramses. Emerson turned a reproachful look on his son. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, father, Ramses went on. But although mother's analysis was brilliant as usual, it does not entirely eliminate the possibility that ordinary thieves entered KV-55 before the official government party did so. I can now prove that was not the case. What? Emerson cried. How the devil? Ramses leaned back and folded his hands. I had the distinct impression that he was enjoying himself. As I told you, the papyrus was fragmentary and partially indecipherable. I've been working on it for the past few days. The scrap I located yesterday has an additional sentence. It includes one of the names of the king whose tomb was robbed, Nibhipurure. Tutankhamun, I exclaimed. Hmm said Emerson, obviously crestfallen. Ramses is a kindly soul, and he adores his father. Having enjoyed his moment of triumph, he at once made amends. But you knew that, father, when you spoke some time ago about your far-fetched theory, as you put it. Ha! Yes, said Emerson, cheering up. I thought at once of the missing tomb of Tutankhamun, but it seemed impossible that any modern thief could have found the place without anyone knowing of it. 
In fact, the idea was so preposterous, I felt it necessary to examine the other tombs of the period, in case the excavators had overlooked something. Well done, father, said Ramses. That idea never occurred to me. Or to me, I said. Brilliant, my dear Emerson. Would you care for another whiskey, my dear Peabody? Emerson asked, smiling broadly. More cursed tourists than ever this year, said Emerson. He shook his head sadly. Very difficult working in that part of the valley. He had brought Howard back with him for tea, after their visit to the valley. I'd been touched by Howard's concern for me, though the sight of the statuette had distracted him somewhat. When will you start work? I asked. It is getting to be late in the season. Howard accepted a second glass of whiskey. His lordship is due in a few days. I had hoped to find a few good pieces in the Luxor Antiquities shops, but no one has come up with anything worthy of Carnarvon's interest. As if drawn by a magnet, his eyes went back to the statuette. Well, well, said Emerson. One never knows what may happen, does one? Emerson does not lie, but this was unquestionably a misleading statement, since Harriet Petherick had accepted Cyrus's offer for the statuette. So, where are you going to excavate this year? Emerson inquired politely. I was thinking, Howard said, of finishing up that small section near Ramses the Sixth, under the workmen's huts. We left it, you know, because there were so many visitors that year. Same problem this year, Emerson said. It took us longer than I'd expected to finish in KV-55 because of the cursed tourists. Mellowed by Emerson's affability and the whiskey, Howard became confidential. It doesn't seem fair, does it? he demanded. I mean to say, look at Theodore Davis. One royal tomb after another for that old reprobate. And not a confounded thing for his lordship. I mean to say, it almost makes a fellow believe in, in curses and luck and that. Why should Davis have that kind of success? He took another sip. Carnarvon deserves better, said Emerson. Howard shook his head and leaned forward. He's showing signs of losing interest, he said in a hoarse whisper. This could be my last season here, Emerson, old chap. Then I hope it will be successful, Emerson said. I have a few ideas. Carter brushed his hand across his eyes. You're a fine chap, Emerson, old chap. I knew I could count on you. What would be your advice? Emerson leaned toward him, their foreheads almost touched. I told you the Ibn Simsas had been digging in that debris near Scepter's tomb. One of them went so far as to fire a pistol at me while I was investigating the area. That's right, you did. Significant, isn't it? Quite, said Emerson. You never finished there, did you? No, no, no we didn't. Time ran out. So you think we ought to go back to that area? Why not? Emerson inquired. Emerson, I said, while we prepared for bed, that tomb is not where you told Howard to look. I didn't tell him to look there, said Emerson virtuously. No, I admitted. But you think it's somewhere else, don't you? My dear Peabody, I do not know where Tutankhamun's tomb is located. Anyhow, it's probably been looted like all the others. I seated myself at my dressing table and began brushing my hair. Very well, Emerson. Keep your own counsel. It's only a guess, Peabody. He came up behind me and gathered my loosened hair into his hands. And a distant possibility... That Lord Carnarvon will abandon the concession, you mean? I left it in the hand of fate, said Emerson. You see, I promised... Uh, uh, that is... Uh, I twisted round to face him. You promised? Who? Um, said Emerson. 
You're pulling my hair, Emerson. Oh, uh, sorry. Turn round again, why don't you? Emerson, did you pray? You? Colour stained his cheeks, but he met my eyes squarely. I don't know to whom or what people did. It may have been more along the lines of a threat than a request. Knowing you, I expect it did sound like a threat, I agreed. What did you promise? He knelt beside my chair and put his arms round me. Face hidden against my breast, he said in a muffled voice, that I would give up every bloody damned tomb in Egypt if you were spared to me. Oh, my dear, I said softly. I couldn't get on without you, you know. Yes, I know. Emerson raised his head. His lashes were a little damp, but he was smiling. You might return the compliment. I couldn't get on without you either, my love. That's all right, then. Emerson sat back on his heels. Um, I meant it. Every word. All the same, I said, stroking his tumbled hair. It is not always necessary to complete the sacrifice. You recall the case of Abraham and Isaac. The willingness is all. We will see what fate has to say about it, Peabody. Next season should be interesting, I mused. Next season be damned, said Emerson, seizing me in a firm grip. Just as you say, my dear.